Welcome. So uh, this is lecture one, uh, and it's the introduction lecture. The previous lecture was lecture zero, uh, because computer scientists start numbering at zero. This lecture is about uh, exactly uh, what startups are all about, this whole startup thing that everybody's talking about, and also what startup engineering is about. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. So um, here is the introduction uh, PDF. Uh, you can see the URLs over here for the class itself, the sign up uh, page, which you can send to your friends, and then the forum to ask questions. That's just a short link to make it easy for you. Um, so let's discuss briefly, what exactly does it mean? What is a startup? Everybody's talking about it, right? Startups are in. Um, you know, at Yale, you can look at this uh, New York Times article. I, I recommend, by the way, I put quite a lot of links in here and you'll get a lot more uh, enjoyment out of the class and the materials if you actually go and uh, click those links and, and read them over. But at Yale, for example, freshmen in, inspired by the movie The Social Network, they're signing up for computer science in record numbers. At Stanford, a class of 75 students signed up 16 million users and made a million dollars in 10 weeks. In aggregate, but still pretty impressive. And at Harvard, uh, there's a kid who left for Silicon Valley and uh, you know that story. Um, so in the U.S., and I know that many of you are not Americans, uh, some of my references will be U.S.-centric, uh, and uh, you know, please remark in the forum if that really offends you, but uh, hopefully it shouldn't. Um, in the U.S., uh, even though you know, people disagree about other things, everybody loves startups. Uh, and you know, entrepreneurship, small business, and free enterprise are things that are very, very popular. And the net effect is that Silicon Valley is really the last place in America where people are optimistic. That's actually a quote from an interesting uh, GQ article from a while back. And um, you know, the question is, what exactly are they optimistic about? Uh, and you know, there's many definitions of a startup, but uh, perhaps the best is one that was postulated by Paul Graham about a year ago, which is that a startup is about growth, right? That is, a startup is a business built to grow extremely rapidly. And what's interesting about that is growth usually requires uh, some sort of new technology that invalidates the assumptions of you know, incumbents, incumbent politicians, incumbent businesses. And today we associate that with Silicon Valley, computer science, venture capital, and the internet, but it was not always so, right? Um, so uh, let's uh, stop there and let's uh, talk about startups in the past next. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about startups in the past. So, um, you know, startups in the past. Uh, previously, uh, we talked about how, you know, today uh, we associate startups with the Valley and computer science, VCs, and so on. But in the past, uh, they were actually in other businesses. So oil, steel, pharmaceuticals, and telegraphs in the 1800s uh, US and in the early 1900s of the US, um, you know, it was the automobile, aviation, and telephone industries that could best be characterized as startups. And what's really interesting is that there's nothing new under the sun, right? So, for example, uh, just like you know, early internet companies use some variant of .com in their names, early car companies tended to bear the last names of their founders. So, Amazon.com survived and Pets.com did not. Just like Ford and Chrysler survived to the present day, while all these other companies that were named in kind of similar fashion to Ford and Chrysler. Auburn, Bates, Christie, and Desperon did not survive. There was actually this huge Cambrian explosion of hundreds of startup car companies. Um, and you can go through and see this huge, huge list of all of these startup car companies that exist in the early 1900s. And very, very few of them you know, made it to the present day. But every once in a while, you will see like you know, a, a company that you recognize, um, like a Ford, just in the middle there, right? Just in the middle of this whole long list. And no one knows about Lenawee or Matheson or, or Wilson or any of those other companies, uh, but, but you do remember Ford. Um, in the same way that you'll have like a Google.com started around the same time as a Foo.com and an Example.com at, at the same time. Um, so the interesting thing about these early startup industries was basically that a very small amount of capital was required to start a business and there weren't any regulations or technological uh, barriers, quality barriers that, that kept you out. So for example, Samuel Keir, he started an oil refinery on 7th and Grant, uh, which is insane. Um, you know, imagine if you've ever seen what an oil refinery looks like, it's got enormous columns and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's this billion dollar, multi-billion dollar facility. And to visualize starting that on you know, 7th and Grant, you know, like a, in your apartment in a city is, is astonishing to think that that's where that industry began. Um, but tracing back things in history is very, very interesting because, you know, oil started like that. 
the huge oil industry started like that. The steel industry started like that. You know, Carnegie constructed his first steel mill um, and, you know, built this enormous enterprise. Eli Lilly, this huge, diversified global pharmaceutical conglomerate, um, Eli Lilly uh, started out of, you know, sort of the back of a, a pharmacy. Uh, at a, a, he, you know, he created a medical wholesale company while working in partnership at a drugstore named Binford and Lilly. So out of the back of a drugstore, you know, his first year of business, sales were four thousand four hundred and seventy dollars. Um, and I mean, of course, inflation adjusted. That's that's not too bad at that time for you know a single person. Um, but uh, it's it's pretty interesting to see how these you know companies uh, started out. Uh, you know, it's in these areas in particular, if you think about you know, oil or steel or pharmaceuticals, you do not think, you know, I'm going to go and start that in a garage. But that's pretty much what these people did. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is that uh, one of the reasons that you can't do that today is, you know, to build an oil refinery that's competitive with Exxon's oil refinery, that's a multi-billion dollar endeavor, and most people don't have the capital to do that. But the second aspect is not just uh, the capital, but the regulations. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever heard of Banting and Best, uh, they won the Nobel Prize. And the way they won it is in 1921, they came up with the idea for using insulin uh, to uh, you know, treat diabetes. In 1922, they had extracted insulin, tested on themselves, tested on animals, and put it in a patient's arm. And uh, you know, by 1923, Banting and Best had won the Nobel Prize. And so, you know, a time frame of this kind that you could not do that today. It, today it requires, uh, you know, literally um, four billion dollars uh, to ship a drug. And the way you can figure that out is you take, you know, drug companies and you take their R&D spending and you divide it by the number of drugs uh, and you can figure out, uh, you know, exactly, uh, or rather this is actually the R&D spending divided per drug. And so the lowest on the list is on the order of like $4 billion. Novartis is very efficient because they only spend $4 billion. AstraZeneca spends more like $12 billion. Uh, now, you know, you can take these with a grain of salt and you can say, you know, okay, well, uh, they spent $60 billion and that's our R&D line. But, you know, the, the fact that these people are spending tens, hundreds of billions of dollars and not really shipping that many drugs is, is pretty interesting. Um, the interesting point, though, is that the one billion number is actually a substantial underestimate relative to this, uh, this quotient here. So, so that's drugs. Drugs are, you know, $4 billion. Another example is like, you know, Boeing or, or the, uh, you know, Lockheed Martin. Uh, most people don't know this, but um, the Wright brothers, they started an airline company out of a, a bike store. And that actually was at one point merged with the ancestor of Lockheed Martin. It became its own independent corporation, the Curtis Wright Corporation. It's still a billion dollar business today. So you started a, a billion dollar aircraft company out of a bike store. Uh, and part of the reason for that is there was no FAA. Uh, just like when Banting Invest were around, the FDA was there, but it was embryonic. It wasn't what it was, you know, after uh, 19, the 1930s. It was much, much weaker. It didn't have something called pre-market review. And so the thing is that without regulation, what happened? You had this messy process of innovation. You had all these deaths from refinery fires and railroad collisions, car explosions, airplane crashes, drug overdoses. Uh, and those injuries were accepted as a price of progress. Uh, but over time, what happened was basically regulations were written that criminalized the provision of beta quality physical products. This is a very important point um, that you know you can't just you know ship a, a drug. Uh, you know you can't have a drug company whose um, philosophy is move fast and break things. At least not in the, in the modern U.S. Um, you need you know an environment that was much more risk tolerant, uh, and uh, that that's not where we are today. Um, so the net result though is barriers to entry rose very sharply. And you can kind of visualize that over here. I won't read every, every line, but uh, you can visualize that. You have this Cambrian explosion over here. There's this rise that happens, and then you've got some guys you know, over here that are the, the winners. And so these large winners, uh, they, you know, they erect a technological barriers, for example, competing with Google's data centers or Amazon's you know, server farms is non-trivial. But in addition, what happens is during this rise process, the rapid growth causes failures. Those failures attract regulatory attention, and that regulatory you know, attention also increases barriers to entry. You know, Exxon or uh, you know, pharmaceuticals or steel mills, these all are very heavily regulated industries, and that adds to kind of the difficulty of, of going and competing with them. Okay, so, so this is kind of the concept of you know, startups of the past. Uh, let's uh, break from there, and then next we'll talk about startups in the present. Okay, so now let's talk about startups in the present day. We previously just talked about how, you know, sort of as the industries mature, 
Uh, we went from you know this Cambrian explosion of all of these auto companies or oil companies and whatnot to a few Goliaths that have very large barriers to entry. In the present day, uh, you know the explosion of entrance is not in oil or automobiles, which are thought of as very capital intensive, but rather in in software and and in computers. And uh, you know part of the reason for that it's useful to study history going you know not to the 1800s and 1900s, but let's say after 1950. What happened was this entire industry built out in, in the Bay Area uh, to support semiconductors and then later computer networking and the internet. And uh, what's, what's interesting about this whole uh, era is uh, the transition from kind of computers to the internet in the 89 to 92 period is something that, um, you know, why did it happen exactly at that point? Uh, because if you know some of the history of networking, uh, it, it was, uh, there was reasonable networking over the 80s, um, but the internet only really exploded in the early 90s. Uh, and I believe there's at least two developments that are very useful um, to, to keep in mind from a market perspective that uh, changed that sigmoidal process and that um, you know, allowed the emergence of you know, what we now know as the internet startup. The first such event was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the you know, uh, uh, worldwide turn towards free markets in Eastern Europe, India, China, and the former USSR. Uh, and the second was the repeal of the NSF uh, acceptable use policy, which had banned commerce on the internet. And so this kind of opened up a global you know, market, uh, and this made commerce legal and viable on the internet. And the combination of those was basically what ushered in the age of the global internet market, and thus the internet startup. Um, and what is an internet startup? It's that business that can start in a dorm room and scale to the entire world, accepting payments and providing services to anyone on the planet, anywhere, at any time, without any need for natural resources other than power uh, and no need for expensive permits or human clerks. And so when we go back to our definition of startup equal growth, we can see why the internet and a global internet market is so well suited for an extremely rapidly growing business. Okay, um, so uh, that's uh, kind of startups in the present. And uh, let's pause here and then let's talk about the uh, fall of the USSR and the NSFAUP and their relevance to the global internet market. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, sort of broader factors that led to the rise of the internet startup around the time of the late 80s and early 90s. These factors were, uh, number one, the fall of the USSR uh, and the opening of sort of the global uh, communications network. Uh, and number two, uh, the um, uh, repeal of the NSF acceptable use policy, which uh, allowed uh, you know, commerce on the internet. Um, so to give a sense of exactly what happened in 89 uh, to, to 91, the, the extent to which communications were controlled in the former USSR is not well appreciated by people who you know, didn't live there. But this is a great article from you know, October 5th, 1989, you know, Soviets free the dreaded photocopier. And what used to happen before Glasnost is that photocopiers were actually padlocked in secure quarters. Uh, and there were whole, you know, regulations that prohibited people from photocopying political tracts or, you know, uh, getting things copied because, um, you know, typewriters even were under supervision. And if you've ever seen this movie, The Lives of Others, uh, there's a similar sort of scene. Uh, the hero is risking his life to hide a typewriter in, in communist East Germany. And that's kind of an example of total state control over information. It's not... Um, it's not something that people realize unless they, they lived there or had friends who lived under that time, but you, you couldn't think of something that was more antithetical to, you know, a, a, you know, a global internet where you can, you know, instant message anybody anywhere on the planet or text them anywhere on the planet. Um, so going from this, you know, where photocopiers were padlocked and typewriters were contraband to just a few years later where you could email anyone from, you know, internet cafes was this absolutely radical shift. Uh, and that kind of propagated out to other countries. So, you know, in the early 90s, India dismantled the license Raj. Uh, and really what happened was a number of transactions that were previously only permitted within countries and banned between countries became more feasible. Um, you know, you can kind of uh, think of this in terms of a sort of globalization coefficient. A very crude model is something where if... Um, you know, you had the Eastern Bloc only able to communicate with itself and China only with itself, India with itself and Japan, Western Europe and the US and, and the rest of the world only with itself. 
your proportion of you know communications is only maybe you know 38 percent of, of all possible pairwise uh, it's a very crude estimate um, but you can get a very crude sense of how many new transactions became legal once these markets opened up and people were able to now communicate between themselves and so you know this is great this is this theoretical legality at least you wouldn't be thrown in jail for uh, owning a, a photocopier or a typewriter, uh, let alone a, a cell phone that can communicate with anyone anywhere on the planet, you're no longer thrown in jail for that. But you know, how are you actually going to do it? That cell phone hasn't yet been invented. Uh, so let's pause there, and then next we'll talk about the NSFAUP reveal. Okay. So previously we just talked about the USSR and how the fall of the USSR meant that photocopiers and typewriters were no longer something you could get thrown in jail for and you know millions of people could be jailed for such a, such a, holding such instruments. Um, but uh, now that things were theoretically legal, communications were theoretically legal, uh, how were we going to actually implement those in practice? Uh, and uh, one of the key developments here was not in the USSR but actually in the USA. Um, around the same time, in those in that late 80s, early 90s period, around the time that the Berlin Wall fell and the USSR opened up, there was a big debate that was brewing at the National Science Foundation in the United States. Basically, since the inception of what was called NSFNet, commerce had been heavily restricted by something called the Acceptable Use Policy. Uh, and uh, you can read about this and, and so on, on on Wikipedia. I've got some links here for you know background. Um, but uh, basically, because of the fear of widespread spam, pornography, and malware, um, the you know, academic and government and military users who use the internet did not really see a benefit to opening it up towards commerce. They thought that with you know, uh, the introduction of commercial traffic, there'd be spam and, and porn and malware, and uh, they were completely right. Um, but uh, of course, there was you know, a lot of other stuff uh, that, uh, that came out of that. Um, but what happened was with market reforms in the air, with places like India liberalizing and, and so on, in 1992, Congress repealed the NSF acceptable use policy. And so, you know, you can actually click this and see the, the particular sentence. Uh, if you go to, you know, this, this sentence, this is really the key thing. Um, the, the bill was amended such that uh, computer networks may be used substantially for additional purposes if this will tend to increase the network's overall capabilities, support research and education in the science and engineering. That seemingly innocuous sentence is what enabled uh, the internet uh, to actually support commerce. Um, and you can read more, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of this here, but you can kind of Google around this, the, the, you know, look at uh, acceptable use policy. But here's, for example, Steve Case, who's a founder of AOL on the atmosphere at that time, uh, and you know, he notes over here, a few people used the internet in the early 80s to early 90s because it was illegal to use it for commercial purposes. And so this is completely fascinating because we think of the internet today as synonymous with dot com, with commerce. But very importantly, and this is a kind of a common theme, it wasn't enough for the technology to be there. The market has to also be there. That's when you actually get this, this amazing fusion. Um, the technology had actually been ready for a while. Networking had been around for a while in, in some form, but the market was only ready. The global internet market uh, only came into being once the USSR and the NSFAUP left the stage of history. Um, so that kind of you know concludes the historical prerequisites. Let's talk about you know some of the uh, uh, technologies and technological trends. I was a past and the present. Let's talk about the future next. Okay. So uh, just to recap up to this point, we talked about how startups are really defined by. Uh, the idea that a startup is a business built to grow extremely rapidly. We talked about the prerequisites for setting up the global internet market as we know it. Uh, and we started, you know, started to get an understanding of why the internet startup is something which is uh, truly interesting in terms of its ability to grow very, very rapidly and scale to large markets. Uh, but let's dive into a little bit more detail and talk about some of the key features of internet startups or startups that have some portion of the internet, what I'll, what I'll call titrated or hybrid startups. So. What are the key features of internet startups? Uh, so one of them is something that you know, we'll call operational scalability. So it's now feasible for you in your room to trade with someone across the globe at any time of day without special hardware. You don't even actually need to be at your computer to do this. You can just set up a store and take a transaction from them or from 100 people at the same time. We don't really think about how amazing this is, but think about how different that is from the physical world uh, where you need a clerk and you have lines and queues and, and things like that. 
Um, an internet store can operate 24 seven. There's no zoning regulations. Uh, there's you know no limitations basically in terms of how many stores you can have in a particular area. Uh, it's it's something where the, the scalability is absolutely crazy. You, you don't need clerks, you just need databases and the ability to, to handle the transactions. So, you know, second, and by the way, when you think about the fact that Amazon's website gets a lot of traffic, just imagine how much their back end gets in terms of traffic. If the website gets a lot of traffic and that can operate and process, you know, transactions within microseconds or less, uh, then at some point those transactions are being handed off to a physical operation, which is definitely not processing them in microseconds. It's much, much larger. Um, so this gives you a sense of why operational scalability is so interesting. All these things that were previously physical and constrained are no longer constrained in the same way. Um, a second major property is market size. So with an internet startup, in theory, you can go after the entire world. You can, you know, uh, you can more easily attack uh, a market in Indonesia or you know South America than you ever could before. Um, Friendster, for example, famously became very popular in Indonesia, uh, you know, more so than in the U.S. for, for a long time. Um, and so, you know, even uh, within a country, you know, a business in North Dakota, you know, can market its wares to the entire country. Uh, it's no longer constrained by geography or protected by it. So things become you not just, you know, there's not just more opportunity, there's more competitors. Um, everybody is in some sense adjacent to you now, and you have to basically win a winner-take-all competition to uh, win your particular niche. Um, generality, so software is in many ways the most general product imaginable, and an internet startup is delivering software anywhere. So, you know, whether that is ideas like news and blogs, entertainment, material goods, communications, transportation, energy, medicine, anything. Anything you can think of, software is upstream of it. And you should read this article. It's one of the you know few articles I, I kind of put at the very beginning of the class. Software is eating the world. Uh, it's a, a very good um, piece that kind of encapsulates what is obvious to people in the valley, but is not yet obvious, I, I'd say, to the rest of the world. Anything that has an informational component, which is pretty much every industry, uh, is going to be hollowed out with a database and an API at the center of it. Uh, and the company that does that is going to have operational efficiencies that are far greater than any of the existing incumbents. And that's what's happening right now with Uber doing that for taxis and Airbnb doing it for hotels. And I'd say that our company, Council, is also doing that to some extent in laboratories and, and for genomics. Um, and so the generality of software is why it's feasible for a company like Google to go from a search engine into Maps or Amazon to go from a bookstore to a server farm. You know, software engineering skills are extremely portable and more so than probably anything besides pure math. So let's talk about low capital barriers. Um, basically, uh, you know, you can kind of think about uh, that hyper deflation of hardware costs that was begun by Moore's Law. Uh, that just keeps going. Um, yes, it's true that Moore's Law has run into some heat considerations, so it's going parallel. Uh, but the fundamental aspect of uh, you know transistor density doubling uh, and effective computer cost declining is still true. Uh, and so, for a few hundred dollars, you can purchase this super powerful general purpose computer that you can use to develop arbitrary software and communicate with any other computer in the world. Um, and a useful way to think about this is, you know, if you're a mechanic and you need a special wrench, right, you need to go to the, you know, uh, store or you need to go to the catalog and order that wrench. Um, if you're a computer scientist or a software engineer and you need a special tool, all you need to do is think it up and then type furiously into your keyboard and suddenly this thing, you know, uh, this wrench of pure electrons is basically there and then you can use it to, you know, uh, tweak whatever uh, piece you want. So you can think of it as your own 3D printer before the term 3D printer. Um, so capital is, is, is very, uh, capital costs are very low because you can often build your own tools. Um, regulatory barriers are likewise low. Uh, you know, basically the, you know, the thing about the internet is it's difficult to regulate. Uh, you know, a discussion forum like Hacker News could pull in assets from servers in three countries and comments from a dozen more and make it very difficult to determine, you know, jurisdiction. But, you know, this is something where we have to keep vigilant. It's, this is not assured of, of remaining true forever. Um, open source is another key feature. Uh, you know, the, the thing about uh, open source is uh, you know that uh, the, the modern internet is built on open source. This is a great essay on how you know open source economics uh, are distinct from both you know communism and market economics, uh, and uh, you know it's a you know it's not a matter of left or right. It's really kind of orthogonal to these axes um, by uh, somebody named you know Stephen Johnson, who's a great author in the U.S. So it's worth uh, taking a look at, um, and uh, you know not just open source. Another key feature is the long tail. Uh, with the internet, you can go after, 
you know, micro targets, right? Uh, you can go after a market that is maybe, you know, 10,000, 20,000 people worldwide, whereas before your cost of customer acquisition of finding and acquiring those customers, uh, let alone, you know, uh, building a product for them uh, would would be too high. Uh, today, you can go after what we're, you know, what's called the long tail. Uh, that is to say, you've got to visualize a tail where your best sellers or your biggest, you know, um, uh, markets are over here and then a, a tail going out all the way over here to hear the people who really like um, t-shirts with basketballs on them or some kind of micro market and then you can go and uh, target that market because with search you can find those people who are actually searching for t-shirts with pictures of basketballs on them and then you can actually you know uh, serve that market and uh, you know paraphrasing you know Winston Churchill never in the history of mankind have so many earned so much from so few, from such small markets, or learned so much, you can you can also have that because um, you know now we have you know online education or, or MOOCs like like uh, this course. Um, so another example is failure tolerance, or another you know kind of property. When Google or Facebook crashes, people yawn and wait for the site to come back up. But when there's a physical car that crashes or a drug is contaminated, people die and there's new regulations that are passed. So this is a huge difference. It's a colossal difference in the penalty for failure. And it's one of the big reasons why internet startups are allowed to move fast. You can move fast and break things in a way that you just can't in the physical world. But crucially, because we can simulate more and more of the world on the computer via CAD CAM and virtual wind tunnels, Monte Carlo risk models and stress tests, dying. Uh, can be done on the computer many, many times before we actually die in real life, before we you know, hit enter and ship the final product. It's kind of like playing a video game and you can simulate, 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 and thereby de-risk uh, the approach in a way that a traditional physical competitor would never think to do. Um, and finally, one of the perhaps most interesting aspects is that you can titrate uh, you know, these features, uh, distinctive features of internet startups into existing businesses. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is to build an API uh, such that um, all your business logic, all your orders, all your uh, kind of uh, things that are you know core to the business are you know computerized, and then you interface with the physical world as little as possible. For example, in our laboratory, uh, we have physical interfaces where you actually take a test tube and then you run through a machine, and then it's all bytes after that point. Then you're on the command line, then it's a pure software operation. Uh, and the goal is to get onto the command line, to get uh, onto the internet as quickly as possible with as much automation in that physical interface as possible. And if you do so, then now you're an internet startup. Uh, now the key is, of course, any physical layer that you add is going to introduce friction, it's going to introduce cost, uh, and it's going to become a very important part of your business. But if you think of it as almost like a device driver in the same way that you hit enter and the software will tell your hard drive to move the platter around somewhere, or you hit enter and uh, it will turn on a light or not, you think of that physical layer as an actuator and it's controlled by software. And that's a very, very useful way to think about how you should you know, do business uh, going forward. Um, so, okay, so those are some of the key features of internet startups. Um, these work together synergistically. They're one of the reasons that they're very attractive for large investments. You should read kind of this paragraph and whatnot. Um, and uh, what we'll do next is we're going to talk about kind of, you know, the, the future of internet startups. What are the technological trends that we're interested in and interested in for this class specifically? Uh, and one of the foci is going to be the, the concept of mobile and decentralization. Um, so let's talk that, about that next. Okay, so let's, we, we just spoke about some of the key features of internet startups. Let's talk next about technological trends uh, and what kinds of trends are interesting. Um, so we talked about the distant past of startups and the immediate past and present. And so what does the future look like? You know, taken as a whole, uh, here's a useful list of technological trends. You can click each of these links. They'll take you to uh, what I think of as interesting, you know, kind of topical links. For example, if you click blogs, it will take you to uh, how blogs beat the New York Times in a bet, uh, and if you uh, click some of the others, you, you, you'll be amused by some of them. For example, this one is about Apple uh, changing their name from uh, Apple Computer to uh, just Apple because they're a mobile devices company. Um, so I picked out these links. Uh, I think you'll find them interesting. Uh, and essentially, I've separated out the links into those that are happening or going to happen and those that have already happened. And there's various ways to cross-section this. I'm sure other people will have different, uh, you know, frames on, on what's going on. But uh, from my vantage point and from the vantage point of many people in the Valley, um, when I say the Valley, I mean Silicon Valley. Uh, so from my vantage point and the vantage point of many people in the Valley, these are really trends that are in favor of decentralization, uh, mobility, and sort of the, the power of the individual. 
Um, so, for example, machine translation, this reduces the importance of native language. This is going to be, in my opinion, one of the sleeper hits of this decade. Sort of like video chat crept up on us over the 2000s. It went from something that was considered futuristic and back to the future to, uh, you know, something that uh, became absolutely de rigueur. In the same way, I think that machine translation, especially once it's baked into cell phones and it's in solid state, uh, you can speak into a cell phone and then the person on the other end can hear your voice but speaking Chinese and then vice versa. That's going to further increase that globalization coefficient and make even more transactions that were previously infeasible feasible. Um, so similar to that, you know, other kinds of things here, for example, telepresence, this kind of thing means that um, you can now travel anywhere in the world. The physical location is, is much reduced and that's going to get very good over the next few years. So all these things kind of are trends in favor of mobility and decentralization. And, you know, even things that have already happened, like, you know, for example, social network can be thought of in this fashion. Um, you know, one way of thinking about social networks is you calculate, you know, what fraction of your friends uh, on Facebook live outside of walking distance. Uh, you know, the equivalent of your friend network in 1800, uh, probably everybody, all your friends would have been within walking distance. And as you start going from the telegraph to the telephone to airplanes and whatnot, um, now for, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, like a software engineer, often 70, 80 percent of the people that they know on Facebook are outside of walking distance. And what that means is when they move, uh, they're still friends. And so the penalty for moving and for mobility is now much less. And this is, I think, a very underappreciated aspect of, you know, all of the social kinds of things over the last 10 years have made the, uh, you know, importance, central importance of location much less central. You, you no longer fall out of touch with friends unless you choose to do so. You have to actively choose to do so. Um, so this Facebook map is very interesting and kind of illustrates this concept of, uh, you know, mobility. Um, if you look at it, the remarkable part is that you've got people over here who are connected to people in London. And, uh, you know, in, in the 1800s, maybe that would have been a transatlantic steamer that would carry, uh, you know, some letters every, uh, you know, year or something like that. Um, but now that's a real-time communication where this person can be texting their friend in London uh, or, or Facebook messaging them more than they can the person next door. In fact, um, you know, you, you, many of you probably know somebody across the world better than you do your next door neighbor. And we, we don't really think about how important that is. Uh, it, it basically means that physical location is becoming less and less important. What matters are the informational connections between people. That's a, that's a very important way to bet in terms of, you know, starting companies over the next 10, uh, 15 years. And so, you know, kind of related to the fact that many of your friends are outside of walking distance now, consider the proportion of your waking hours that you pass in front of a user programmable screen. So if you're a knowledge worker, you know, you spend all this time in front of a laptop or an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, and then if you, you know, go on to into, uh, you know, the, the city uh, and use an iPhone to find your way around, often that's another 10 or more hours. Uh, and the programmable screen, the mobile programmable screen is only going to wax with, uh, you know, new technologies like Google Glass uh, or this mine of the future. Uh, and so what you, what you have is this interesting confluence. Physical location and nationality are declining in importance and software is increasing in importance as you get these ubiquitous programmable screens. And, you know, one of the things about this is that, you know, since 1648, there's been something called the Treaty of Westphalia that presumed that national governments are sovereign over all citizens within their physical borders. But that might not be actually, you know, uh, the case for the rest of the century. Um, you know, 20th century government was fundamentally a consequence of 20th century technology. 21st century government may be a consequence of 21st century technology. Um, you know, put one way, today the physical world still has primacy and the virtual world is secondary. But tomorrow, will you find your community on one of these mobile programmable screens and then choose your physical location accordingly? To do something like that, that sounds really space age or, you know, uh, internet age, um, but that would require mobile screens capable of basically doing everything in your life. A handheld that could do banking and shopping and communications that could unlock doors and that could control machines. Um, so, you know, unlock doors kind of like this, like with Locketron, keyless entry with your phone or control machines like this. Uh, you know, an iPhone app that would start your car from virtually anywhere. This is where technology is going, right? Uh, this is exactly where it's headed. Uh, and that's why it's, sort of, it's interesting to think about these philosophical questions because that's what leads you, that's what leads you in the direction of important startup ideas, not just uh, let's share, you know, photos with my friend, but, uh, you know, let's, let's really, you know, do something big. Let's put a dent in the world. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, next section. Uh, what is startup engineering? 
Okay, so we talked about philosophy for quite a bit. Let's talk about what is startup engineering. Um, so basically, stepping back from philosophy and getting into brass tacks, you know, ricocheting back and forth, by the way, between philosophy and brass tacks is what a, a startup is all about. My favorite analogy for a startup is the sport called chess boxing. Uh, in chess boxing, uh, one uh, you know, plays a game of chess over here and then alternates between uh, chess, uh, chess matches and uh, boxing matches. Uh, where you're just going toe to toe and slugging it out with somebody in the ring, um, and that's a real sport. Uh, and uh, there's there's nothing I can think of that is more similar to a startup than that. Um, so we just did a lot of chess uh, and some abstract stuff. Let's do some boxing. Um, startup engineering, you know, the boxing part of this means getting something to work well enough for people to buy. At least that's a definition that I'll use for the purpose of this class. Uh, engineering in this sense basically is distinct from academia, which only requires that something work well enough to publish a paper, but it's also not architecture astronautics, uh, which is usually about planning for enormous scale or an infinite number of users before the first customer. Um, between those poles of zero and infinity lies startup engineering, concerned primarily with shipping a salable product. Um, you can also include uh, an open source application that's downloaded and used by people. Let's just say that you're getting users or customers. Um, and really, one of the fundamental things here is systems integration. You want to be able to evaluate pieces, keep up with new technologies, and then snap those pieces together. Uh, and so, you know, as a list, this is a, a good list of technologies that are worth clicking on over here. I've given a bunch of links. These are things that we'll use in the course uh, to build a simple website, uh, a, a self-starter, that is to say a crowdfunding site that you can use yourself uh, to raise money for your own projects. I'll, uh, I spoke about that to some extent in Lecture Zero. Uh, these are the technologies we'll use for doing this. You can click and, and learn more about them. We'll go over them in much, much more detail over the course of the quarter. Um, but uh, the, the basic idea is uh, you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to obviously read the source code of each of these applications, but what you will be able to do is sort of understand how they work, how they fit together, and importantly, what the alternatives are and why you're choosing one of them over the other. You won't have all that context, obviously, today, uh, but by the end of the class, hopefully, you should have some of that context as we go through these and you get a sense for using at least one of them and then with, you know, the knowledge of, say, you know, using Postgres, you might be able to critique MySQL or MongoDB, you know, a, a little better. So um, that's startup engineering, uh, and next we'll talk about uh, design, marketing, and sales, and then we'll uh, finish up for this lecture. Now, if you're one of the first engineers uh, after funding or you're joining a startup after it's about 30 people or thereabouts, the business model has been established, a fair amount of funding has been raised. To even get to 30 people, uh, a good rule of thumb is 30 people means um, roughly $100,000 per person per year. So 30 people means that you're spending at least $3 million per year. And uh, $3 million is not that easy to make in a year. Um, you know, you want to try and sell something to somebody for $100 and see how hard that is. Uh, and it's actually not that easy. Uh, and then you multiply that by, um, you know, 300,000 uh, or 30,000 times to get to $3 million in sales. And you start to realize, wow, selling something for $100 30,000 times in a year is not that easy. Um, so to even get to a moderate level of scale uh, is not is not non-trivial, but uh, once you do so, then yes, you can specialize a little bit more. But even still, I think versatility is is quite useful for you, no matter you know what stage you're at. Um, so let's break there and let's talk next about the final project. So let's talk about why mobile HTML5 for the final project. Um, so the focus of the final project, the Bitcoin powered self-starter that we spoke about uh, in lecture zero, is really on the use of uh, responsive design to target mobile browsers. Uh, for a simple mobile web application rather than some other platform. And, and you know, in, in some sense, you know, is it really a mobile app? Is it going to be location-based and so on? Not really. Um, it, it's really just something where you think about the mobile browser as the very first thing you design for, and then you get the desktop uh, UI as a consequence of that. Uh, and the way you get that is through something called responsive design. Um, and we're going to use the Bootstrap framework by Twitter, which makes this very easy. Essentially, by including a few commands in your code, uh, your site can render reasonably well, not just on a large monitor, but on a tablet or an iPhone. So this is really the sense in which we're talking about mobile development here. It's a very much the most basic, basic kind of mobile development. We're not going to do a lot of GPS and things like that. We're covering a lot of other stuff in the quarter. Uh, maybe we'll have some time for that, but um, uh, the focus is not going to be you know, how to build Foursquare per se. Um, that said, uh, it is very important to understand why we're targeting that mobile UI first. 
uh, this is a fantastic graphic from a Simco that shows that the PC is over, right? The PC is going to die. You want to design for mobile first um, because most of the devices that people have uh, or that they started buying in 2011 were Androids plus iPhones plus iPads, and that's gotten even more extreme now by 2013. Um, and of course, this is a, a, a flow versus a stock, if you know the distinction between them. Um, this is a rate because it doesn't include all the PCs that were installed over you know this multi-decade you know period. So this is just about the new things that were bought. Um, but that said, derivatives are where things are going. You know the the flows are where things are going, uh, and new machines that are bought are very very disproportionately mobile devices. Um, so mobile is the future. You should have this graph and, and the 2013 updating of it in your head. Uh, and mobile is not just tablets and iPhones, it's or tablets and smartphones, it's Google Glass and kiosks and drones and plug computers, appliances, you know, all that type of stuff. Anything that is a device that that's uh, that's on the go in some sense. Internet of Things is mobile, right? Tesla, you can even think of the Tesla automobile as a computer on wheels. It's a mobile device. Um, so mobile's the future, number one. Number two is, as I mentioned, responsive design gives that desktop UI for free, so you don't really lose much by targeting that mobile UI first. Um, so location independence also increases scope. Uh, now you don't have to uh, wait till you're back at your computer. You can just hand your phone over to a friend, show them the application. Um, it's something where uh, you can use it anywhere. I mean, th that's the reason Yishan Wong, who's the uh, CEO of Reddit, had a really great post a while back, uh, which said that the reason that people like mobile devices is that life is mobile. You don't want to be sitting at a desk all the time. You want to um, have something with you while you're on the go. So the reason that Amazon Store is useful to have on mobile is you'll always have Amazon Store with you at all times. It's not so much that it's you know, optimized for mobile or even suited for mobile, you'll have a better experience in some ways when you type on the computer, except for the all, or the laptop rather, except for the all important aspect that you'll always have your phone on you. And that, that really trumps everything. You'll always have your phone on you, you can use it in a line, you can use it at all times. Um, so this is the reason that really, you know, people want to have uh, a, a location independent app. Um, in addition to this, you know, by designing for mobile, you have simplicity, uh, you know, and you're also, uh, by designing for mobile HTML5, you'll make heavy use of JavaScript. Uh, and that's really going to be the primary programming language of the course. JavaScript is the future. Uh, you can click a bunch of these links and get some perspective on JavaScript. It's now not just in the browser, but it's on the server, and it's even in databases like MongoDB and, and recently Postgres. Um, and so this is kind of the, the rationale for why we're targeting mobile HTML5. It's simple, it lets you learn JSON, mobile is the future as, as is JavaScript. Uh, and uh, you know, I think it's a useful thing, you have to fi pick something to focus on. I think it's a pretty useful general thing that any startup will, will find useful. Um, so we've spoken about what startups are. Startup is a business uh, designed to grow rapidly. We've sw spoken about what startup engineering is, essentially the down and dirty practice of actually building a sellable product uh, and uh, to being a versatile engineer. Um, and uh, so with, with that in mind, uh, let's uh, conclude here and then let's move on to uh, getting uh, your first website up. Welcome. This is the Startup Engineering course on Coursera. My name is Balaji Srinivasan. I'm going to be the primary instructor for the course. Uh, we'd uh, love to have you. This is the first time this course is being offered as a MOOC. Uh, so it's an experiment in many ways. It's an ambitious course. Um, Unlike a normal course, I won't be able to speak to you in real time after class, so I will look for your comments on the forums uh, and will monitor them closely. Um, so please do be active there. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. So title of the course is Startup Engineering. This is just kind of the logistics slide. I'm not going to read every uh, little bit, but this is the you know, URL you signed up on. However, this is the primary class URL, and here's the forum URL. So make sure to bookmark this one. In terms of you know kind of the motivation behind the class, this is really the class we wish we'd had before starting up our own company and in Vijay's case his lab. Uh, it's a spiritual sequel to Peter Thiel CS183. Whereas that class was 100% philosophy, this class you can consider it as 50% technology and 50% philosophy. There's going to be you know multiple choice and programming assignments like in a standard class. There's also a final project. Uh, you're going to be programming your own simple crowdfunding site and using it to market. Uh, your uh, your own startup idea. Um, the final project will be partially graded on the technical aspects of this crowdfunding site, but really you're going to be doing it for the public recognition uh, and for the own you know satisfaction of building something. 
Um, you should go to forums, meetups, and hackathons over the course of class, but it is an individual class for the most part, and you should submit your own work. I'll have a comment later uh, in the slides on, on Teams. Here's those URLs again. Um, this URL will be a convenience URL. It will be updated uh, later this week uh, so that you can kind of track the course materials even when logged out. Importantly, uh, with the textbook, all the notes are online. There's nothing to buy. Uh, to, ask for help or report, to ask for help or report bugs, please use a discussion forum rather than email. Um, there's 100,000 students, so email will not scale. Great. So I'd like to now uh, briefly introduce myself and the other uh, members of the teaching staff. Uh, so um, brief introduction. Uh, so my name is Balaji Srinivasan. Uh, you can call me BSS or Balaji S. Um, I am a Stanford lifer. I did all my education there. I also taught computer science and statistics there before founding a startup. Uh, that startup is uh, called Council. It's been very successful. Uh, you can read these links. Um, basically, we scaled uh, council from a Stanford dorm room to a huge uh, 60,000 square foot clinical genome center uh, with 200 employees, uh, around 3% of U.S. births, and along the way we raised more than $65 million in funding. Um, and, uh, you know, here's a few article clips on council and the New York Times, you know, TechCrunch, the Wall Street Journal, and Scientific American. Um, and that's kind of the summary uh, for me. Um, you can kind of read over those articles and get a sense of, of my background. Um, the next instructor, Vijay Pandey, will be teaching uh, some of the lectures towards the uh, end of the quar uh, quarter, or the course rather. Uh, Vijay has his own Wikipedia article. Um, he's the director of the Folding at Home Project and expert in distributed computing. Um, here's a couple of clips on that. You can take a look at this at Wikipedia and also at the folding.stanford.edu site. Finally, this is the TA, Alex Chia. Uh, Alex is uh, Stanford as well, uh, MS in Computer Science and Carnegie Mellon undergrad, has won many programming competitions, and Alex will also be very active on the forums. So let's talk about motivation for the class. Um, you know, this is basically the class that we wish we'd had when, when starting out. Startups are huge, and you know Stanford is the epicenter of, of Silicon Valley, but you don't actually learn how to start a company at Stanford. It's just something you sort of pick up by osmosis from the people around you. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that academia, even though we love it, it teaches the details of black boxes, not how they fit together. Um, it teaches how to solve problems, but not necessarily what problems are valuable to solve. Um, and you know, very, very frequently, we've seen this over and over again. First year grad students in PhD programs and fresh graduates uh, of undergrad computer science programs don't really know how to ship production code. This is a kind of an amusing graphic over here and one of the most interesting parts is uh, spoke to a developer friend and heard about software testing for the first time. Now you're going to hear about that before you actually get into your PhD or into your you know major project. Um, scaling a startup is a lot like scaling a research lab in the following sense. Uh, you, you start hiring new engineers once you, you know, start getting money uh, and, and funding or, or revenue, which is even better. Uh, but those new engineers weren't taught to how to code in college, so the first three months are spent training them while you're paying their student loans. Uh, scaling a research lab, very similar problem except with first year grad students. Uh, and the purpose of this class is basically to go upstream and uh, you know, communicate some of these useful concepts up front uh, so that um, we can, uh, you know, train these grad students who'd otherwise code for up to six years without knowing software engineering. Um, it's going to be a relatively challenging course. There's a, there's no speed limit in a startup. Uh, there's a lot of JavaScript related material, but there's no curve. And in theory, everyone can get a grade of 100%. Um, so that's kind of the motivations behind the course, and we'd love to uh, have you involved. So let's talk briefly about the syllabus and the assignments for the course. Um, you can take the course for the technology or the philosophy, which is of a highly applied variety, uh, or both. Um, here is the Stanford Bulletin description for the previous offering of the course. It gives a, a good outline of many of the things in it. We're, we're structuring it somewhat differently for a MOOC, but I present this for completeness. Here's our schedule. Um, so we start uh, on June 17th and we go until August 25th, so exactly 10 weeks or 70 days. Um, and homeworks go out on Wednesdays, uh, and they're due by 11.59 p.m. the following Wednesdays. After this point over here, uh, the final project starts, and the final project winners 
uh, this is just bragging rights, no money involved, um, are declared on August 25th uh, at 11 p.m. 59 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll talk about the final project in a little bit. In terms of the syllabus, um, you know, this is a technical component. We're going to start you off signing up for web services uh, and progressively build out your development environment, teach you some CSS, you know, some basic responsive design, uh, front-end JavaScript, back-end JavaScript, and build up a fairly sophisticated application by the end of this. Um, and uh, complementing this uh, kind of technical portion, um, uh, we also have a philosophical portion, uh, and these kind of weeks are meant to go to uh, go together. Um, the you know uh, philosophy that we introduce somewhat relates to the technology. So, for example, here we talk about design and PR and so on in the same week that we're learning about you know design and, and CSS and, and those kinds of things. Um, here we talk about sales, marketing, and the funnel, and here you're going through you know some degree of you know analytics and cost of customer acquisition and whatnot. So these are meant to complement each other. In terms of the assignments, um, there's graded homework, which are the primary component of your grade. Uh, they go out on Wednesdays, uh, you know, kind of standard multiple choice quizzes and programming assignments in JavaScript. These are objective answers are auto graded. Uh, as for the final project, it's partially graded. You can see the slides over here for details. Um, it is basically a Bitcoin powered self starter, a, a um, uh, a crowdfunding app that you will build up over the course of the quarter and then fill it with your own concept. What is graded are the technical details of that application. What's not graded is the qualitative content or the video, i.e. the product that you're building. That's not graded. Instead, what we're doing is we're going to rank this on the basis of the number of, of Bitcoins uh, that you raise and other kinds of metrics that are hard to game, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, these assignments are due on Wednesdays. Uh, this is just a table that you can consult to be, you know, totally definitive about when things are going out and when they're coming in. There's seven homeworks in total, uh, and the first one is easy to allow late start, and the last one is short to allow project focus. But the ones in the middle will be reasonably challenging. So let's talk about the final project for a bit. Uh, we referred to it in the previous uh, um, slides, but uh, let's go into it in detail. So the idea is that you're going to build your own simple Bitcoin-powered crowdfunding site featuring your own product. The idea here is that when you've got 100,000 final projects, this presents unique problems. You want to allow uh, you know, automatic scoring and ranking, but also some room for creativity. You want to enrich beginners but challenge advanced students, and you want to complete it within a relatively short course period, yet simulate as much of the founding process as possible. And after a lot of deliberation, what we're doing is we're combining self-starter and Bitcoin. You can read about them over here. Uh, and what you're going to be doing is, over the course of the quarter, programming your own Node.js version of self-starter uh, and adding in social sharing, Bitcoin, and your product. Graphically, you can think of it as this is the official uh, self-starter uh, you know, open source project. And you're making a personal version of this to teach yourself you know, some web programming, but also to teach yourself many of the other aspects of sort of building a startup and, and customizing things and, and uh, marketing things and whatnot. And uh, you know, the social sharing aspects are relatively straightforward. The Bitcoin aspect is pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, you know, the concept is that we're going to grade the technical aspects of that final project. Uh, but not the qualitative aspect. So, for example, we will grade the fact that you've got your Hello World site up successfully at a URL and you've deployed it, but not the name of your domain. Uh, or we will, you know, for example, grade the fact that you have your social and payment integrations up, uh, but not the look and feel of those integrations. At the very end, the ungraded part is the number of social shares and number of Bitcoin that you've raised, but this is really for your bragging rights. All these things in terms of quality are for bragging rights and, and for you know the quality of the product if you want to take the class uh, very seriously. So you choose the product, the text, the video, design, and all the qualitative aspects in the self-starter. We can only auto-grade the technical parts, but we allow your creativity to shine through. Um, the reason that we choose Bitcoin in particular is the class is uh, international, uh, but it's also, and, and so in that sense, Bitcoin is very good because you can, you know, do payments across borders and so on without transaction fees. Everyone can get a merchant account set up within days. They don't need to apply for a bank. So for a, a project that's teaching startups, uh, you know, pedagogically, that's extremely useful. Um, but it's also very good for this particular application because Bitcoin transactions are world readable. We can see, for example, all of the money that was donated to this particular address uh, by simply going to a site like blockchain.info and seeing that this particular person at this address 
uh, received money at the following times and in the following amount. So we can see when they started. So in this fashion, for example, we can look at the Bitcoin address associated with your project and see exactly how much you raised in what time and what quantities and, and make sure that people aren't gaming the system. Um, there will also be a leaderboard uh, and, uh, you know, so for example, here, example.com is ranked number one in the genomics category. We're ranking currently on the basis of the number of Bitcoin raised in their crowdfunder. But one could also rank, for example, the number of tweets or Facebook shares uh, involving uh, example.com. If we ranked by tweets, then uh, example2.com would actually rank number one. Uh, and it would also be number one in the law category. Um, so let's talk about categories for a second and prizes. Uh, oh, before we do that, let's talk um, some other comments. So we're going to review Bitcoin in great detail later in the course, but you can start by clicking these two links to go and obtain some Bitcoin uh, and, and so on. But importantly, buying Bitcoin, it's not needed to pass the course. That's completely optional. Uh, the final project is just meant to be hard to game. For those who want to do something real, you can. Uh, and the thing is that gaming the process of getting a lot of money into your Bitcoin account um, is a, a lot like running a profitable company. For those who don't, don't want to do a real money crowdfunder, you can maximize the number of Facebook or Twitter shares instead. Um, so let's talk about prizes for a second. We're going to have prizes at least four categories. After you fill out the survey, uh, we'll likely add more. Uh, and you choose your category when you enter the leaderboard, which will go live later in the class. Um, as I said, this is kind of for bragging rights only. Uh, what we'll do is rank order prizes in each category by the end of the class. Uh, and you, to be counted as a winner, uh, you would have to be in one of the high positions uh, on the last day when the leaderboard is frozen and the winners are announced. Remember again, you don't need to participate in the public leaderboard to get 100% grade in the class, and you don't need to use Bitcoin to compete in the public competition. Um, you can complete solely on the number of social media shares, uh, but uh, I, I like this as a concept because those who want to take the class very seriously can actually simulate a lot of the process of you know, starting a company and raising money and building attention for the product. Let's talk about collaboration and teams for a little bit. So on the final project, can people work in teams? Uh, I would prefer that you don't work in teams just because it's um, it's kind of difficult to grade. Coursera is not set up for it. Obviously in real life, yes, you're gonna start a company as a team, not as an individual usually. Um, but if you do wanna try and work in teams, we can do this as an experiment. Uh, and the idea would be that you'd submit the graded portions of each final project as individuals. Uh, and you can click this to you know, see what I mean by the, the graded portion. It's the technical aspects. All of these you'd submit basically your own site as an individual for technical grading. Um, we'd leave the qualitative stuff all rudimentary you know, in, in your own thing. Uh, and uh, then uh, this way if three people are working on the same product as a team, all of them would do the technical portions individually for grading. Uh, but then for the last three weeks, when it comes time to promote the project um, in this portion of the class, uh, at that point, then you would switch over and your three team members would all work together on promoting the, the project. Um, so that is sort of the idea behind uh, how teams would work. Uh, and for all non-final project individual assignments, it goes without saying you should submit your answers as individuals. Let's talk community and collaboration and then summarize. So community and collaboration, we're going to have uh, quite a lot of uh, important guest lecturers. We'll upload these as the class progresses for many of the top startups and big companies in, in Silicon Valley. Um, forums, meetups, and hackathons will be an important part of the class. Please use the discussion forums if you have questions. We'll monitor them closely. Um, as for meetups and hackathons, read this forum thread, find class meetups in your city, create a thread with your city if it doesn't exist. For example, here's a New York forum thread and meetup. And if you live in a very remote area, use this thread instead of Google Hangouts with fellow classmates. Take pictures of meetups and link them from the forum. Uh, the distinction here, and maybe it's not that material, but uh, you organize meetups to go over the course material and hackathons really for just cranking on code. And maybe they're the same thing in, in your view. Um, in terms of the uh, sort of summary here then, um, what's a class covering? It's basically everything we wish we'd known when starting a company and lab. There's gonna be a lot of JavaScript and web programming. Uh, the final project is building your own Bitcoin powered uh, crowdfunder over the quarter and then using it to market your own product. Please go over these links to figure out what to do next. Um, perhaps the most important uh, bit is to, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, share the sign up page if you have friends who might be interested. And then after that, you can go here to continue with the next uh, lecture in week one. Uh, as for homework one, it'll be out on Wednesday and it'll be due on June 26th. So welcome to the class and we're glad to have you. Welcome to lecture two of Startup Engineering. I'm your instructor, Biology Srinivasan, and today we're going to learn how to set up a basic uh, website on Heroku, uh, and you're also going to learn how to do development on Amazon and uh, uh, push code and pull code from GitHub and uh, do a few other things besides. Without uh, further ado, uh, let's just uh, jump in. So uh, as I mentioned, our goal is to get you set up with a basic development environment and get a simple page online by following uh, the, the following steps. So you're going to set up Google Chrome in your terminal and sign up for a bunch of web service accounts. You're going to initialize and then connect to an Amazon Web Services or AWS cloud instance. And then you're going to clone code from this repository, create a new Heroku app and get your page live on the web as shown in figure one. So this is basically the goal of your uh, lecture today, you should be able to kind of um, step through and as you uh, kind of watch me, you can execute some of the commands on your own uh, end of things. Uh, and this is your kind of final goal. Now, as for how all these services, these web services that I mentioned over here, um, how they all uh, fit together, if you look at figure two, um, this gives a sort of a good illustration, right? Um, essentially, uh, you know, starting from the bottom, you are running your own laptop. You're going to be launching a terminal uh, or SIGWIN window, terminal.app on OS X or SIGWIN on Windows. You're going to be running SSH, and with SSH, you're going to connect to a T1 micro instance. And the reason that I've kind of structured it like this, where it's like a slice out of a cube, is that the way that Amazon works is a single server is virtualized into many little chunks like this. Uh, each of which is running its own, you know, semi-independent operating system. That's called virtualization. This T1 micro virtual machine is what you're actually connected to. And this is kind of where you're going to be running all your commands. In particular, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to pull code down from GitHub over here. You're going to mess around with it a little bit, and then you're going to push it to Heroku. Uh, and then you're going to have, uh, you know, an end user browse to your app .herokuapp.com. And uh, this is sort of the kind of protocol for how you, you know, develop over here uh, and you'll kind of pull and push or push and pull code back and forth like so. Uh, and then when you're ready, you will deploy to Heroku and then someone can look at the code over here. So this is sort of the development flow that we're going to be setting up. In addition, we will talk about, you know, uh, this is very simple. You'll set up Google Chrome. And in the next uh, lecture, we will uh, talk about how to set up a command line interface uh, so that you can type in and control the computer purely by typing. So let's talk about how to set up your command line interface. Um, in many cases, uh, you know, this is not too difficult uh, for, for some of you. Um, the concept behind the command line interface is that um, rather than clicking on buttons, uh, like in a graphical user interface, to say close a window, um, you can just type in commands over here and hit enter, uh, and that will achieve the same function and will in general do so more rapidly. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we kind of joke about is that the uh, purpose of computer science is to avoid using the mouse, and that's what the command line will allow you to do. Um, essentially, you know, part of the reason, the intuition for that is that, uh, you know, from an information transmission perspective, a standard keyboard has like uh, you know, 50 plus keys that you can hit, uh, achieving the same speed in a GUI is impossible as you just can't you know, get the same level of information input, uh, at least when it comes to digital um, you know, sorts of problems. Uh, the GUI is fine for analog problems like you know, um, drawing or something like that. So expert computer users prefer command line and keyboard driven interfaces, and you are going to become an expert computer user or if, you, if you aren't already. Um, how are we going to do that? Uh, so how to set up a command line on your local computer? I'm going to talk about Mac OS X in this lecture and then Windows in the next lecture. For Mac OS X, it's very simple. All you need to do is go to Applications, Utilities, and then Terminal. Um, and that's really, really simple. Uh, and just double click that, launch it, and uh, you're good. Um, and uh, when it uh, loads up, you should see a window like this that pops up, 
you're going to go into the preferences menu and then you're just going to go, go through the preferences screens or the next few pages and set up a, a few things that will be helpful. Um, so that's how to set up and launch terminal.app in OSX. Okay, we're now going to talk about how to get a command line interface on Windows or on a PC. Um, as I note over here, relatively few startups use Windows computers for their primary development, uh, mainly because command line support has been something of an afterthought. Uh, there is now uh, you know, PowerShell and a few other things that are out there for Windows, but for the purpose of this class, uh, we recommend that you use Sigwin to get a Unix-like environment on your Windows computer. Uh, and the way you can do that is basically going through the following screens. Um, you go to sigwin.com uh, and uh, then um, you will uh, just get the setup.exe and double click it. Um, step through the, the following steps over here, direct connection, you know, choose mirrors.kernel.org for speed. Uh, and uh, the most important things that you want to include is make sure you include the SSH package. Uh, and um, you know, make sure that uh, you can you know, just go all the way through and hit finish. And when you're done, you will have an icon like this on your desktop. You can drag it over here for quick launch and double click on that and now you're at the Sigwin command line. Uh, and you can just test out that it works by doing ping of google.com. And when we say launch Sigwin, that's what we mean. So now you've got a command line in Windows and you can SSH from it. All right, so we just set up uh, terminal environments in uh, OS X and or Windows. Uh, we're now going to just quickly go through and sign up for four web services. I've included screenshots uh, and uh, you know it'll be pretty straightforward, uh, but let me give you a quick tour and then you can kind of go and sign up on this uh, on your own. Um, so let's get started by getting you set up with Amazon Web Services. Uh, you're gonna need an email account, a cell phone, and a credit card to begin. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in general, I would recommend that you use the same email, phone, and credit card for all the services used in the course. Otherwise, you'll have headaches related to service synchronization and stuff like that later. So start off by going to aws.amazon.com, uh, you know, which is here. Click sign up in the top. Um, you'll create an AWS account. You're going to be a new user, uh, you know, put in your password. Um, and your address and stuff and, and the CAPTCHA, go through the CAPTCHA. Um, then at this point, it's going to ask you for a credit card. Now, I understand that there's some people in the class who don't have credit cards. I would uh, say that what you might do is go and get a prepaid uh, debit card from uh, Walgreens or something like that, like a Green Dot or, or the like have these prepaid cards. Um, I understand there's some countries that don't have credit cards and uh, unfortunately I don't think there's much that we can do about that in this iteration of the class. Maybe in a second iteration we'll have enough users that can go to Amazon and uh, talk to them. Um, but for right now you'll need a credit card. Uh, you don't need to actually pay anything though um, because they just uh, you'll be able to use the free tier of Amazon services if you use the so-called T1.micro instances which is what we're going to use for the majority of this class. Um, if you want more power, you can always pay for it, uh, but your credit card won't be billed. You're just uh, unless you, uh, you know, turn on a lot of services, which we're not going to ask you to. Um, this is just for them to have it on record. Okay, so enter your credit card. Uh, then you're going to need to do identity verification by telephone. They do this because people can use these AWS machines for spam and other things. You're going to get a PIN. You you input in that PIN, uh, and then you've done your identity verification. Uh, and it'll say activating your account. And while that's going, uh, you know, you will just, uh, you know, be able to eventually log in and you should be able to see a dashboard that looks something like this. And my, this welcome thing may or may not be there. Um, and this is really what we're gonna be working on next, EC2. So that was Amazon Web Services. All right, so next we're going to have you sign up for Gravatar, GitHub, and Heroku. These are a little more uh, simple than signing up for AWS. Um, so for Gravatar, this is pretty straightforward. You're just gonna to go to gravatar.com, type your email address here, go to get your Gravatar. It's gonna make you do some WordPress sign up and so on. Just bear with it and, and go through the whole you know rigmarole. Um, at the end of this process, you will uh, have a page that looks like this 
where you've got an image that you have cropped and chosen as your gravatar. The reason this is important is uh, it is like the um, little face. If, if you've used Facebook, uh, you know, there's a little uh, icon of your face that appears next to your post. And in a long thread, it makes it easy to distinguish who posted what. Uh, you're going to find that this gravatar will be very, very useful when you write code and push it to GitHub and you want to see which commit came from whom. Um, you know, that this little icon will actually be quite helpful. Um, for GitHub itself, uh, GitHub is a very important website in you know the startup space. It, it started out as just a you know front end for the open source uh, you know program called Git, which we're going to use a lot in the course. But it's really become a much bigger deal than that. It's become kind of an institution in its own right, uh, and uh, you know in many ways um, you know your GitHub account is more important than your CV, at least in the technology space. Uh, you know, if someone has a good GitHub account, I don't care if they've got no degree, not even a high school degree, if they're really good at programming, uh, and your GitHub account will show that. Um, and uh, I think that's characteristic also of most of the technologists in the Valley. Um, so your GitHub account is important. So basically, you know, you can get started by navigating to github.com, uh, and it's very simple. Just go through the sign-up process over here. Uh, when you're done, you're going to have a page that's like this. You can kind of go through the instructions and mess around. They've got tutorials and, and things. Uh, and then the last thing you will do is go to github.com settings profile, and you're going to enter your Gravatar email over here. And then you're going to have that uh, you know photo uh, everywhere with you in your Git commits. Last thing to do is to go to heroku.com and sign up there. Uh, you can just click over here and go through that whole process. And then when you're done with that, you will uh, come up to a page like this. Uh, don't actually go through this right now, just pause there uh, and we'll return to those instructions in a little bit. So now you've got GitHub, Gravatar, and Heroku signed up. Okay, so now we are going to launch an Amazon Web Services instance, um, really more specifically an EC2 instance. EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. It is probably the most important of the suite of services offered by Amazon Web Services, but they also offer, for example, storage like the S3 service, DNS like Route 53, all this type of stuff. Amazon has pretty much everything that you could want in scaling up a website. But uh, for right now, we're gonna start with the, the very first and the most important, the EC2 service, and we're gonna load up an instance in the cloud, a virtual machine in the cloud. And then the next lecture, we're going to, um, or the next sub-lecture, next video, uh, we're going to connect to that instance. So let's get started with that. To launch an EC2 instance, uh, you're going to first go to awsamazon.com, log in over here. On the left-hand side, you're gonna see EC2, and you're gonna click that. And then you're going to see a page that's like this, and there's that button over here, Launch Instance. Also note this link on the left-hand side, that's going to be useful in a, in a bit. Um, so after you click Launch Instance, you will be given a screen that looks kind of like this with Classic Wizard, Quick Launch Wizard, and AWS Marketplace. Um, you're going to click the uh, Quick Launch Wizard, uh, this guy. And uh, then click, uh, once you've got the quick launch wizard, uh, you're going to have this have create new and just type in a name for a private key that you're generating. I chose CS184-John-Stanford-EDU. And then you're going to select Ubuntu Server 12.0.4 or 12.04. Now, note that uh, AWS recently changed this from 12.04.1 LTS to 12.04.2 LTS. So you're going to see 12.04.2 LTS there, right? That's what you're going to see. And your screens will be the slightly different from the one shown in this PDF, but there shouldn't be any functional differences. Basically, you'll see 0.2 where there's 0.1, and there'll be a little bit of difference in uh, what's shown on the screen when you connect to the remote machine, but otherwise it's the same. Okay, so after you've selected this, uh, then you're going to uh, not be able to click continue. You're going to have to click download over here. That is to say, um, after you hit this and you've hit this, you click download, you get a key pair, and then you can go to continue. Um, after that, you can create this new instance. It's launching after you hit launch, uh, and there will be a page where it says it's now launching. 
you can remember this instance number. That instance number will be different for you than it is for me, but that's the instance name. Everything in Amazon Web Services is indexed like this. So every instance is starts with an I and then it has some serial number after that. And so you can distinguish this from other kinds of things uh, with, which have different characters in front. Um, so then you close this down and remember that instance is thing on the left hand side. Click that or you can just click this link down over here and you will see that there is something there that says initializing like this. Uh, and it's a T1 micro instance. We chose the very, very smallest thing. And um, eventually this is going to say status checks are done. Uh, you can then pull this pane upwards and what you want to do is copy this down. This is the host name of that remote machine that you just dialed up. What you just did is basically issued some instructions to the Amazon cloud to say provision me a very small instance called a T1 micro instance, assign it an IP address, assign it a host name, uh, and let me connect to it. Um, and so once these status checks are done, you've got that, uh, that instance uh, dialed up. Uh, and uh, now what you can do if you want to see the instructions for how to connect to it, you can right click and click connect. So this would happen by right clicking over here and then left clicking on connect. And click the thing connect with a standalone SSH client. And the instructions we're, we're going to do are going to be slightly different than this, but we just provide that for your reference. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, th that's basically how to start up an Amazon EC2 instance in the cloud. Uh, wait for it to finish initializing. Once it's done with the status checks, uh, you the most important thing you want to do is um, copy this host name, and then you're also going to have this this key pair that you downloaded over here, and that's really all you're going to need in order to uh, connect to the machine, uh, which we're going to show how to do in the next step. Okay, so now we've got an EC2 instance that is running remotely. We've also downloaded a key pair. We know the host name of that instance. We're gonna use those two variables, the host name and then also the file with the keys to connect to that instance. And we're gonna first do that from a Mac and then in the next video, we'll do it from a PC. So let's do it from a Mac first. So in a Mac, what you're gonna do is go and open up terminal.app. Remember that we did that at the very beginning, terminal.app and uh, you're going to type in the following three commands. You're going to cd into your downloads directory, assuming that the key pair was downloaded there. You're going to change the permissions on that key to 400, which means that only you can read the key. This way it's truly a private uh, you know, key. And finally, you're going to type in this command, ssh-i cs184 john-stanford.u.pem ubuntu at and then the name of your uh, host, right? Now note that you're going, your file is going to be named something different. It's going to be whatever you named it, uh, you know, when you when you generate the key, and your host name is also going to be different. And this is auto generated from Amazon, and that's where you're going to copy paste from uh, the you know web dashboard. And uh, the, this is kind of how that looks when you actually open up terminal. You type in cd downloads chmod like this and sh-i. Your terminal will look slightly different. It won't have this blue stuff over here. I'll show you how to get that later if you, if you think that looks cool. Um, but otherwise, these commands will work. And then uh, you'll know it works if this pauses for a second and then it says, welcome to Ubuntu. It'll say 12042 LTS and have a slightly different text over here. But you will be connected to the EC2 instance. Um, and that is how to connect to EC2 uh, from uh, a Mac. Uh, and so then we'll talk about Windows next. Okay, so you've got your EC2 instance. Uh, uh, you dialed it up in the cloud. Uh, you've got your private key, uh, your PEM file that is, and you've also got your um, host name of the Amazon uh, instance that you dialed up. We're now gonna show you how to connect to that instance from Sigwin. So you launch Sigwin, um, as we said before, you're gonna double click on the Sigwin icon. Then you're going to type in the following set of commands. Uh, so you're gonna change the home directory. You're going to do cp sigdrive c users, and then whatever your username is over here, downloads the name of your PEM file, and then make sure to see that period at the end. That means copy it to the local directory, which in this case is tilde, your home directory. Just copy that to the local directory. Then you're gonna type in this incantation. The first one changes the group of the file to users. Um, the second one changes the permissions to 400, just like we had before, which is read only. 
And the third is a command that actually will SSH the remote machine. And note that we put Ubuntu at before the host name, just like we did on the Mac. Um, I don't want to go too deep onto exactly what these commands are doing, but uh, I've annotated this. This is kind of an example session over here. Uh, and um, I've annotated this where you can see that the group change, initially the group was none. After you do change group users, the group changed to users. Uh, and uh, similarly, initially these were the permissions. And after you did chmod 0400, the permissions changed. Uh, the way that we're listing all that stuff is with ls-alrth. ls is a command that means list, and these are options that give more and more detailed listing. In general, if you want to learn about what's going on here, you can see Unix permissions. But the main thing to keep in mind is if you just try using the key right out of the box and trying to connect, you're going to get something like this unprotected private key file. And all it needs you to do is just change it back so that it's got, uh, you know, or change changes something like this where it's only you that can um, uh, uh, that can read it uh, and uh, then Windows will be happy and then it will not give you an error like this. So you don't really need to understand what's going on with the permissions just yet. Just know that you need to basically do this incantation uh, and then you should be able to connect to the remote machine and if it does work you will see something like this welcome to Ubuntu and you will get a prompt on uh, EC2 and you can type in hostname and it will give you something that looks a little like this. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, talk about the uh, next step. So you might still have some problems with the above commands. Uh, some people uh, encountered this in the previous class that they had messed around with EC2 on their own time. Uh, and the issue might be related to security groups. Uh, and so I want to talk about that briefly. What are security groups? Uh, security groups control the permissions on who can access your instances that have been dialed up and what ports they can access them from. So if you click instances in your EC2 dashboard over here, uh, you will see uh, some information on that instance. And then here is the bit on security groups. You can click this to view the rules. If you click security groups on the left hand side, your name may be quick launch one, it may be something else. You should see that port 22, the SSH port, is open and that you can connect to uh, these um, instances through that port. If this is not there, then what you need to do is you need to go to the form, create a new rule, SSH, source 0000 slash 0, add rule, and then apply rule changes. Uh, and you might need to relaunch your instance. And this will allow your Windows or Mac computer to connect via SSH over port 22 to your EC2 instance if it's being blocked by the security group. Okay, so we have now connected via either Windows or Mac to a remote EC2 instance that we dialed up in the cloud. I want to speak briefly about uh, what we're going to call our standard operating procedure, or rather our standard operating system. Uh, Ubuntu 12.04.2 uh, 12 LTS uh, on a T1 micro instance. From this point forward, from the duration of the class, unless otherwise specified, we're going to assume that all those commands are executed uh, on your remote AWS instance. That's to say, if I say ls or cd or cp or execute this command, that command, the implication is it should be on your AWS instance, not your local machine. If you are a sophisticated computer user, if you know Unix cold, uh, then you can run it on your local machine, uh, but we won't support that mode of operation, mainly because local machines have all kinds of configuration issues, and this lets us get a homogeneous environment for everybody to be on the same playing field. Uh, and to give some sense of that, just take a look at this figure. So you can imagine many different students. One person is running OS X, one person is running Windows, one is running a Chromebook or something, you know, even more exotic. And all of them can connect via SSH to their own T1 micro instance, which is a slice of a much larger computer. And all assignments from this point forward are assumed to be executed on an AWS instance unless explicitly stated otherwise. And so this smooths out OS and configuration in homogeneity. And we can just assume that you're going to be running a T1 micro instance with Ubuntu 12.04.2 LTS unless otherwise specified. So that's really where all the assignments on the class will be relative to. And one of the awesome things about AWS is the reason this is so useful, 
you can is that you can clone the environment here into another uh, machine and then give access to that to your friend uh, who can then collaborate with you. Whereas cloning all the materials on your local laptop and all their dependencies is much less trivial. So um, you know when you actually connect, uh, one thing that is useful also to keep in mind is when you're running commands on your local machine versus when you're command running commands on a remote machine. So here, for example, these commands are being run on your local machine. After you hit SSH, you're now in a remote machine and you can type hostname and echo and so on, and these are being executed remotely, in this case in a data center in Virginia. And then when you type exit, you're out, and now you're back on the local machine. So remember the distinction between remote and local execution, and remote execution is execution in the cloud. So you've now executed your first commands on a cloud computer. All right, so now we're at the main event. Uh, you have successfully dialed up an EC2 instance. You have connected to it via either terminal.app on a Mac or Sigwin on Windows or something more exotic. And uh, you are running Ubuntu on it. You have confirmed that you're executing commands on the remote machine rather than the local machine. And now what we're gonna do is execute a quick series of commands that will pull down some code uh, from GitHub and then push it to Heroku and get your first Hello World Node.js app up on the web. Awesome. So without further ado, let's go and do that. So again, here's the recap of the steps. Before we do them, just understand what you're doing. You're going to SSH into your EC2 instance. The term SSH over here, by the way, stands for secure shell. So it's a secure shell connection to your EC2 instance, a shell being an environment where you can type commands and the remote machine will execute them. So you SSH into your EC2 instance, you're going to install Git and something called the Heroku tool belt, namely a bunch of command line applications that allow you to script and control heroku.com uh, from your local computer. You're then gonna log into Heroku at the command line and set up SSH keys. Pull down a sample application, configure it as an Heroku app and push it live, and then view the app's URL in your browser. And that was in English and here are the command lines to accomplish this. So um, note, by the way, that this is uh, the English letter O rather than the number zero. I know it looks uh, odd here with this particular font. Um, but uh, the, what you're gonna do is on your Ubuntu uh, EC2 instance, the T1 micro instance, you run this command to install Git. You run this command to install Heroku. You then confirm that Git and Heroku are both there and which Git will tell you, uh, if it returns nothing, then you've got a problem, but it should return a path, which we'll show in a second. Same with which Heroku. Once both these commands are installed, you will log into Heroku, set up your SSH keys, and then add these keys. And what this does is it basically tells Heroku that this machine is authorized to deploy an app under your name. And then finally, what you're gonna do is pull some code down, uh, a sample application from Heroku, you're gonna CD into that directory, you're gonna create an application, you're gonna push it to Heroku, and then you're gonna have an application on the web. So let's go through some screenshots of how this actually looks. So again, you begin by connecting to your EC2 instance, and now you're going to execute some commands. The first one you'll execute is apt-get install git core. This is a command that uh, installs software on Ubuntu machines. Um, you can say yes over here, if you don't want to say yes, you can do app get install dash y and then that'll automatically say yes to everything. After all of that message completes, you're going to paste in this command over here. You can paste it in from here so that you can get it right. Okay. Um, and then after you paste in that command, you're going to have a lot more messages uh, and when those complete, you will be able to type the commands which git and which Heroku, and you will see that git and Heroku are now present on the system, which is fantastic. So then what's next? Next is you're gonna type Heroku login and you're gonna put in your credentials. You're going to generate an SSH key pair and just hit enter, enter, enter. Uh, you know, you, you don't want any passphrase. You're going to add that key to Heroku to tell the remote Heroku service that uh, to associate this machine with your account. You're gonna run this git clone command. Note the trailing T over here. You're gonna CD into that directory, do Heroku create, and then finally do git push Heroku master. And at the end, there's gonna be something that looks like this. It's not gonna be this exact name, but it's gonna be something like this, HerokuApp.com. And if all goes well, then you can go to a browser, you can type in that name, 
and you should see Hello World. And if you've done that successfully, congratulations, give yourself a round of applause, you have just deployed your first web app and it only took you about 30 minutes and uh, so that's pretty good, so congratulations. So, awesome job, you got a uh, simple web app running on uh, Heroku, you've got Hello World. Uh, what we need to do now is just a little bit of a cleanup and post-mortem and uh, then move on to bigger and better things. So in terms of cleanup, very simply, all the last thing you need to do is just terminate your EC2 instance so it doesn't keep running. And the way you do that is you go to your Amazon Web Services dashboard, you click EC2 to go to the EC2 sub dashboard, click instances, right click your instance, and then go and just click terminate. Uh, there's also something called stopping. It's different from terminating. You can read here about the details. We'll get into that potentially later in the quarter. So the reason that you're uh, terminating this does not terminate your Heroku app is your EC2 instance is where you developed and then you push it out over here and then you can shut it down and this will just keep running on its own. So it's worth you know consulting this figure again. We did most of the things in the figure with the one exception that we didn't actually do any pushing of code, but we did connect via SSH, we pulled code from GitHub and we pushed code to Heroku and then we viewed that code uh, in the browser. So that is the development over here and then the deployment uh, to Heroku over there. You can get much more sophisticated than this. This is just, you know, baby's first web app, uh, but it's useful to already start to see how many different kinds of machines are involved and also start to get familiar with when you're executing commands remotely versus locally. In terms of speed, we did a lot of things in this interactive start we would not normally do. For example, we worked with PEM files in the directory they landed rather than moving them to SSH. In practice, you'd want to put code through three stages, a dev, a staging, and a production branch before just pushing to the live site. Um, there's a lot of kind of shortcuts we took just to make things simple, uh, but we'll cover things like this in more detail as the course progresses. Um, you may also find it useful now that you've got some familiarity to go through the uh, vocabulary over here. Uh, we will have some multiple choice questions on this content in homework number one. So uh, great job, you got your first web app up and now let's move on to even bigger things. Welcome to lecture three of Startup Engineering. Uh, I'm your instructor, Balaji Srinivasan. Today we're going to talk about Linux and uh, file system basics and kind of getting your way around the uh, Linux uh, operating system. And we're also going to introduce uh, server-side JavaScript and show how to edit and run a few sample node programs. So let's jump in and talk about the overview with respect to Linux. You're likely a user of the Windows or OS X operating systems, and uh, I won't recapitulate all of this stuff, but basically the idea is that you're used to interacting with a computer through a GUI. Uh, we're going to interact for most of this class uh, through the command line interface um, and uh, it's worth uh, kind of uh, going over uh, this link over here in particular to understand the distinctions between um, the various Unix, Linux, BSD, and OS X clones. But the command line interface we're probably going to use is that uh, associated with the Linux uh, operating system, specifically the distribution called Ubuntu. Um, there are several key features of Linux uh, that are worth uh, keeping in mind. Um, one is that you know Linux is in general controlled by a command line interface. It doesn't have licensing fees, so you can run many machines. Unlike uh, Windows, you don't need to pay on a per computer basis. Linux is also open source uh, and has a massive base of open source software additions to it, um, which you can download for free. Uh, most uh, Linux software is geared towards the needs of engineers uh, versus uh, those of, say, end users. So, for example, it's easy to edit movies in Linux, uh, but watching them is a little bit more of a pain. Linux also has something called the server-side loophole. Um, this is a little bit of a complex topic, but it's very important for anybody who's interested in um, doing anything commercial in the startup space. Essentially, the idea is that um, if you are running a web application, you can make modifications to GPL licensed code, uh, including Linux, without distributing said modifications. Um, unlike, for example, uh, Microsoft, which is uh, actually distributing CDs with uh, shrink-wrapped uh, software, uh, if they made modifications to open source code, including it uh, with their operating system, and then distributed uh, that operating system, they'd have to distribute the source code as well. Um, a web application provider, however, can get away with this because just providing, say, a search box uh, or a social network is not considered to be distributing uh, the software. 
Um, so this server-side loophole is why internet companies can use a great deal of open source software without necessarily open sourcing their entire code base. Google search code base is not open source. Uh, and uh, there was a license called the AGPL that was written to close this loophole, uh, and there are major projects like MongoDB that use it. Uh, but in general, um, what's interesting about you know being an internet startup and using open source is you can sort of eat your cake and have it too. Um, it should be noted that there's other you know business models, ways to make money with open source. There's the professional open source model pioneered by Red Hat. The problem with this, though, and we'll go into this later in the class, is that a model that's based on consulting is based on a service business uh, versus a product business. And a service business does not scale. Uh, you need to add more billable hours by hiring more competent people. Uh, and that is just fundamentally a less reproducible process than adding more uh, servers, uh, which you would do in a product business. Um, so uh, in terms of how Linux is used in the Valley, in general, uh, it's an OSX client and a Linux server that is to say one will run a Windows, uh, or rather a Mac laptop, uh, sometimes a Chromebook, uh, and connect to a development machine that is often a virtual machine, which we'll talk about in a second, running Linux. Uh, and this is the standard development environment uh, for most uh, internet startups in the Valley. In terms of distribution, um, Ubuntu is probably the most overall uh, popular and all-around polished distribution, both for kind of servers and for uh, you know a so-called desktop environment. If you're running Linux on a local machine, um, it's worth also mentioning uh, Android. Uh, it is a Linux-based operating system. One usually doesn't think of it in the same breath as Ubuntu because uh, it is for mobile clients like tablets and smartphones, uh, but it is probably the most popular Linux distribution in the world. Um, you know, Android on Raspberry Pi may change the calculation as to whether or not we consider it an engineer's primary OS. So that's worth watching to see if that happens. Okay, um, so let's uh, talk next about virtual machines. Let's talk a bit now about the concept of virtualization. Um, the idea behind virtualization is that uh, we can take a single computer with eight processors and make it seem like eight independent computers, each capable of being wiped and rebooted without affecting the others. A good analogy is thinking of a house with eight rooms, and we turn each of those eight rooms into um, rentable apartments where tenants can come and go without really worrying about the other tenants. And in fact, that kind of vocabulary is used often, uh, multi-tenant operating system and multi-tenant virtualization. Um, one thing about virtualization is it's not magic. Uh, you know, extremely high workloads on one of the other tenants in a VM system can affect your room in the same way that a very loud next door neighbor can overwhelm the soundproofing. And here's a good visual of what you know virtualization looks like from uh, VMware's marketing. Um, the main thing to keep in mind uh, for the purpose of this course is that um, virtualization and virtual machines uh, allow Amazon to provision machines that you can wipe and reboot without affecting their underlying hardware. Let's talk a bit about the cloud. Um, so people talk about the cloud uh, all the time. Um, this is something which has almost uh, achieved the level of, uh, well not almost, it has achieved the level of triteness. Uh, but there's really kind of three aspects of the cloud that are worth uh, keeping in mind. Um, IAS, PAS, and SAS. These are kind of three layers of cloud services. IAS services like Amazon Web Services, Joint, Rackspace Cloud, and, and others uh, are services which provide you direct command line access to the hardware. PAS services, platform as a service companies like Heroku and, and these others, uh, provide you an API usually. Uh, they hide and abstract away the command line. Heroku began as a layer on top of Amazon Web Services. Uh, but they also mean that you can accomplish things with many fewer commands than AWS. Finally, there's you know SAS, software as a service, and this is something where you're interacting solely with an API or a GUI, uh, and you don't have any direct control over the hardware. Let's talk about Linux basics for a little bit. In the last lecture, the interactive start, uh, we now have uh, a little bit more vocabulary to understand exactly what it is that we did. First, we use an SSH client on our local Windows or Mac computer to connect to, to connect to an AWS instance, a virtual machine, which we now understand what that is, running Ubuntu Linux, and we now understand what that is, running um, in one of Amazon's data centers. And the version it was running is 12.042 uh, LTS. Upon connecting to that instance, you're presented with a bash shell, and this was waiting for our typed in commands, and this is sort of how that whole experience looked. You, you know, changed your downloads directory where you got your private key file from Amazon. 
you change the permissions on that private key so that only you could read them. Uh, this is something where otherwise it's not a private key if it's not um, uh, readable just by yourself. 400 is a code for just yourself. And uh, then we SSH'd in uh, using uh, that primary key, specifying it on the command line, specifying the name of the remote user and the host name. And uh, from this point forward, we're going to do some screencasts that go through some Linux commands. We're going to go through a brief screencast now uh, regarding file system basics. Uh, you're probably familiar with the concept of directories and files from working with your local computer. And Linux has the same concepts. But the main difference is that you generally go through directories and create and delete, update and read files by typing in commands rather than clicking on things. So we're going to go through a short interactive example uh, which will illustrate how to kind of do these manipulations. Uh, and here's the examples over here. You're going to be executing these on the remote machine. Uh, it's a series of commands. Um, I'll provide some color commentary at the end, uh, but let's just do them and kind of see what happens. So as mentioned, we're going to execute these commands on the remote machine. So we SSH in like this, change the home directory, print the working directory, Now we're back in the home directory after having created my file. We just copied my dire my file into a file in the home directory called my file two with the same contents. This is an interactive removal of this file. Now we're going to copy the entire directory, my dire, into a directory called new dire, as well as all subdirectories. We just removed the directory, the old one. We're now in the new directory. We removed all the files that we created. Notice that my file real named and my file copy had different contents because after we copied them, we added different content to each of them with the echo command. This caret caret redirects the output of this and appends it to the end of the file. We'll talk about std and std out and so on in a later lecture. Great. So that should give you an intuitive understanding of how to navigate between directories with CD, print the current working directory with PWD, print the context of files with cat, list the contents of directories with LS, copy files with CP, rename files and move files with move, and remove files and directories with room. We'll do a lot more on this, but you can read more at these links. And you might also execute this command and use CD to explore the Ubuntu directory hierarchy. Let's talk about env, path, and home. The env, env command lists all environmental uh, variables. 
these are parameters for bash that affect uh, what happens uh, when you um, type in the same commands. It can produce different behaviors based on these environmental variables. Here's an example of running env on a remote machine. You can see uh, various values, for example, that uh, the user is Ubuntu or that the um, current home directory is home Ubuntu. Perhaps the most important path variable or uh, environmental variable is called path. What's a path? It's basically the order of directories which the computer will search for programs to execute. In Ubuntu, this is the default order of directories. And if you read this post over here, that will give more information on why this particular order is a default search path for Ubuntu. But essentially the concept is that the computer will look first here, and then here, 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 and finally here uh, to find a command when you type it in. One last uh, environmental variable also deserves uh, reference in addition to path, which is home. Home is also known as tilde, or the home directory. If you execute echo home at the prompt, you will see home Ubuntu, as we're currently logged in as a user named Ubuntu. You can change the home directory at any time by typing cd home, cd tilde, or just cd, and then hitting enter. By convention, files that are specific to a given user are generally placed in the home directory. Let's talk a bit about debugging path issues with the which command. We've just dialed up a new EC2 instance, uh, just a fresh one from the launch instance screen. If we type in which git, nothing will be there. If we now install git, which git now produces a path as expected. If we execute user bin git dash dash help or git dash dash help, we get the same output because the name git is an alias for user bin git. However, to make things a little more interesting, let's introduce a path conflict. Here's the git command. We're going to download a fake file of the same name, git. And we're going to change the path around such that now Home Ubuntu bin comes first. We type in which dash a git, we see now there are two gits, and now if we execute git, we'll get the fake git. Another way of saying that is the fake one, and here is the real one. Now, if we want to restore the path, now user bin git comes first because we took away home Ubuntu git. Git works. This still works. and user bin git still works. Here is kind of a written description of exactly what we did 
but this will give you some idea of how to introduce and also resolve conflicts in the path using the which-a command to figure out exactly where the command that you think you're referring to is located on the file system. To be completely unambiguous at all times, you can always type in the full path name of the file, but the short path name, or the effect of typing the short path name, will differ based on uh, your path. Um, and here, the exact same command produces a different result because home Ubuntu bin is at the beginning of the path. So this will give you some understanding of the path and how to debug issues using the which command. Let's talk about SSH for a little bit. Previously, we executed a command like so, where the name of your PEM file and the name of your host name is going to differ in your version versus mine. Um, we need to just basically change into the directory where this PEM file is to pass it in this fashion. Otherwise, we would need to prepend the directory name over here. Let's just execute this now and show that we can not only SSH into a machine, but we can also run commands remotely on that machine. Just in case, we change mon 400. This is probably already done if you've SSH in before, but we'll do it again. Great, that worked. You can type in exit to exit. Importantly, we can execute commands on the remote machine as so. That's pretty cool. We can actually execute this command on the remote machine without ever fully logging in. We can just see the result of it on the local machine. So that's pretty awesome. Now let's look at a quick shortcut because passing all this information on the command line each time is a little unwieldy. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a configuration file in a local directory called .ssh. And in this configuration file, we're going to include the parameters that we were passing on the command line here so that we can just type in something like ssh aws host rather than ssh and then all of this junk afterwards. And what do we do on the local machine? We execute these commands as shown. Now we can simply do this. That's pretty awesome. And just like before, we could execute commands as follows. Now let's do some quick examples with SCP, which like SSH, uh, while well, SSH uh, allows you to connect to a remote machine and run commands on it, you can use the allied SCP command to copy files back and forth from the remote machine. This is useful for the homework, as you can edit and generate files on the remote computer and bring them locally, or download data sets for homework assignments through your web browser, and then push them to the remote machine. So you can both upload and download files. Here are examples that use the verbose syntax where we're passing in the key on the command line. But if you did the previous uh, subsection, and you set up a config file, everything becomes much simpler. Let's just show how this works in practice. Creating a file hello.txt, copying it over here, copying it there with a new name, and then bringing it back down.
So we can see that the same file we copied in a bunch of different locations under a bunch of different names. And that's how you use SCP. Let's talk a little bit about Bash, the command interpreter. Bash is a shell. There are many other shells like this, but this is your shell. Um, we're going to use Bash because it's ubiquitous and standardized. This is basically what we've been typing commands into. One thing about Bash is you can execute commands uh, you know, in a row like this, but often what you'll want to do is put a bunch of commands into a single shell script. I want to illustrate kind of what that looks like. Here's a, just a simple three-line shell script. This top thing is called a shebang. You can click here to kind of read more about it. But basically, it's magic that tells the shell what program to use to interpret the rest of the script. In this case, it's bash itself. In some other examples, you're going to use user bin end of node rather than bin bash. So let's take this three-line script and just show how to execute it on our remote EC2 instance. Pretty cool. We've now got some of the basics of Linux. We'll do more, but uh, we have enough that we can work on basic server-side JavaScript. We're going to use the apt-get program to install uh, Node.js on our uh, remote EC2 instance, and we're going to begin our first JavaScript exercises by thinking of Node.js as just another server-side scripting language like Python or Perl without using, at least right now, any of the sophisticated features of Node like networking and asynchronous invocation or shared client and server code. Um, this set of commands uh, is prefixed with sudo. That means super user do, uh, and it's uh, like executing command as the administrator on your local uh, Windows or Mac laptop. It basically says you're executing the command as the root or the super user on the remote machine. So that's sudo. apt-get is a package manager for Ubuntu. You can see a little bit more on it earlier in the notes. We're first going to update then uh, the, the list of all the packages that apt-get knows about. We're going to add um, a package called Python Software Properties, Python itself, G++ a compiler, and the make program. We're going to add another repository which tells us how to install Node.js. We're going to update it, and then we're going to install Node.js. So let's do that, and we're going to just kind of fast forward through this because you'll just see animations going on your screen. We're going to say yes here to continue or enter. Finally, we're going to install Node.js. We know this worked because now we can do node dash dash version and npm dash dash version. Great. Let's share briefly how to edit Node.js code with the nano code editor using two windows. This is somewhat primitive, but uh, by doing it this way for a little bit, it will increase your appreciation for the more sophisticated tool chain we'll introduce that combines both Emacs and screen. 
As shown in this screenshot, what you want to do is open up basically two windows. This is for Mac OS X, where you've got two terminal windows. But for Windows, you'll open up two Sigwin windows. In the first one, you'll have your editor open. And in the second one, you'll execute code over here. So you can edit over here and then execute over here and go back and forth. To control Nano, you're going to be using sequences that begin with this caret over there. That means the control symbol on your keyboard. So when it says caret O like this, it means to hold down control and uh, then hit O. Uh, and uh, so you'll see how that works in just a second. So let's go to two windows that are connected to the remote machine. Here they are like so. Let me just do it from scratch. Type in nano hello.js, enter, pound user bin env node. That's a shebang line. Console.log, hello world, semicolon, and we're going to hit control O to write out, enter. And now I can do node hello.js below. In addition, if I want to edit in one window while I execute another, watch as I hit hello world, like so, hit control O to save, and now execute the code again over here, the modified code. So this is a way that you can edit in one window and execute in another without having to go back and forth. Just hit your edits over here, then control O to write out, and then you can execute the code in the second window. Okay, great. Let's now do a second program where we are uh, writing out uh, a file. Uh, here is uh, a simple program with just six lines. Um, we're going to define a variable that is equal to, um, or really it's the, the library of the file system. The, the variable is going to hold it. We're defining an out file and an out string. We're going to call a library function and then we're going to write this out. And what you want to do really is open up uh, nano and type in hello2.js and type this stuff in as follows, user bin and you know, node. Um, we're going to cheat in just this uh, video uh, and I'm going to uh, just w get this file. When it works, what it's going to do is it's going to write to hello.txt. Fantastic. Finally, here's our third node program, which is a little bit more complicated, which is computing the Fibonacci numbers. Modifying this program will make it relatively easy to solve the prime number problem in the homework. What you really should do is open nano fibonacci.js and type in the following code. Uh, if you click this link over here, you will find Zed Shaw talking about how typing in code is similar to you know writing math with a pen and paper. Uh, it it does mean that you know you sort of get it in your brain. Um, but uh, just for the purposes of the screencast, we're going to w get the file and run it. Um, but let's walk through this very briefly. Here what we're doing is, you know, we're defining the Fibonacci numbers or a function that computes them. This Wikipedia article will tell you more about them. Uh, and uh, we're doing so in a little bit of an odd way. We're actually setting a variable equal to a function over here. It's a very common idiom in JavaScript. We'll talk about it more, but just think of this as a sort of an odd function definition. Um, just basic if else over here, just, you know, various cases for n. This is a more sophisticated version of computing the Fibonacci numbers, which actually uses uh, the golden ratio and uh, some you know, uh, uh, theorems around uh, arithmetic series. Um, you can read this article and kind of see how this formula uh, implements this in the article. The main thing that's of interest is it's using square root, round, power, and, and things of that nature, which you'll probably also want to use during your prime number computation. Finally, um, this is just a basic for loop, which loops over and prints out the first k Fibonacci numbers. And it does so, or rather not prints out, but it appends them to an array. It does so by defining an array, running in a loop, uh, and then pushing, which is appending uh, to the end, uh, passing an i for the uh, ith value in this array. The last thing it does is it kind of prints all these results to the console, uh, and it uses this format routine over here to make this look uh, reasonably good. Um, so the uh, execution of the script gives you the first 20 Fibonacci numbers. Let's see what that looks like online.
this is the same code that we entered in. We can see that if we change it to be executable and then just execute it, it prints out the first 20 Fibonacci numbers as expected. You can now modify this and you should be able to solve the primes problem. Welcome to lecture 4a of Startup Engineering. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the Linux command line and uh, go through a number of examples of different uh, command line utilities, showing how to string them together as well as how to use them individually. Uh, you're going to want to play around with these commands on your own and use dash dash help to explore various kinds of flags, but hopefully this will be a good introduction to sort of the capabilities of Linux. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, jump in. Okay, so we're talking about the Linux command line. And in general, you know, the best way to understand the command line is really just to go through a large number of examples. Um, there are some references over here that I've listed. Uh, the command line crash course is quite good. You can go through this. Uh, Mark Sabell's uh, Linux book and Unix power tools are well worth buying, uh, as is the sysadmin handbook if you want to get a little lower level in your investigations. Um, we're going to start out, uh, as usual, by uh, opening up an EC2 virtual machine and SSHing in. Uh, we're doing all these commands in a vanilla environment without much in the way of configuration. Uh, as we progress, we're going to set up quite a lot. So let's talk now a little bit about uh, the three streams, uh, standard in, standard out, and standard error. Um, the way to visualize this is basically that um, from your keyboard, uh, you are giving standard into a program. You can also cat a file uh, and send uh, data in uh, to a program, but basically text input to a program. And that program will produce output, standard out, and it will also have informational messages or error messages that will go to standard error. And uh, these are by default, uh, you know, echoed back to the display. But what's interesting is you can reconnect these to pipe into other programs, just like you can have other programs upstream uh, pipe in, uh, you know, data into standard in. And uh, to get a sense of that, uh, there's a bunch of commands over here which uh, you can run. Uh, and it's worth uh, going through these at the command line. So let's do that. So that didn't work. Fake URL is not a URL. We can actually take that error message and pipe it, or redirect it rather, to errors.txt. So this was a redirection of standard out without the uh, numeral in front of it, just a caret or, or a greater than symbol. And here was a redirection of standard error. We can see that this message is the same as what we would have seen over here that was uh, printed to the prompt. Now, we had some proper output go to standard out and some error messages go to uh, standard error. And we set it up so that we were redirecting both of these, the standard out to out1.txt and the standard error to out2.txt. Here, curl google.com produced normal standard out, whereas fake URL produced standard error. Notice also that this informational message about curl uh, downloading a file was printed out to standard error. Here's a version where we've actually sent them both to just the same file, both standard error and standard out, um, all in just one big smash. This is an example where we actually sent this as standard in to head through something that we're going to talk about called a pipe.
Here's an example of taking the output from uh, curling google.com, basically pulling that content, taking the first two lines of it, and then sending both the, uh, basically everything that was produced here to asdf.txt, both standard in and standard error. And this is an example of a pipe over here. So it's a technique of connecting one command standard out to another con uh, command standard in. Um, we'll do a lot more with Unix pipes, but in general, when you can write programs in this way, by piping one thing into the next, you generally should because the resulting programs are often very quick to write and actually surprisingly robust. It's called Taco Bell programming. You can take a look at that link. So here are some commands uh, as we begin our exploration of uh, Unix in a little more depth than before. We did an interactive session before where we worked through a bunch of navigation and file system commands. Uh, here we're listing them individually and going through examples. Uh, I will skip over this particular section, but you can go through these. The uh, you know so there's list for you know listing files, touch for modifying and creating them, echo uh, which will you know take a string and echo it back to the prompt, uh, cp which is copy. Uh, you'll want to pay attention to you know flags like dash a which is very useful for archival copy. Um, Move, you know, also very powerful for moving or re, uh, renaming files. Um, remove and, you know, rm-rf is, you know, the powerful remove uh, command. The one thing that you may not have seen or worked with as much is symbolic linking or ln. This is very powerful. ln-s in particular allows a file to be symbolically linked and therefore, in, you know, more than one place at the same time. So here, for example, we create a data file. Uh, and then we symbolically link that data file into a new file name called latest.txt. If we do head on latest.txt, it will produce the same results as if we had done head on data1.txt. The only way we can tell the difference between these is by listing them. I mean, there's other ways, but one of the easiest is by listing them. And you will see an arrow uh, and a symbolic link will basically come up as looking different than a normal um, file. So try this out. Try this out for yourself and see how that works. Beyond ln, most other commands you'll have seen, pwd for working directory, make dire, cd, and so on. Uh, room dire, and, and here's room-rf again. Um, and so that kind of concludes like navigation in the file system, but I recommend you type these commands in and try them out. Let's step through a few networking commands to see how these are used. First, we'll start with rsync. This is a very powerful command that will uh, remotely synchronize uh, a local uh, directory to a remote directory or vice versa. So in this example, we create a data file and then we do rsync archival verbose progress meter uh, and we take that data file and we push it to our remote Amazon machine. Here it's AWS host 4. This is set up as part of the SSH config which we did in previous lectures. Importantly, after we send it the first time, the first time we send all 4,632 bytes, if we repeat it a second time, much less is sent. And that's one of the awesome parts of rsync. It is an efficient uh, resumer of transfers, and that's really essential if you're working with large files or over slow connections or both. Um, so you should usually use rsync over SCP. Uh, so just as an exercise, run these commands and then shn and run cat on something.txt while your SSH into AWS host 4 uh, or whatever you name your alias, uh, just to confirm that that file was uploaded. Okay, so that's our sync. Wget, uh, we've used this already a few times. Uh, this is, you know, uh, an example of wgetting a file. Uh, here you can wget a web page as well. You can use less to look at that web page. Here is a more advanced example where you can recursively download an entire site. We're putting a wait command over here, recursive, non-ascending to the parent, k and p are more, you know, that there are options for like converting links and so on. And you can always do wget dash dash help to see what the invocations are. Um, so here is wget dash dash help. And I'll show you all these various flags. You can pipe it to less and then browse up and down like so, um, just to look at all these flags. So try those out. So that's wget. Whereas wget is a spider, curl is really for interacting with single URLs at a time. It's not gonna do the spidering and recursive things that wget can do, um, but it's really a building block for API calls, uh, among other things. So here's an example, um, you know, this is 
uh, an example of actually running an install script. Um, you're, you're pulling it down and then piping it to less in this case. Um, or in other cases, you would pipe it to sh, and then it would actually execute the uh, the install script. Here's another really good example which you should walk through. Uh, try these commands out in this order, and what you'll find is that um, you're basically doing API calls from the command line uh, via curl. And uh, this is the basis of a lot of the stuff we'll do later in the quarter, um, but allows you to basically test out an API just from the command line. Um, another command that's very useful is ping. This is just a good way to see first whether you have internet connectivity. If Google is down, then probably the internet is down. Uh, and then also checking whether some remote host is up. And so this has a surprisingly large number of options. You can do flood pings, all kinds of interesting things. And this gives an introduction to a few networking commands. Now we're going to do some text processing. Let's start with the less command, which we've used a few times already without formally introducing it. Here we're going to use less to look at our sync dash dash help. And uh, as we'll see, it goes on for quite a while. If we pipe it to the less command, then uh, we can you know, go up and down like so. Now, what are we actually doing there? Uh, what we're doing is we are hitting um, control N to go down and then control P to go up. Uh, and so that's very simple to kind of scroll down and up and less allows you to scroll up. When you're done, just hit Q and then you're out. We've also used cat a few times. Cat's an industrial strength file viewer and concatenator. Um, we're going to do a simple example where we, you know, get a humongous uh, chromosome file from, uh, you know, NCBI. This is a chromosome 22 of, of humans. You're going to see this is a big text file. We're going to unzip that, look at it a little bit with less, and then cat it out. And we're going to hit Control C to stop it because it's going to be such a big file. So let's do that. I'll tell, take a little while to W get this. We unzip it. We can take a look at it and quit it. And then we can hit cat and watch it scroll for quite a while. And we'll hit Control C to stop that. Next, let's look, do some. Next, let's work with head and tail. So we're going to look at the first few lines of a file with head, and conversely, the last few lines of a file with tail. Head is used for just checking that you know files are downloaded properly. Um, here's the first ten lines, and here's the first fifty. You can pass in a dash n flag to you know get more than uh, just uh, fifty. Um, you can take the heads of multiple files and you can get them without delimiters and then also the first 50 characters. So let's just do that real quick. So here is head star GBK. That's pretty cool. Then here is um, dash dash help, which shows you various options. That's the first 50 lines. And that's the same as doing that. If we passed in 30 lines, it would be the first 30. This gives you know uh, all the star you know text files and all the GBK files and notice these um, header lines are printed with each of them. If we do the same thing but pass in dash Q, now it doesn't have them at all and it's kind of like concatenating in fact. This is an interesting command which actually just takes the first 50 characters. And just like we have head, we also got another command called tail, which uh, is the end of files rather than the beginning. So we can do tail star gbk, right? Tail dash n plus three star gbk, which means, um, you know, start at the third line and then do head and compare that to head star gbk. And notice that we started here at the third line by doing tail dash n plus three. So you can kind of do a tail from the top.
That pulls out an intermediate section. We took the first thousand lines of the GenBank file and the last 20 of them. Here's an example that combines with head and tail to look at the creation of a large file, which we can then watch being built up in real time. So we're gonna cat or basically create a huge number of lines in this foo file. And then we're going to follow the creation of it with tail-f. This is very useful for looking at log files or anything that is getting built up over time. You can always hit control C to exit or just wait till it completes. Let's crank through a few more examples, starting with the cut command. Then we're gonna number lines, paste some columns together, sort by lines, uniquify, and then do some word and character counts, and finally split files into pieces. First, let's start with the cut command. I'm just gonna pull down uh, a different genomic file. This is the E. coli K12 PTT file, which is a table of all the proteins in this bacteria. It's from NCBI. If you're interested in genomics, you can mess around with this. So let's W get this file and then take a look at it. So this is a PTT file. It basically looks like a table. Whenever you've got a table, the cut command is quite useful. Let's pull out the second column of this PTT file and look at the first 10 lines of that second column. You see that's the second column here, but notice there's two header lines over here, so we only really get seven actual rows here. We can look at the first 30 rows, and uh, we can you know, pull out the first uh, the second and the fifth column with cut out dash f2 comma 5. We can also do interesting things like chaining invocations together. For example, we can cut out the first column and then we can cut out the first element in each row by cutting where we change the delimiter to a period instead. And now we get this because we cut it over there rather than on a space. Finally, just as with head and tail, we can use cut to take the first 20 characters of each row. So it chops off 20 characters like this rather than on a delimited field. Just like we can cut, we can also number lines. So here is numbering lines. So we numbered every single line of the file and took the last number then. So 600, uh, uh, 635,385 lines in the GBK file. We can also do that with the PTT file. This time, maybe we'll take the last two lines. So there's 4,220 lines in this file. Uh, and here's the last two lines where we insert a line number. Just for confirmation, that's what the last two lines look like. Next, let's talk about paste. So what we're gonna do is pull out the lines from this PTT file after the header. I'm gonna cut the first one and uh, first column and put that in a file called Lokes. I'm gonna cut the fifth column and put that in a file called Genes. And see what Lokes is and you can see what Genes is. We can paste Lokes and Genes together and just for you know, fun, we'll actually paste genes there again. And that's what the paste command does. And basically just paste columns together and you can paste them together repeatedly. Next, let's look at sort. So sort, we can invoke on genes and pipe it to less. And so we see it has an alphabetical sort. We can quit with Q. We can do reverse sort. Now Z is at the top. We can do a random sort. Now, you know, everything is all messed up. We can also put sort in a pipeline. So here is, you know, plus and minuses, and we can sort that. 
such that we've got all the plus at the top and then the minuses you can't see because we just print out the first 10 lines. If we look at unique, it gives similar kinds of properties. It's very useful because we took that sort command from before, we piped it to unique-c, which gave counts. Then we inverse sorted on the first column, reverse numerical order. So we found that the most common symbol in that column was a minus. Uh, corresponding to the minus strand of DNA, that protein, you know, there's 21 or 2,121 uh, proteins that are on the negative strand or the minus strand, and 2,096 proteins that are on the positive strand. And we can do that with unique. You can look at the other examples as well on that. Finally, let's do WC and split. WC will show you some statistics on a file. Uh, this is basically the number of lines. 4,220, which we also saw before. This is the number of words, quote unquote, 4,700 or 47,431. And that's the number of bytes, 354,213. Here's an example of using WC to just look at the number of lines. This is a very common thing that you'll do. And here's another very useful command that will show you the longest line length in the file. And that shows that the longest line length has 269 characters. This is very useful sometimes when you need to pre-allocate a buffer or just do some quick analysis on a file. So this kind of tells you the length in terms of the number of rows and this tells you the width in terms of the number of columns or at least the maximum width. Finally, let's talk about the split command. Split command is um, useful when you want to set up a parallel processing job. So let's say we want to split this file, start PTT into a bunch of subfiles, each of which it starts with subset.ptt. You know, period. And what we find is that we've now got five of those. And we can look at each of those and we split them up like this. So that kind of concludes our introduction to text processing. And then we'll do some more with more advanced text processing in a little bit. We're gonna talk about help, system and program information, and uh, also look at uh, some commands like sleep and so on. So when you're talking about online help, man and info are your friends. You can type man bash, man ls, or even man man um, to get some information about a command. In general, this is helpful when you kind of know what you're looking for and uh, you know wanna see if it's there. Info gives a little more detail uh, and you can exit info with just hitting you know, Q to, to get out of it. So try these commands, see how they are. You can also get some diagnostics, um, uname uh, to get quick diagnostics on a computer, host name to determine the name of the current machine, and who am I. Let's just quickly show those. So here's uname-a, here's host name, and here's who am I. And so you can get kind of you know, a fair amount of information from uname-a. Just for completeness, we can even try doing, you know, like man, uh, you name, for example. And we will get a man page like so, which we can go up and down on. And then we can hit Q to exit that man page. Let's take a look at the PS command and uh, then look at the uh, kill command and the top command uh, and kind of see how those interact. Basically, PS will give you the current processes, top will tell you the most important processes that are running, and then kill will let you basically shut down a process uh, that you want to stop. Let's see how those interact. So say that we create a process that sleeps for 10 seconds. Then what we can do is grab for sleep over here, and we actually see that same process number that we launched, 1564, is available right then. If we then just wait a little bit longer, we're gonna see 1564 come back and say that it's finished, See, it's done. So sleep 10 is done. And now if I try to grep it, it's no longer there. So that's kind of, you know, how you can use PS and then XW or just, you know, uh, basically arguments to the PS command. Um, in addition to looking for specific processes where I'm grepping, you know, like this, I can just, you know, type in the whole thing like so, and it'll show me all the processes that are up. So we can also use the top command to see what programs are currently taking up a lot of memory and, and so on and so forth. Here's kind of what's going on on this particular machine. 
see init uh, you know command that's number one um, but you can get much more granular and you can see if there's commands that are running that are taking up a lot of memory or CPU or, or things of that nature. Let's talk about the kill command. We're going to make something sleep for 30 seconds and then we're going to kill it before it can finish uh, you know, performing its action. So something sleep for 30 seconds. It's process 1575. We can just kill that. Boom. And it's done. And now you know, if we grab for sleep it's not there because we just killed it. It's terminated. So that's what the kill command does. It's got more options, but you can use it to kill long running processes or processes that you don't want to exist. We're going to go through some commands for basically working as a super user and then do storage and finding. So um, what is a super user? It's a root user on Windows. It might be called the administrator. Um, basically, it is the user that has complete access to the machine. Um, you've done sudo a bunch of times. It's basically super user do. Uh, and the concept is you usually don't want to be the super user, you know, all the time. You don't want to run as root. Um, you just want to do it for a few commands. So here's a canonical kind of example where you're installing some software, um, basically the Git uh, software. Here's an example where you actually need to become the root user. Sometimes you do this when you've got a bunch of commands to type in a row as a super user, but usually you don't want to do this. Um, if you go through this example, you will see that the permissions on the root file, that is to say the file that was created while you were in SU mode, are going to be different than those of the uh, normal file. Basically, you'll be, the, the owner will be changed. It'll be a root rather than, um, or the super user rather than a normal user. So that's kind of, you know, super user. So let's quickly talk about some commands for basically storage and finding. Tar is a command you'll use a lot. Basically, it goes all the way back to tapes. It means tape archive. Um, compress, uh, you know, files with gzip. So this is like zipping up files. You usually combine these to make a tar gz, which is a very common way of distributing files in Unix. Basically, you take a directory, make it into a tar file, and then zip up that tar file. We'll show an example in a second. Um, in addition to those storage commands, there is find, which is useful for directories where you haven't built an index, and locate, which is useful for directories, really the entire system where you have built an index. Um, and finally, df and du, which will give you kind of some numbers on you know, how much storage is being used in, in system-wide and then for a, a given directory. Uh, so here is sort of you know, how we would create this tar file. Um, we make dire genome. We move all the PTT files into that genome directory. We do star cvf genome.tar genome. And we see that all of these files are then, uh, all these files are then put into that uh, genome uh, tar. We can then, continuing this example, gzip that file. And uh, we can show that when we unzip it, it's going to produce the you know same result. So if we zip the file, that produces the same result. The X, it's extraction, C is creation as the thing that we created. You can poke around the directory and explore for yourself. For the location, uh, find, df, and du commands, I recommend just kind of going through, executing these, trying these out, um, and just sort of getting a sense for how they work, doing df dash help, and so on. Uh, these will give you the flavor of them. So let's talk about intermediate text processing, which is basically grep, said, and awk. So the uh, grep command is basically, you know, the GNU regular expression parser. Um, very powerful command. It's worth learning in great detail. Uh, here, if we wget that PHT file, you can use it to find all the lines that contain protein and figure out how many of those there are. Um, you can find uh, all the file names which contain metazoa. In that case, it's only going to be the GBK file. The PHT file won't have it. You can look for context around it, dash b5 and a5 are before and after five lines for that string. And then you can do things like look at the number of counts within the uh, GBK of, of the string journal dot star. And so that's a regular expression there and you can sort and unique. So go through grep.
Next, let's talk about sed. So what sed does is basically quickly finds and replaces content within a file. Um, there's a great list of sed one-liners if you go to that uh, link. Um, here's an example of replacing all instances of the string kinase with Stanford in the first 10 lines of a PTT file and then echoing the results to STD out. Uh, one of the great you know, use cases for sed is quick cleanups of files. Uh, for example, say that you've got a Windows New Line file here. Um, you know, let's go through this example because it's not too hard, but it's a little tricky. Um, first, we're going to download that file. Then we're going to look at it, and then we're going to see why it needs to be fixed. So first, let's download it. So we've got a file called windows-newline-file.csv. What happens if we try to cat that file? We don't really see much. It kind of was broken. Um, if we do less on the file, though, we start to see what the issue is. The issue is there is a Windows New Line, which is rendered in Unix often as a caret M symbol. And that Windows New Line corresponds to a carriage return in Unix. So what's happening is this is printing this, and there's a carriage return. The cursor is moving back to the beginning of the line. It's printing this. There's another carriage return. It's moving back to the beginning of the line again, and then it's printing this. And then, you know, that's that's how this is interpreted as, as something that moves the cursor back before it prints out. And the way that we can fix this is very simply if we do the following command. So this substitutes carriage returns for new lines globally in this command, in this file. And if we push dash i, it's interactive. And now, ta-da, that worked. So that's how you use said. Last but not least, let's talk about awk. Um, awk is really a whole scripting language in its own right. It's really the tool for working with tab limited text. Um, if all you need to do is rearrange some columns, do some basic arithmetic, or otherwise, you know, refashion a, a large tab limited text file, um, awk is very well worth looking into rather than something more complicated. Here's an example of an, you know, a little awk uh, command line. First, we're going to take uh, the PTT file, we're going to rip off the first four lines and then start printing after that. And then we're going to pipe that into awk. It's going to split on tabs as its delimiter, which is passed with dash F. And it's going to print out the second column, the third column, and then the third column again, except now plus five. And then we're going to look at the first uh, 10 lines of that, which is a default uh, of head. Um, there's a great list of awk one-liners here, um, which you should take a look at to get a sense of all the things awk can do. But let's just do this one, you know, simple example to see how this works. And here's what the original PTT looked like. So you see we pulled out the second column. So first we took the first three lines through the way and started printing at the fourth line. That was tail dash n plus four star PTT. And then what awk did was it printed the second, the third, and the third column plus five. So this is the second column, which is a plus. Here's the third column, which is a 21. And this third column plus five, which is 26. And then did it again, 8, 20, 3, 10, 4, 28, etc. And interpreted them numerically and added five to them. So awk is really useful for this kind of stuff, arithmetic and manipulations on tapped limited text files as well as really any other kind of delimited file, you can change the delimiter over there. Given that you're going to be executing, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of commands with bash, it's actually quite useful to learn some of these keyboard shortcuts because they will save you a lot of time. So let's go through these with a little demo. Um, if we do head star PTT star GBK, so I've got a um, tool, by the way, that will show the things I'm typing in over here, um, that's going to start to become useful right now. So watch me type control A, and I go to the beginning of the line, so it's a caret and then an A. Control E, and I go to the end of the line. Okay, so control A, control E, control A, control E. So that gets me back and forth. Uh, if I want to go to the beginning and then kill the line, it's control A, then followed by control K. And if I use control P, I can look at previous commands like so. So I'm going up in the history. 
And if I use Control N, I can also come down in the history towards the, you know, back the way that we just came. If, if we do Control R, I can look for things that say, said Homo sapiens, and I can autocomplete it like that. Um, and if I hit Control F, I can move forward, and Control B, I can move backwards. Just like I can move forward one character with Control F and backwards with Control B, I can move backwards an entire word at a time by doing Meta B or forwards with Meta F. If I so desire, I can also hit Control K to kill everything from the, that position forwards and then Control Y to yank it. Uh, and to bring it back. If I hit Control Y again, then it brings it back yet again. If I hit Control Shift underscore, it goes away. So I can yank and yank and then throw it away and then throw it away again. So it's undo. In addition to all of the other bash shortcuts, which you can kind of take a look at, there's a few more that deserve particular mention. Suppose that we type in commands like the quick brown fox. Um, we can then hit Control C to go to the next line. That basically aborts a current command. Control C is a very useful thing. You can hit it all the times during bash uh, to um, stop what is currently happening and abort and return you to the prompt. Um, in this case, we've got a little bit of a mess at the top, and maybe we don't want that. Um, we can get more of a mass if we do something like wget dash dash help. Now we've got the whole screen is filled with stuff. How do we get rid of that? Simple. We hit control L like so. And that clears the entire screen. Um, so that's quite useful. You know, we can do this again with rsync help. And what we can actually do here is type clear as well. And that is actually equivalent to control L for most purposes. The last uh, command, it's not even really a command or a shortcut, but uh, we've been typing exit and enter to leave a, a prompt. The other thing you can do is just hit control D. Let's talk about a little bit more advanced or really intermediate bash. Uh, back ticks, running processes in the background, uh, as well as the commands, xargs, um, T and time. Um, so when you talk about backticks, what is you know what does that mean? What are backticks? Uh, the font here isn't that great, but essentially um, here's what backticks look like. You've got a command here. Let's say it's hostname. What you can do is you can do echo backticks hostname, uh, and uh, what this will do is it will take the output of hostname itself and put it on the command line for you to echo. Um, and uh, what you can then do is you can then pipe that to something else that, you know, say substitutes uh, IP for foo globally and you get something like this, right? Now, of course, in this case, you could have just done this and would have given you the same thing. Um, but where backticks gets more interesting is if you want to do something like this, uh, the name is and now you can substitute the value of one command in another. Going through this over here, you can put this in the background. You can look at these instructions. Basically, you start a long running process, and this gives a fairly good understanding of what's going on. We saw this earlier as well with sleep. Um, but basically, you start this process. You can do other things by putting an ampersand there. It runs in the background. You can use the computer for other things, and then it'll tell you when it's completed. Uh, and process ID 5472 over here is the name of that process. Finally, um, you should take a look at xargs, mess around with this command, and you'll kind of get a sense of what xargs does. Um, and you can read this description here as to what exactly xargs gives you over just wildcards. The short answer is that xargs is very useful for anything which is involving very large numbers of files. Um, you won't have to do too much of that in this class, but if you do any data analysis, you should be aware of xargs. Then finally, if we take a look at t and time, these are really mentioned for completeness at least. t I don't really use very much myself, but I mention it. 
As for time, this is useful for benchmarking commands. If you do time sleep five, it'll echo the fact the time took five seconds to complete. There's also a GNU time command, which actually is much more powerful, um, but that is a little bit beyond our scope for right now. So that completes kind of our intermediate bash commands. So that completes this lecture. We covered quite a few command line programs here, but nothing really substitutes for running these you know, programs on your own, looking at the online help and the flags, and messing around with your own data sets. For example, with head, you can do dash dash help, uh, you can do man head, and you can do info head. Um, so here's how that looks, head dash dash help, like so. It gives you various options over here, um, and here's the home page, and so on and so forth. You want to start understanding how to read this you know, head basically takes an option and then, you know, one or more files. So one or more options is this format over here, then one or more files, and here's what the options are. So that's the dash dash help. And slightly more detail is if you do man head, you will see, you know, kind of documentation and so on on this as well as contact information. So, you know, in addition to running all the commands associated with this lecture and learning the bash keyboard shortcuts, you should look at the flags and the help for most of the major programs and start to get your you know way around things you won't memorize every single flag at the beginning but you will find it useful okay so that concludes this lecture okay guys uh welcome to lecture 4b of startup engineering uh in our previous lectures we talked about linux itself and then the linux command line uh, today we're going to talk about the linux development environment that's to say how to set up an ide in emacs and how to edit code and and version control it and so on the three tools we're going to introduce are screen which uh, is a tool for managing uh, remote tabs. Uh, basically, you can connect and disconnect from a session um, on an EC2 instance and not worry if your network connection is kind of flaky. Um, Emacs, which is a very powerful tool for editing text. In particular, we will uh, we'll show an Emacs uh, mode for editing JavaScript code that allows you to interface with a node REPL. And so you can write code and then debug it in real time. It's very, very powerful. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll talk about Git. Uh, and show how to version control your code. Uh, we will um, put these things together in a uh, setup.git and .files.git that are a way to do scriptable infrastructure, and so it's your introduction to DevOps that finishes out the lecture. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump in. All right, let's set up the first part of the development environment, which is the screen command. The uh, concept behind screen is uh, something like, uh, you know, Google Chrome or Firefox. Uh, you've got multiple tabs in a browser, and if your browser crashes, you can restore those tabs upon reboot. In a very similar way, the screen command allows you to maintain multiple uh, tabs uh, when you're connected to a remote host. And so even if your connection drops out or, you know, you... Uh, uh, go into a tunnel or something like that, uh, you can resume exactly where you left off. You can also have commands that are running on that uh, remote machine, uh, even when you're uh, disconnected, and then you can come back and, and see them. And, uh, you know, the way we're going to work with this is we're going to use a custom.screenrc file. This is a configuration file, which uh, configures screen to play well with the Emacs text editor, which we'll introduce after this. And as usual, we go to our EC2 instance, and we're going to execute these commands over here. Uh, change the home directory, wget this screen RC, and then write it directly to a file with this kind of permutation over here. Just going to confirm that it's there, and then we're going to actually execute screen over here. And let's actually you know, go through with this uh, process via an interactive session. Um, one thing is, after we finish this, if you want to learn even more, you can click this tutorial and video tutorial. Uh, and uh, if you really want to be more sophisticated, you can also use Tmux. Um, so let's uh, take a look at screen and go through a tutorial on that. So let's go through the process of installing a screen RC and then going through some screen commands. We execute this command to pull down a configuration file from uh, a GitHub repository. Uh, it's a dot files report repository under the startup dash class user. We'll talk about this more in a little bit. We're going to write it out directly to a file of the same name, .screenrc. So let's execute this. So it shows that it's connecting and that the file is present, 200 response OK, and this file was saved. We can do head on this file and confirm that it is indeed present, which is great. OK, now we are going to hit Control L and just uh, you know, refresh the screen as usual. And now we're just going to type screen by itself and hit Enter. And now suddenly we are in a new um, sort of environment. It looks very similar, 
uh, but there's now this whole thing on the bottom over here. So that's the host name. And now we've got multiple tabs. Uh, these are you know kind of screen tabs, and two of them are named Emacs and Bash. We can go back and forth between screen tabs by hitting command sequences. So if you hit, um, first if you hit Control T and a question mark, you will go to this help screen and you can look at all of the key bindings that are available in screen. Uh, press space or return to end, so we'll press space. Uh, and um, when we come back over here, we can hit, uh, or we press return rather. Uh, let's go back and forth between two windows. So if we hit Control T, uh, U, we moved to this tab. Control T, J, we moved to this tab. Uh, and you can actually loop all the way around. So Control T, J, 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 like this. And U, U, Control T, U, like this, right? Um, now we can also create new tabs by hitting Control T, Control C. So let's con uh, you know create a few tabs like this. And in each of these, we can do different things. So for example, um, if we do Control T J to the beginning, we can launch Emacs, um, you know, in, in this buffer, or let's say like Nano, right? So here's Nano. Um, we Control T Control J to the next buffer uh, or next tab over here, and we can do, um, you know, for example, look at the help text of rsync uh, over here. We can look at the manual on Nano, say. And, uh, you know, the, while this loads up. And so what we can do is we can actually move. And so here's an actual command line. Here's that first tab. Here's the second tab. Here's the third tab. So we can move around as follows with Control T and Control J. And if we want to jump directly to a particular, um, you know, uh, screen tab, we can just type Control T and then the numbers. Control T is zero will jump us over here because that's numbered zero and control T two will jump us up there. If we hit control T, control T, it will move us back and forth. Um, so that's quite useful. And again, control T U will move us up like this. Control T J will move us like this. So that's how you kind of move between these tabs. And as you notice, you can do different things in each of these um, windows. Now you might ask, how do we close a tab down? Well, that's relatively simple. Um, just uh, get back to the command line. Uh, in one of the tabs, and then just hit Control D, and that tab went away. That's basically the exit command. If we hit Control T C, we will then bring that command back. Um, so we just reviewed how to, you know, create new tabs, how to move back and forth between tabs, how to jump uh, to a particular tab and back, uh, and also how to delete tabs. Um, so that's basic screen. One of the things about screen, uh, as we talk about some of the advanced commands that you should remember is screen, even though it looks like a normal uh, interface, it's actually a virtual terminal. So what it's doing is it's taking this entire, you know, real estate over here and constantly redrawing it over and over. And we can see uh, how that uh, how that works, because if we type in rsync dash dash help, um, now, if we try to treat this like a normal window and actually try and use the scroll bar that's built into the operating system and scroll up, we'll see that it's all gone. And uh, the reason for that is that here is uh, you know the, the, the real commands um, that we actually typed into an actual terminal window. But after we typed screen, then screen took over and just started rendering kind of a whole grid like this. So the question then arises, how do we actually move up and take a look at what, what happened before. It's a little bit of a pain if we can never do that. And uh, the answer is just a few different keyboard sequences. What we need to do is move up within this virtual terminal rather than uh, the, the physical scroll bar. And how do we do that? If you hit Control T and then left bracket, you just go into copy mode like this. And now you can use Control P like so to move up. Not only can we do that, we can even um, you know, copy paste. So Control P and Control N move up and down, Control F and Control B move backwards and forwards. Um, so you know, if we want to you know, return back down, we just hit um, you know, Control Space and then you know, copy more uh, is aborted. Um, if we, uh, you know, here's an example of um, you know, the sort of thing you can do with screen. You can even copy from this buffer uh, so, for example, let's do a worked example. Let's say we curl, um, you know, Google.com, uh, or rather ping it. 
we see some you know returns over here okay and now just assume we didn't have the mouse and we wanted to get uh, this domain and then do something with it so we can launch screens copy mode with control T left bracket use control P to position the cursor over here hit space just by itself and now a mark is set and then we can use control F to highlight the region and now we do a little bit of magic uh, this is definitely magical um, I apologize for it you hit shift and um, the uh, uh, less than symbol uh, and so there you go um, you know and uh, you've copied 25 characters into the buffer uh, and how would you actually write those characters out um, there's a number of ways to do it you can hit control T and then the right bracket and now you've pasted them out and if you recall our bash shortcuts we can hit now control A to go to the beginning of the line and finally we can you know string a bunch of commands together we can do wget on this and we can actually see the page that Google has for us at that URL which we just saved to an index.html file and we can see it right there so that's how you do copy and paste within screen um, if you want to know exactly where that buffer file was saved to it's actually saved to a file called temp screen exchange and so you can see that that URL was actually saved in over there exactly what we copied the the copy buffer um, now you know these commands are a little bit arcane I understand uh, but uh, eventually they'll be programmed into your fingers and if you ever forget just hit control T and then shift question mark and you can see the commands that we just used here was the copy command with the left bracket um, here was the uh, uh, you know select command um, here was uh, the write buff command, which is what actually you know saved it to a buffer. Here was the paste command, which actually pasted it back into the buffer. And here you can see these things on selecting Windows 0 through 9 and, and so on and so forth, just as we did before. So now let's talk about the most important aspect of screen, which is the ability to detach and resume a session. Um, so to do that, let's uh, move to say you know tab number three which is just at the command line over here what we're gonna do is type screen dash D to detach the screen now we're back to the original command line the spot that we invoked it uh, at originally what we're gonna do is we're actually going to you know exit from the entire session and we can now we're back on our local computer uh, and uh, you know what we're gonna do now is we're going to log back in and we're going to type screen dash R and now we just resumed our session exactly where we left off everything's in the same place here's that nano buffer here is the thing where we did head index HTML here is the man nano uh, tab everything is exactly where we left off and in fact you can actually have multiple you know simultaneous screen sessions on the same um, you know remote server so this is why screen is particularly useful if I just you know close this window by accident or the network got disconnected I can always just SSH back in and just type screen dash R um, to resume the, the session just like that screen dash D to detach screen dash R to reattach so that's pretty cool okay so now let's talk about Emacs uh, Emacs is an environment for writing code it's a text editor and uh, the distinction between a text editor like Emacs or Nano, which we used earlier, is that it allows you to manipulate the raw, you know, unadorned strings that underlie your code without masking it in any, you know, sort of user-friendly uh, imagery. So an image gets uh, the point across. Here on the left side is a word processor, uh, like TextEdit, where you see uh, bolded text, and it's actually bolded when you look at it uh, while you're editing it. Um, whereas on the right hand side all the markup that you're putting into um, the the bolding that's actually visible in its own right as its own characters so that's a distinction really in a nutshell between a, a word processor like word or, or a text edit and a text editor and uh, you know there, there's a number of different you know text editors like textmate sublime text visual studio xcode and eclipse uh, and, and these have several good properties but they don't really support everything that we want uh, in an editor you know one you know that's free it's open source configurable um, it's got a huge development community and so on and so forth really you know especially in the Linux environment which is what most startups are using um, Vim and Emacs are kind of the two champions here and 
you know, th that's not to say that you can't do a, a, a technology startup without them. Um, you know, for example, David Heinemeyer Hansen of Rails fame uses TextMate, uh, and Jeff Atwood built Stack Overflow in the Visual Studio stack. So it's certainly not impossible, but um, it is certainly more common to find Vim and Emacs uh, as the editors of choice uh, at technology startups. And, uh, you know, for this class, we're going to, you know, focus really on Emacs. Uh, in particular, you're going to find that there's a, a feature of so-called REPL integration we'll see later on that makes it very powerful. So that's kind of the background Emacs. We'll talk about, you know, control and meta keys in a second. So when you talk about Emacs, you can't help but uh, talk about control and meta. Uh, and uh, what are control and meta? Uh, these are basically just command keys. Um, you know, if in the lower right corner, I've got key caster set up. So I'll show you, you know, kind of what these means. Control and A means press the control button and A simultaneously, and you'll get a carrot like that. Meta is a key that exists in Linux, but doesn't necessarily always exist in uh, a Mac or a Windows environment. Uh, and, um, you know, you can remap keys to meta. Uh, which we'll show in a second. Uh, but basically here is what meta looks like. It's like a different kind of symbol. Here for your reference again, that's what control looks like. And this is what meta looks like, um, or meta D rather. Uh, if I show control U7, I mean something like this. Uh, and uh, if I show uh, control C, control E, uh, I mean something like that, right? So that's a sequence of, of hitting these keys. And um, in order to uh, use Emacs Bash and screen maximum efficiency, you're going to be hitting control all the time in meta fairly frequently. So you're going to want to make this more accessible. On Windows, uh, there's a link here to a keyboard remapper that you want to consider using. Um, and, you know, Lifehacker has a whole article on this, and you can take a look at this. And you can remap the keys to whatever Windows keyboard you have. There's a wide amount of variation here, so just pick something that's comfortable for you. Um, but the most important thing you want to do when you're doing this remapping is map caps lock back to control because you're hitting this all the time and it's a really crucial bit of real estate over here for your left pinky to have uh, access to the control key. On a Mac, things are fairly straightforward because everything's in the same place on, on most Macs. Um, what you want to do is go to uh, keyboard preferences uh, or first terminal preferences, then keyboard preferences. Within terminal preferences, uh, you want to uh, select use option as meta key as shown over here. Um, within keyboard preferences, which is a different screen, you want to swap caps lock and control for sure, because most people almost never use caps lock. And if you really want to you know, use Emacs a lot, I'd even recommend swapping these two. Um, in theory, there should be a way that you can only swap these two within Emacs uh, and not you know, globally. Uh, in practice, I haven't been able to get that to work. There's some weirdnesses with the version of Emacs that works on a Mac. Um, in general, you get used to this pretty fast uh, you know, for general navigation, um, but the reason that you want to do this switch is uh, if the uh, option key is um, next to the space bar, uh, you will work a lot faster in Emacs, whereas uh, if you have to kind of you know, navigate over to it, it's a little more difficult. Um, and you can recognize that if you just take a look at what a keyboard looks like. So let's look at an example of that. Okay, so you know that's really the summary about uh, keyboard shortcuts um, and you know control and meta keys. This is really the thing to keep in mind when we say control A or meta D or control U7 or control C, control E. Um, it corresponds to these sorts of keyboard sequences. So given this and given that we've got control and meta set up, now let's actually install Emacs. Now that we've installed the keyboard shortcuts, let's install the latest version of Emacs using these instructions for Ubuntu. What this basically signifies is that we're going to change the home directory, install uh, the uh, git uh, command line tool, use git to clone a repository that we've set up specifically for the class, um, you know, for configuring uh, EC2 uh, instances, uh, and then we're going to run a setup script from that repository. 
Then we're gonna exit and then uh, that'll log us out. Then we're gonna log right back in and our prompt is gonna look different and our Emacs will also be configured. So let's execute these five commands. At this point, we now have a functional Emacs 24.3.1. Our last step is merely to exit and then log back in. At this point, the prompt has changed if you want to know what exactly happened, we'll talk about this in a little more detail uh, in subsequent sections, but we added some configuration files. And now at this point, what we can do is launch Emacs with uh, some customizations, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. So we just installed Emacs. What we're gonna do is launch it as follows. Uh, the NW says without any of the graphical type stuff, so no X11, so NW is no Windows, and also without any customizations, uh, at least for now. So let's do that. We're now gonna type meta X, okay, MX, right? And it's also available down here. That's called the mini buffer, MX help, dash with dash. Now we can just hit tab to expand this. It'll go to tutorial and now hit enter. And this is a tutorial on Emacs. Uh, you can read it and then also interact with it. It is something where you can actually go and delete and add characters and whatnot. And, uh, you know, as you scroll down, you can see, you know, you can use the arrow keys just like you can in a normal text editor. Um, you scroll down, you see it says type control V to move to the next screen. So you're meant to follow along. So, you know, if we type control V, bang, we move to the next screen. Um, and here it says, you know, move forward one screen full. We just did that. Move backward one screen full, meta V. So we type meta V. Then we can try control V to go down and type control L, you know, as it says over here, clear the screen. The reason it's showing all those character or control ends over there are that I'm holding control N to move down a line, control P to go up, F to move forward a so space, and B to move back. And in fact, that's the very next thing that they teach you. Forward, back, previous line, next line. So you basically just want to go through this whole thing. We're at around you know 5% of the 6% of the tutorial already. It'll take you about 15 minutes, and that will teach you the built-in uh, keyboard shortcuts within Emacs. So we just went through the tutorial. It's also worth noting the reference card link over here. That's very handy as you're learning the commands. Um, you should basically click on this and print it out, keep it near your desktop, uh, and consult it, and try a few new commands each day. So with that, now we get to the real payoff of doing all the setup. The real win of Emacs is from the ability to run interactive REPL next to your code on any machine. And we're going to try this out with the Fibonacci code of last week. We're going to W get it and then run Emacs NW. This time we're going to omit the dash Q because we do want the local customizations. So let's see how that looks on the Ubuntu machine. So let's download Fibonacci.js like so. Okay, now it's on that remote machine. We're going to use emacs nw fibonacci.js and notice how I used tab to autocomplete just after typing fi. So, um, you know, so you basically go and you type fi tab, okay, and it'll autocomplete. And uh, let's go in here. And now we've got, uh, you know, a buffer that's a kind of a, a term within Emacs, a buffer that's open uh, with fibonacci.js. 
It's running JavaScript mode. It auto detects the extension of the file. Notice that the syntax is highlighted. For example, comments are highlighted as you know this red color, and uh, variables uh, and function declarations and so on are highlighted. And uh, you know here are strings. And what we're going to do is uh, follow along very closely with the commands that are going to appear over here. First, I'm going to hit Control X3. Okay, and what that did is it split the buffer into two pieces. Now, here's the real cool part. If we now hit Control C exclamation mark, okay, we have just launched a node REPL within Emacs. Okay, this is a second buffer. It's an inferior mode. Okay, it's doing something different. It's got the name of star JS, whereas this had the name of Fibonacci.js. Now we can type in dot help and so on, you know, just as we did at the node REPL at the command line. We can do one plus one and we can see, confirm that it's two, um, you know, breakthrough in, in science. And uh, now what's really cool though is we can go back to this buffer, you know, with meta I, you know, we can move back and forth. Uh, meta O will also do the same thing, move back and forth between buffers. And let's go to the end of this buffer, okay? Uh, these are again all the commands from the MX help with tutorial if you did that section. We went to the end of this. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a single line of code over here, okay? We're gonna type control C, control J, and see how it just got pushed over to the REPL. Now if we type in K over here and just hit enter, voila, we've got the value of that variable now in the node REPL. Okay, that's awesome. We just, you know, we can do that for uh, subsequent lines. Here's another one. Uh, and we did control C, control J again. But often you don't just wanna do a, a single line and just put a single line into this at a time. You'll often wanna do an entire region. So let's do that. Let's move up to the top of the buffer again. Hit control space to mark this entire region just like you know we did in the, the Emacs tutorial with help with tutorial. And now do control C, control R, okay? And now we put that entire thing into uh, the node REPL. What we basically did was turn it into a one-liner uh, and strip comments, okay? And now uh, we can do Fibonacci, okay, of 10 because the Fibonacci variable, which is also a function, is now defined in this space. Uh, that is to say, the REPL environment. Where it gets really awesome is we can, you know, for example, highlight the entire buffer, like so, and then just do Control C, Control R. We just ran the entire thing, and here's the first 20 Fibonacci numbers. If we want to change it, we can go back here, change the value of K. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, your cursor gets lost. Like so, here's the value of K. And if I go back again, Control C, Control J, now I'm printing out the first 25 Fibonacci numbers. So in this manner, one can interactively debug JavaScript code within Emacs. Uh, and this is a very useful way to take snippets of code over here that you know work, individual functions and so on, you know, confirm that they're doing what you expect them to be doing. You know, for example, here is now Fibonacci 2, it's defined in this environment, it uses the uh, the, the closed form expression, and we can see that that gives the same results as Fibonacci, and we can you know actually assert them equal to each other, and you know this is very useful. So this is how um, you interactively debug server side JavaScript within Emacs using the Node REPL. One of the other things about Emacs is we can add all kinds of uh, different integrations to it. So we'll show uh, one integration with something called JS Hint. Um, one of the issues with JavaScript is that it's really easy to mess up obvious things. Um, in our setup script, we actually already did this. We installed JS Hint. Let's take a look at how that's integrated into Emacs. So if we go back to our you know, setting here, um, suppose we introduce some bugs, let's say, by deleting this uh, semicolon, uh, and we save the script, Control X, Control S to save it. Now we hit Control C, Control U, It'll ask whether we want to save it. We hit yes. And we have just run JS hint on the buffer. Uh, and if we move over an error over here, line 33, column 11, missing semicolon, and hit control M, the cursor actually jumps there. And we can hit a semicolon, save it, and then rerun control C, control U. And now we don't see an error anymore. Um, we do see some warnings. They're not errors, but they are problematic. There's implied globals on lines 34 and 35, the console variable, 
and Fibonacci 2 is not currently used. So if we uh, take a look over here, we see, yep, Fibonacci 2 is defined over here, it's not used, and here's the implied you know, concept that console is global. Um, in this case, with a node, it actually is, uh, but uh, you need to actually configure GSint a little bit more for it to know things like that. But uh, we'll illustrate one other thing, which is, you know, how do we jump to line 13? Uh, what we can do is move to the other buffer with like meta i, and then hit meta g, g, and now go to line appears over here, and then say, you know, 13, enter, and ta-da, we just jump to the line where this unused variable was present. So that's how to use JS hint. We've only really scratched the surface with Emacs, and we might be able to introduce some more tools over the course of the quarter, but there's a brief survey over here. First is, if you need to troubleshoot Emacs at any time, you can execute Emacs dash dash debug dash init as shown, uh, and then that'll kind of let you step through your Emacs configuration to find the issue. Um, within Emacs, you can use IE Elm or describe mode, uh, and apropos, these three commands will get you respectively a REPL prompt, um, a uh, description of which uh, key bindings are available in the current mode that you're running, and then apropos to find help on any given topic. So it's how to troubleshoot. In terms of going further, I've listed a few things that are interesting here. Magit, which has Git integration, e-tags, auto-completion, and snippets. And that's really just for coding. There's also a bunch of other features, things like you know accessing remote machines from your local machine, um, you know dire ed mode, and you know if you click these two links on eLisp, um, this is Steve Yeggy's quick overview, um, and then here is a much more in-depth book by Robert Chissel, uh, which is really worth reading if you you know ever really want to master eLisp. If you go through those, then you will become an Emacs guru and able to pretty much make the editor do whatever you want within one or two keystrokes. That's worth getting to if you're going to be doing a lot of engineering. All right, let's talk about Git. We've been using Git uh, a few times already to clone remote repositories from GitHub, but uh, the motivation behind Git uh, is obvious if you've ever worked on a program or a Word document that you've emailed back and forth. Uh, and it's got, you know, version 1, version 2, version 3, final, version 4, final, final, final. Um, that sounds, you know, very common. Uh, it's a very uh, frequent problem that people encounter. And the reason is that um, there, there's a fundamental aspect to writing a document, which is that every character you type, every time you hit enter, can be thought of as a new version of the document. Um, now, in general, you don't necessarily share it on a character-by-character -character basis, but you pick particular points to make commits at. Um, for example, you insert a paragraph or a particular function if you're talking about code. And uh, the versions that you choose to save in a version control database are you know, important or useful versions of the code or the document in some sense. Git is a tool for managing multiple versions of code at the same time, uh, and uh, it allows you to do this in a multiplayer environment where lots of people are editing the same file at the same time. Um, this particular link has some great figures. Um, you know, it's from the actual, you know, Git SCM, the official source code management, you know, Git SCM website. And the concept is, you know, this is the evolution of version control. You've got a local computer. Here's your database of versions. You're currently working on version three. Here's a central version control server like Subversion, um, where each of them are, you know, getting checkouts of this. And then here's a distributed version control system like Git. And in this case, each computer not only communicates with the server, but also has its own copy of the version database. So if this goes down or this goes down, computer A can still not only version files, but itself act as a server. And moreover, add version four or version five that does not push, that does not push uh, uh, to the server or allow to be cloned by this computer. Um, instead, those versions 4 and 5 would remain local to computer A and all the other uh, computers that it chose to allow um, access to those uh, new versions. And so this is the concept of a distributed version control system uh, where each computer has its own you know, copy of the database as well as syncing those uh, versions with each other. Um, 
In particular, Git, you can think of it as replacing and superseding previous control version control programs like uh, CVS and SVN and, and the like, and it's much faster than comparable version control systems like uh, Mercury or HG. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to talk about uh, Git by going through a little tutorial. Uh, before we do that, though, we're going to need to know about the SHA-1 hash. So to understand Git, we need to understand what the SHA-1 hash is. The concept here is that uh, any file on the computer, you can think of it as a series of bytes. If you put those bytes from left to right, you can think of every computer file as actually a very large number. There's an interesting function called SHA-1. If you click this link, you can look at the actual definition by the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. And it's following really curious property. Basically, any binary number up to 2 to the 64th bits, which is a really big number, can be rapidly mapped to a 160-bit um, number that we can visualize as 40-character long number in hexadecimal, which is you know base 16 format. The, the numbers add up because you know one hex character is you know two to the fourth uh, or 16 values or four bits, so 40 hex characters is 160 bits. And uh, here's an example of doing this in Node. Um, so you do require crypto. You take the built-in crypto library. And uh, this is the kind of invocation. You're creating a SHA-1 hash function. And you're passing it in this data, hello world, period. And you're saying that data is ASCII formatted. And you're doing a digest, a hex digest, to output it as hexadecimal. And this is what a SHA-1 hash looks like. It's a 40-character long string of hexadecimal digits. The important thing about SHA is that it behaves very differently from most normal functions like cosine or exponential for which you can expect continuity. Uh, and the, to understand this, um, essentially if you've got two numbers that are unequal over here, it's very unlikely that their SHAs are going to also be, uh, or, or rather it's very likely that their SHAs are not equal. So inequality of two numbers means it's very likely that their SHAs are also not equal. Uh, and to understand what this means is it's, um, you know, it's also got another property, which is that uh, deformations or perturbations to the output behave very differently for SHA than they do for normal functions. So here's, you know, normal function. Let's take define x as pi over 8 and dx as pi over 128. Notice we're using the math library that's built into JavaScript. And if we calculate the, you know, just the cosine of x, okay, that gives us this value cosine of x plus dx or x minus dx, and it gives us values that are very close to the initial value of 0.923, okay? Um, but SHA, by contrast, is quite different. Even small perturbations to the hello world string result in completely different SHA-1 values. So here, for example, we're defining a function as SHA-1, so we don't have to type it in over and over again. And notice if we add a space to the end of hello world, uh, we get a completely different um, string out, the, the hex digest is totally different. If we subtract a period, again, totally different. If we put a space at the beginning, again, totally different. And so in this manner, if you've got two strings that are different from each other, their outputs, their SHA-1s, are also very, very likely to be different from each other. And that's really the property of a good hash function. So the main thing to keep in mind, though, is for the purposes of Git, rather than carting around uh, an entire file or looking at this multi-megabyte file to determine if it's equal to another file, all you need is the SHA-1 hash of the file. And if the two SHA-1 hashes are unequal, then whether this is, you know, one bit off or one byte off from each other or a million bytes off, if this was an MP3 file and these were different from each other, you'd know almost certainly that they're different files. And so this manner, you can use the SHA-1 hash as sort of a unique key for a file or really any arrangement of bytes. Uh, and that's a property that Git will use, and this is kind of what SHA-1 is. So we understand what SHA-1 is, and we also understand the reason for Git. Um, the best way to learn, however, is by doing. Let's go through a relatively simple interactive session. We'll create a Git repository, which is conventionally referred to as a repo, by typing the following sequence of commands on your EC2 box. What this will do is it will create a Git repository. Um, you know, it will set up your username. It will also, you know, uh, create a file, you know, add it, uh, update that file, and show the logs and all the differences uh, in your file editing. Uh, in particular, we can actually uh, do git log, and we can actually look at the 
uh, SHA-1 hash of individual files and pull out uh, files, you know, the the you know all the way from within Git. And um, so everything is tracked with the SHA-1 identifier. Every alteration you make to the source code tree is tracked and be you know addressed or manipulated with the SHA-1. Uh, and so let's, without further ado, let's just run through these uh, commands. So you know we've done app get install git core already. Um, so which git will uh, produce uh, you know a usable thing. Um, in this case, we're not going to be using any special command sequences. So let's turn that off for a second. Um, so we're going to you know make dire my repo okay cd into my repo and then um, what we'll do is uh, we will uh, config So, strictly speaking, the first two commands weren't necessary, but uh, they're useful if you if you're doing it for the very first time. Um, tap git init. We've just created a repository. Right now, at the very beginning, there's nothing in the repository. We're going to now add a file, create a file, and then add that file. This uses echo, the command that we looked at last time. Echo-e allows us to include a uh, backslash n in there. And we redirect it with std out to file.txt. Uh, we're going to add that file as follows. Now there's a change to be committed. A new file was added to the repository. Um, it hasn't yet actually been, you know, the git has uh, various stages so um, this is staged for a commit but you might want to add more files before you actually create an official commit but here's what we did we just did it with one file we created our first commit uh, it's got um, the SHA-1 hash uh, a SHA-1 hash that begins with a 224 d one f uh, it's on the so-called master branch. In this commit, one file was changed. We made two insertions, um, which were, uh, you know, additions. And this is the permissions on the file, uh, you know, 100644. You can Google that, but basically it means that um, we can read and write and anybody else can, can read the file. Uh, and uh, we also added a commit message, added first file like this. We type git log. We see there is one commit that was made. Here is the you know file, and here is the uh, commit hash. As before, it starts with a224d1f. We configured the author, and we've got the timestamp, uh, and so that's the uh, commit for for git. Now we're going to make an edit to the file. Git detects that we made an edit, that file.txt was modified, and this change is not yet being staged for a commit. Let's go ahead and look at what the difference was. So the difference is that we added a line over here, but I'm using the bash keyboard shortcuts that we talked about in a previous lecture. If we pass in the color option, that makes it more apparent what's being added, a plus uh, in green is an added line over the previous version of the file. This was the uh, previous hash uh, of the file, the SHA-1 hash, this is the next hash, and the difference between these, the version A and version B of the file, is that version B has line 3 added, like so. So now we just added, you know, uh, a new commit uh, where we added this to the repository. Uh, we said we're going to add a new line to the file, and now we've got two commits. If we do git log p, okay, we will actually see not just 
the commit, but exactly what happened. In this commit, we added line three, and in the first commit, we added the file itself, which had the contents of line one and line two. And you can see that in living color as shown like this. Now, if we want to actually delete a line, uh, here's how that would look. Deleting a line is if you pass the dash dash color option colored in red, then we added one more line in green. So this is how you can look at the series of changes to a file. As you initialize it, you add lines, you subtract lines. This is kind of the evolution of code, and this gives you a sense of how Git works. Frequent operation is when you're doing something like ls tree or you're working with the SHA-1 hash of a commit, you can actually work with that as follows. You often will copy and paste a SHA-1 hash. Watch what happens if we do ls tree. We can see the individual blob, this file, itself has a SHA-1. And we can pull this object out of you know, the internals of Git based on the SHA-1 hash over here. If we instead did it for an older revision, we can pull this out over here as well. So in this manner, Git basically gives us the past versions of every file that was ever in the repository and all of its history. Uh, and all we need to do is you know, tap a few commands to uh, extract that. There's other ways, of course, to pull out um, files from the history, but this is you know, the one that's based on the uh, SHA um, uh, concept. So that's the point. Git tracks everything with a SHA identifier. Every alteration you make to the source tree is tracked and can be uniquely addressed. Uh, and this allows very interesting computations using Git. Um, and so with this session, you sort of, you know, again, created a repository, uh, created a file, added that file, and then you know, committed it, made a commit out of it. Um, you uh, modified the file and then made a commit uh, with the modifications and you looked at the git log. Okay, so good, that's your first you know, git session. So we just demonstrated how to use git in sort of a local mode where you are uh, editing and versioning controlling files on a single computer. But really a lot of the point of Git is to collaborate on your changes. Uh, sometimes it is useful to just keep the versions local, but often you'll want to set up a centralized repository that uh, your collaborators, for example, at the same company or the same academic team all work on together. Um, you can do this in a bare bones way and host your own repository, uh, but it's kind of another thing that you have to maintain. Um, or you can use uh, a bunch of Git hosting services. There's Bitbucket, Google Code, SourceForge, or GitHub. GitHub in particular has become extremely popular. It's basically like a web-based you know, front end to Git, but it's really a lot more than that you know, these days. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the repo we just created, create a web version of it, and push the content to GitHub. So first, go to github.com front slash new and initialize a new repository as shown. Um, under your own username. You can choose either public or private. Public will be free. Uh, I would suggest doing that, you know, just to, to get started with something. Create a repository here. If, if you do want a private repository, you need to sign up with a credit card and so on and so forth. So use the public feature. Um, it's not a big deal. So you'll come to a screen that looks like this. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we're gonna wanna do is push an existing repository from the command line, the one that we just built up in the previous section. And it actually gives you the exact commands to execute. Now the issue is that if you try to execute these commands out of the box, what you're gonna find is there's gonna be an error. So let's actually go to EC2 and try doing that. So we're in the my repo directory. We add the remote uh, as shown, hit enter. It doesn't give you any feedback if it worked. Uh, the way you can see that it actually worked is you do cat.git front slash config, and you can see that that remote was added um, and, uh, to the uh, Dot .git directory in general within a repository a dot .git directory is created that holds all the metadata for that git repository. So we did git remote add origin and, and so on, but if we now try to do the second command uh, which was git push dash u origin master, this will not work. But 
permission denied, public key, the remote hung up unexpectedly. So what does that mean? It means that GitHub does not authorize this particular machine uh, to push to the GitHub account that you set up. We're going to need to do that next. So how do we tell this machine that we can actually, uh, we're authorized to uh, do an SH key gen from it? We basically type in the following commands. We're going to do SH key gen dash T RSA dash C and put in a name. We'll do that as follows. Obviously enter in your own email. So I'm going to delete this public key and, and so on afterwards. Uh, but the public key was saved in homeubuntu.sh id rsa pub. What we're going to want to do is copy this uh, public key, this entire thing. Uh, and uh, you know, just to copy that, you should do a normal copy paste. We're going to go to github.com URL, uh, which is github.com front slash settings front slash SSH. You're going to click on your you know, organization's or in your individual's uh, name. Uh, this will also work for your organization. Click SH keys on the left. Add SH key over there. Type in the name Ubuntu EC21 is fine. And then paste in the thing that you just pasted in um, and you know, the, the entire thing at once and then hit add key. Now you have basically told the github.com uh, you know, website that this machine, which has, uh, or rather this particular public key, anything that is signed with that public key and uh, sent over is um, something which is valid that basically GitHub is connecting the two. When you do this, you're gonna get a password prompt from GitHub. So just type in your password and you know confirm. And now if you set it up properly, when you go back to the command line and type in sh-t, get at github.com, uh, you should see a message that's like this. You've successfully authenticated, but GitHub does not provide shell access. And we know we got in because the username is shown. Now we can go and retry that same repo command that we tried before, git push-u origin master, and it worked. We have now set up GitHub so that it knows to accept pushes from the machine that has this particular uh, public and private key pair in the .ssh directory. Uh, we can now go, in fact, to this uh, repository, uh, startup class my repo, and see that it's there. Let's do that now. So here's startup class my repo. Um, here is file.txt, which we had edited. We can look and we can see file.txt. We can click the history of file.txt and see the history. Uh, we can always come back up to the top like so. And uh, we have managed to synchronize our Ubuntu machines Git repository with this remote GitHub repository. So that's great. Um, you know, we, we managed to uh, go through the basics of Git, create a repository, added files, made commits, and pushed to a remote repository, in this case, GitHub. Um, I want to call out these, you know, kind of four links over here. These are really worth clicking. Uh, the official book and videos, this reference tutorial, and this reference for advanced students. In particular, these videos will give you, uh, you know, some supplemental um, sort of uh, understanding. Um, basically, you know, a little more depth on Git. And then the official book uh, goes into great detail on, uh, you know, all aspects of Git. It's really a course in its own right. Uh, and it's available for free um, at git-scm.com. Uh, so this is what you want to look at if you want to get to an intermediate or advanced level. However, at this point, we kind of understand the basics of Git and that should be sufficient for at least the middle of the class. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of a scriptable infrastructure. Really, this is one of the core ideas behind uh, the word DevOps, if you've ever heard that before. Um, the idea is that, uh, you know, in order to get Bash and Screen and Emacs and Git all set up, we kept running app get commands. And for Emacs in particular, we downloaded some local configuration files to get these things to work. And uh, the concept here is, um, you want to think about your setup files uh, as code in their own right. 
And uh, th the way to look at that is, uh, you know, we've got two repositories here. Here's one that startup dash class front slash setup, and another one startup dash class front slash dot files. And uh, earlier, what we did was uh, we just sh'd into a machine. We changed the home directory, installed Git, cloned this remote repository, and then ran the setup sh. And that's how we got everything set up earlier in the lecture. What exactly was setup.sh doing? Well, if we go to that URL and we click setup.sh, we can see that it installed something called the Node Version Manager, which uh, manages multiple versions of Node. Uh, that itself was a tool that we used to install version 10.12 of Node and then set it up to use uh, that version. We installed JS Hint, which was the style checker. Uh, we installed something called RL Wrap for uh, basically making Node a little more user friendly at the command line. We'll, we'll talk about how to do this in a second. Uh, here were the commands to install uh, Emacs. We added a remote repository and added that. And then we um, also uh, moved our old dot files and emacs.d directories if they existed. You know, we, we send them to backup directories. We cloned the dot files repo itself, which is a separate repo. And then we symbolically linked all of these dot files, and they're again called dot files because they start with a dot, into the home directory. So now let's look at you know what exactly is dot files dot get what were these files so where are the dot files or um, well setup dot get we use that to set up the EC2 instance itself uh, we also need to configure uh, your individual environment and so within that sh script as we saw were the commands to pull down dot files dot get and let's actually take a look at what the contents of that are over here so if we look at dot files it's got a bunch of individual files. Um, screen RC, bash RC, custom, bash RC, and bash profile. We uh, won't go through all of them. If you click them, you can take a look. But for example, if you look at bash RC, um, this has uh, commands that define um, a bash eternal history, which is a very useful snippet. Um, they, uh, it has aliases and things of this nature, which uh, make it uh, easier to just run common commands. In particular, Node itself is alias to include um, RL wrap, which uh, Im implements a, a read line mode for it. Uh, you can see this URL on Node to, to get more information on that. If you want to add like user custom code, you go to bash rc custom. And so um, this is uh, what the dot bash rc file is. Within emacs.d, we've got a number of EL files which configure Emacs. In particular, js-comment and js-config are the ones that are responsible for um, getting the node REPL to work. So this is the idea behind uh, dot files is not only is our um, setup.sh, uh, that is our, our setup kit, uh, something that can uh, configure the machine, dot files will configure the user environment. and um, by running them together via this setup.sh script, which first installs all of this stuff and then pulls in dot files, we can just programmatically configure an arbitrary EC2 machine with just a few commands. One last thing deserves comment. Um, within each uh, home directory now, after you've uh, done the setup, you're going to have a file that's created called bash eternal history. Try typing in head.bash eternal history after a little bit. And this is basically a tab limited text file that has every command you've run, um, as well as information on which directory it was run in, what time it was run, and, and so on and so forth. So this is very useful because often you will forget you know, some critical command you ran or exactly what flags you invoked something on. And then you can just look at this history and you can get more information on it. In addition, the dot files dot get defined a bunch of useful aliases. You can type an alias to list those aliases and define new ones. Um, type man alias and you will like M A N space alias enter and you will get more information on um, you know aliases. So as an exercise for the reader, what you can do is fork and update your dot files dot get further customize your dev environment. If you really want to make things completely automated, uh, you can take the EC2 command line tools uh, and uh, in conjunction with the user data script feature, you can actually have them boot up an instance and launch setup.sh uh, so that you don't have to go to aws.amazon.com and click on things like launch instance. Um, that's actually worth doing as an exercise uh, just you know, uh, on your own time. Um, but even if you decide to still use GUI, uh, you get the idea. Uh, any setup or configuration of a machine is itself code and should be treated like code. 
by keeping the install scripts and config files under version control in a Git repository. And this is one of the core insights and core things you actually need to do a startup because you're going to be moving from single player mode where you were coding by yourself to multiplayer mode. And multiplayer mode requires a reproducible development environment uh, as a very first thing. So nothing should ever be installed on any development machine um, unless you're just testing it out. If you mean it to uh, be there permanently, you should always put the installation process itself under version control in a Git repository. Okay. So that concludes this lecture. We learned how to use Emacs screen and Git, and also how to orchestrate a reproducible dev machine setup. Welcome everyone to lecture five of Startup Engineering. Uh, I'm Balaji Srinivasan, and I'm your host uh, for this evening. Uh, we're gonna talk today about uh, market research, wireframing and design, begin with some high level commentary on sort of the philosophy of uh, startups. You know, the, is it the idea, is it the execution? Is it the market size? And elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to talk about certain requirements for what a startup is versus, say, a small business. And finally, conclude with some concrete tools for actually doing market research and determining how large your target market is um, and how much money you can potentially make from a particular opportunity versus another opportunity. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. So let's jump in and start talking about idea versus execution versus market. So this is a great comment uh, from Quora. We've slightly modified it here. Uh, you know, an idea is not a mock-up. A mock-up is not a prototype. A prototype is not a program. A program is not a product. A product is not a business, and a business is not profits. The uh, Quora comment modifies this further uh, to say that uh, you know profits are not an exit, and an exit is not happiness. Um, be that as it may. We won't touch on uh, whether uh, that's actually happiness or not. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that when you kind of conceptualize this as a sort of state machine for one's ideas, you can actually see why it is that coming up with an idea is not the same as actually building a profitable business. It might take you a minute to come up with you know, some billion dollar idea on a napkin, uh, and then maybe a day to do a mock-up, a weekend to do a prototype. But as you start thinking about it, you know, to actually get to a profitable business is so much more effort than just simply coming up with something and writing it on a napkin that they, they really aren't intercomparable. Uh, and this is really the, uh, you know, the distinction between an idea versus a profitable business that is worth keeping in mind. Um, any entrepreneur worth their salt has you know, dozens if not hundreds of these napkin drawings. You should have hundreds of these billion dollar ideas, quote unquote. And what you'll find is as you start pushing them through these various stages, as you start, especially when you get them to a prototype, uh, and then later, you know, this step from a business to profits, there's lots of things that sound good in practice, but that run into issues somewhere down the line. So the things that actually make it to profitable businesses are actually, you know, pretty rare uh, sorts of animals. So when you talk about the idea versus execution versus the market, the conventional wisdom is that the idea is everything. And that's why, you know, there's this push for IP and for patent lawsuits. Uh, that's why there's actual trolls. And that's why a lot of people think that if, you know, they, they deserve a, a percentage point or more uh, of a company simply for coming up with a concept. Um, and, you know, this view is, uh, you know, generally looked on with disfavor in the Valley in part because of this table uh, over here. And you know the alternative view is something that you will hear over and over and over again if you come to the valley, which is it's not the idea, it's execution. And you know here's Bob Metcalf giving you know this concept you know in in a paragraph form, basically about how it was sales rather than technology that built his business. Um, and the thing about this is this is very useful for anybody who's new to a startup. Um, if you're new to the concept of startups, you really should say this until it becomes tiresome. Um, and it, it's certainly a mantra uh, of sorts for people to sort of self-flagellate and remember that, you know, it's, it's not what you can come up with, it's what you can actually ship. Um, you know, this can be overstated because, you know, if you've got a, a low-cost way to launch objects into space, that is certainly a, 
you know, a good idea, right? That's something where, yes, I want to hear more versus an idea for a social network for pet owners. Maybe that'll work, but it's all going to be about your user base and your traction and so on. The, the napkin plan for this um, doesn't mean anything. What, what means something is exactly how do you get those pet owners into the system? What is your cost of customer acquisition? What's your lifetime customer value? And various other metrics. There'll be a very metrics and execution driven business versus this could be more of a technology driven business. And you know the the basic idea here though is that um, you know when you are uh, you know at the inception stage, um, usually it's okay to be able to talk to other people about what you're doing. That said, be careful because it is true that on certain communities, uh, yes, you know in Hacker News or possibly you know within classes on startups, for example. Um, there will be a lot of people who, you know, are competent technically uh, and are looking for a concept and are looking for something to execute on right then and there. That's unusual. Um, most environments are not like that. Most people have their own jobs. They have their own, you know, occupations already. Um, you know, you, you want to use your judgment on this. Don't, I mean, there's one school of thought that says keep everything secret. There's no school of thought that says tell everything to everyone. I think that, you know, 80, 85 percent, yes, tell to people, but your absolute core jewels that you think somebody else could use, you know, use your judgment there, right? Um, and, you know, that said, you can only really gain so much advantage out of stealth or, uh, you know, secrecy. And the reason is that the moment that you actually launch, uh, you know, once you actually launch and once you actually ship a product, if it's actually getting traction, you're going to have to outrun everybody because there's going to be competitors that will arise. And if your only advantage is that you're smarter and you're more strategically minded, uh, but you're not as fast, those guys who are faster uh, will uh, clone your idea and they will run faster than you. And that's what happened, you know, for example, in search, you know, Google, uh, you know, arguably, you know, was a clone of other search engines. I mean, obviously it had better technology and, and exceeded, uh, you know, Facebook was arguably a clone of Friendster and MySpace it came after, uh, but it, uh, you know, it exceeded them. So those clones, if they execute better, people are only going to remember them. They're not going to remember, you know, that uh, Jonathan Abrams, you know, came up with Friendster or the people who did Alta Vista. I mean, people in the industry remember them, but the general public knows Facebook and Google, not the, you know, the companies that they beat. So that's why, you know, the execution is prized. It's really about who ultimately wins the space. Um, the last take is also really worth thinking about. So we talked about the idea, we talked about the execution. The third is the market. And Mark Andreessen, who's somebody who's worth listening to, you know, a uh, the founding partner of Andreessen Horowitz, invented, you know, the Netscape browser, sold, uh, you know, his, uh, his second company for um, uh, quite a lot of money. So Mark is, uh, you know, his thesis is that the market is the most important. And that uh, a startup that actually manages to do well in a large market, to actually serve that market's need, um, forces beyond the immediate startup, you know, sort of pull it up. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes that means all the personnel are swapped out and it just becomes a, a vehicle where the initial concept uh, was so good and the initial execution was so good that I got traction. And then, you know, maybe the actual engineering team or the sales team or whatever, it's like a, like a body where every organ is replaced like two years in, three years in. Some companies are like that. Cisco is like that. Twitter is arguably like that, where the initial engineering group um, got it to work, but a totally different group of guys uh, was required to actually scale up the service. Um, and those are, you know, kind of businesses where the traction and the market was so responsive uh, that it sort of pulled the, the company up. Um, and let's talk about this as sort of the trifecta, idea, you know, execution market. And now let's talk about how we will resolve that, uh, you know, that troika, which is actually the most important. So which of these three uh, of idea, execution and market is actually the most important? Um, you know, one answer is that for anybody who understands any machine learning, uh, the debate is somewhat moot um, in the sense that, you know, whatever your sec success criteria are, you can assign features to each of these three things and assign coefficients, and those coefficients are probably going to be non-zero on each of them. Um, and that's almost like the non-answer that uh, everything is important and the weightings are, you know, all that's there. Um, in addition to that, though, you know, there's maybe two other ways to think about this or complementary things to think about. Um, the first is uh, something that I think at least uh, a lot about, which I called the idea maze. And the concept here is that there's a distinction between, um, you know, I've got an idea for doing music and movies on the internet, right? There's a distinction between something like this, which is a one sentence sort of thing, versus an extremely detailed plan 
for navigating the maze. Okay, and this corresponds to you know very initial upfront choices, open source versus closed source. Then you go into you know details. Are you a pay service? Or are you free? Are you you know charging per download or subscription? Uh, are you just doing music only or music and movies? And if you're doing movies, are you doing some you know non Hollywood movies? And you know all these businesses are actually reasonably successful. I put treasure chests near those that you know arguably the most successful. YouTube sold for 1.6 bill. iTunes is arguably you know the most successful of all the you know music services and Netflix is you know a public company in its own right now, these other services are fine I don't mean anything negative about them um, but Napster and Kazaa are dead uh, and they definitely took the wrong branch in this idea of maze and things you know the reason this is a very useful way of thinking about things is that it stresses a few things first is it stresses that it's not just like a one sentence concept like this it's a detailed business plan that's aware of all the competition that's you know a plan for navigating the maze the second is that the maze is time varying so pandora became a much better idea once the iphone came out and there's a mobile computer in every pocket you can see tim westergren's comments on this it just became a completely different company afterwards before it was kind of struggling afterwards it you know started to actually book some real revenue um, and, you know, just like there are doors that open, you know, this, this trap door sort of open, there's other doors that close. There's doors that, you know, other companies are capable of bridging that one might you know, not be as a startup. You know, Amazon can get into, uh, you know, certain areas that many startups would not be able to. You probably don't want to build um, AWS or, or do food delivery as a startup. That's not to say there aren't people trying and, you know, more power to them. Maybe that's, you know, easier today than it was some years ago. So maybe that, that door is open. Um, the, uh, you know, the thing here about this though is it, it stresses that it's not one sentence, right? If your idea is one sentence, you don't have a good idea. If your idea is a detailed path like this, uh, and if you've got, you know, the knowledge of some sort of acronym like KYC, know your customer, or LDT, laboratory developed test, or OTARD, which is the, you know, over the air uh, reception devices rule. These three regulations, understanding them in detail is really what enabled those, you know, businesses uh, and were like the key, you know, regulations that people outside the industry would not understand were, were driving them. You know, very briefly, KYC, know your customer, um, was a major roadblock for PayPal in the early days because it meant that they had to actually collect all kinds of information on every customer. Um, you know, like a bank did, except those customers could be in many different countries. Um, LDT, Laboratory Developed Test, uh, this was a route that uh, Genomic Health pioneered uh, to, you know, get a uh, test uh, uh, through to market rapidly um, without as much regulatory overhead as other paths. And the OTARD over their, you know, reception device rule, this is something which Aereo is currently litigating in the courts. Um, their concept is that they can put antennas in a server farm. Uh, and uh, in the 80s, it was legalized to record TV over an antenna. Nowadays, that same antenna can be in a, you know, tiny little solid state device. And so you can rent your antenna in a server farm and therefore, um, you know, just stream TV. You're basically, uh, you know, within the letter of the law, but it's a brilliant hack. Um, that's a good idea. And that's an idea that shows some familiarity with a statute of some kind that other people don't know about. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about your business concept, think about the idea maze and think about whether there's some acronym where the exp explanation to someone, uh, you know, really, you know, gets a light bulb uh, event going off, right? That, that's when you know you've, you've got something. You know, related to this is not just, you know, the idea, but the idea maze in the same way, not just the execution, but the, um, the execution mindset, right? And what is the execution mindset? It's very simple to explain. It's very hard to do. Um, the execution mindset basically means writing your to-do list and then doing the next thing that's the highest priority on the to-do list and crossing it off and then repeating that. Uh, and this is something which, uh, you know, sounds easy to do, is very hard to do. It's like, um, you know, get in shape. It's easy to say, it's more challenging to actually do because it means reserves of willpower and so on and so forth. Um, that said, you know, one way to implement this is, uh, you know, something called uh, the, the one thing. This is something which, you know, is, uh, you know, there's many different ways to organize things within your company. Um, but to, to get focused, to have the execution mindset, this concept of using Gmail chat status and having like a issue that you're working on is a very, you know, low effort way to broadcast what it is you're currently doing to everybody else at the company. Uh, and it also means that um, they can just click and figure out what it is you're working on without, you know, them bugging you. This way you only maintain this one thing and then, you know, people kind of know that you're you're doing something. Okay, so that's execution mindset and, and the one thing. 
let's next talk about what kind of business you want to build. So let's say that you want to found a business. Uh, one of the very first uh, questions is what kind of business do you want to found? Um, do you want to do a startup or do you want to do a small business? Uh, while these are things that have some you know, gray area in between them, uh, the distinction between them really is that a startup is going for world domination. It's trying to become a big company, a multinational. Uh, it's set up to absorb millions of dollars in venture capital. Um, it's very ambitious. Uh, whereas a small business is something which is not meant to scale to you know thousands of employees and millions of customers and dozens of countries. It's meant to provide a service to people in the neighborhood. Now you know the difference between these is that uh, with a startup you have to you know deal with the stress of uh, you know playing in a winner take all market um, and you know in going for world domination you have really no protections against anybody else. It is a completely international competition where you have to be the best in the world. Uh, the stress of you know, running a small business, though, is that, you know, you might be trampled by one of these guys who has achieved world domination. Uh, for example, I think that, um, you know, in the next 10 years or so, driverless cars are going to put a lot of, you know, mom and pop businesses uh, out of work. And, uh, you know, so there's no stress-free route, right? Um, you know, a small business is not necessarily the path to nirvana. It means that you probably won't be able to exit the business. You'll probably have to run it for your whole life. That's fine if, if that's your choice, but you want to, you know, think about this. There's, there's always trade-offs. Of course, the third option is to, you know, be an employee. There's nothing wrong with that either. That just basically means that you might have slightly lower risk tolerance. You may not want to go six months, you know, living on ramen without a salary. You might want a 401k. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so think about your options and think about, you know, what you really want to do. Do you really want to do something that is a global winner-take-all business? If so, you're ready for a startup. Uh, but now let's talk about next whether or not you're business idea actually could be a startup. So there are at least two criteria that a business must have to be a viable startup idea. Uh, the first is that this concept must exhibit an economy of scale. And second is that it must go after a large enough market to make that economy of scale actually worthwhile. Um, and the combination of these two things really defines you know, a company that can grow to be really big. So. What do we mean by an economy of scale? We should make this very concrete. While the phrase is thrown around a bit, there's a simple mathematical model that we've got over here where as a business uh, you know, increases the number of units that is sold, the actual cost of production for each unit decreases, but the you know, quality of the unit does not change. It remains constant, uh, and so they can charge the same amount of money. And so this is you know, a very classic, simple economy of scale sort of thing where you have a stair step sort of decline like this. This is typical. Um, you're, you know, it's going to be much more complicated and practice many more declines and whatnot. But the upshot over here is that for the first 100 units, you're losing $200 per unit. For the next 900 or so units, you're making a bare $25 per unit. And then after that, after 1,000 units in, you're making $300 per unit. And you know, back over here, we've got a little model. You know, how could this actually arise from microeconomic considerations? But the interesting thing about this is this tells you a lot. right? So when you've got your economy of scale uh, sort of function like this, you can determine uh, exactly you know, how much capital you need at a very, very minimum. So this business starts out at zero, it loses money and you know until it gets to you know twenty thousand dollars in the red, uh, it then starts making twenty-five dollars a unit. So this is at hundred units sold, it then starts making twenty-five dollars a unit and slowly claws its way back up, and now it's got a break-even point. And then at this point, boom, it hits a curve and now it starts ramping. And this is how you want a startup to look. Now, in practice, it's almost never as clean as in this diagram. Um, you know, there's, there's oscillations and vicissitudes. Most importantly, your theoretical low point is usually much higher than your practical low point, which is down over here. Nevertheless, you want to do this calculation because this will tell you, you know, it gives you a quantitative way to say how much capital you actually need to raise and whether you even need to raise outside capital at all. Um, it'll also tell you kind of, you know, where your escape point is. And one of the things about this is that when you actually look at the mechanics of it, you start to realize how important it is to start pushing things into fixed costs. So go and read the paragraph above over here, but essentially the more you push things into fixed costs, the you know, steeper your declines in cost are and the greater your economy of scale. So let's say that you do have an economy of scale. Okay, You've got a business which uh, looks like it's got a lot of upfront fixed cost, it's got um, an upfront software cost, after which the incremental cost to serve each marginal customer is actually quite low and you can make a lot of profit. Uh, at this point, you need to ask, okay, now do you have a large enough market size to make that economy of scale worthwhile, to make it pay dividends? 
And to you know get some sense of that, you know, a startup must pursue a large market. Here's just you know a few examples at different price points. And you know, to some extent, you can you can argue with each of these. But you know, for example, if you want to get to the magic one billion dollar figure, you can sell something for one dollar to a billion people. That's Coca Cola. For ten dollars to a hundred million people, Johnson and Johnson household products. You know, Blizzard sells for a hundred dollars to ten million people. World of Warcraft, and so on and so forth, until you get up to you know the very largest, like a million dollars for a high end mortgage or like a commercial mortgage. Um, you know, commercial real estate, things of that nature. And you can argue with each of these. You know, for example, is the entirety of the mortgage actually booked by Countrywide, and so on. This is just sort of conceptual in terms of you know price points and the number of units you need to sell at a certain price point. Now, the thing about this that's actually really interesting is you should just as an exercise, you know, kind of not one that we can easily grade, but just go and try and sell something for a hundred dollars to ten people. And uh, or even ten dollars to a hundred people, right? Try and get your first thousand dollars in revenue with hand-to-hand -hand sales. Uh, you're going to find it's actually quite difficult. Um, you're going to have to have some sort of advantage, you know. For example, bringing cold drinks to the beach and then you can sell them at some markup. Uh, and you're you're going to find that competition will very quickly uh, arise to try to whittle that down. Uh, and so it's really useful to actually go and try to sell, if you've never tried to sell before, to get some sense of how incredibly difficult it is to achieve these kinds of volume numbers for, you know, pricey products. And uh, the thing about this is, you know, large markets, you know, when you start thinking about market size, you start thinking about cars, and you have 100 million annual customers for $10,000 cars, very, very ballpark. So you're talking about something that's in the ballpark of a trillion dollars plus annual sales. That's a big market. Uh, and that's the kind of thing where if you make even a small dent in it, you've got a billion dollar annual revenue company, which is certainly a much more than a billion dollar valuation company, um, you know, applying some multiple to revenue. So big markets are what it's all about when you're talking about a startup. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about this that's very important is the lower your price point, if you're trying to go after a very high volume, low price point market, you need to be incredibly automated because... Uh, every can of Coke, um, you know, you can't have a lawsuit, you can't have returns, you can't have customer service. If you're selling it for a dollar and you're making 25, 30 cents, you, you, you know, one phone call by somebody about that can of Coke will easily cost you more than your profit margin on the can. And so the, you know, the thing is that you just need to strip out all inefficiencies uh, when you have low price points. That's why, you know, I'd actually recommend charging more at the beginning, charging a fairly high price point, um, you know, so long as you can actually get some customers at that price point. And you'd be surprised uh, if you're actually building something that people want, they will actually pay a su surprising amount of money for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the thing is that people will always be open to you reducing your prices. So go out with the absolute highest price point you can possibly think anybody could tolerate. Let them reject you, right? Let them say the price is too high. Do the market research. Find out that the price is too high. And only then, later, you can cut prices. Uh, at the beginning, you actually want a small number of customers who really want the product, who are willing to pay a lot for it. Uh, and then from them, you can get enough money to do the V2 and the V3, uh, the version 2, the version 3, and start bringing the price down. Um, but don't make the mistake of charging too little at the beginning because otherwise you'll have the Coca-Cola problem where you won't be able to afford customer service or things of that nature. So we understand the importance of uh, you know, an economy of scale. We understand the importance of going after a large market. Um, a third and very important thing is, you know, if you've got, you know, 50, 100 ideas that are at that one minute stage, you know, you've just written the idea down at the napkin and you recognize that it takes a minute to write something down. It takes years to turn something into a profitable business. When you recognize this, you actually recognize something that's not obvious, which is that you will actually be doing market sizing calculations over and over and over again. Every single time you add a new feature to your product, every time you pivot your business slightly, every time you think about which customer group to go after next, you're doing market sizing calculations. And you start getting really good at this, uh, and that's why it's not obvious. You might think, oh, you know, doesn't this business only go after two or three markets? But they entertained dozens, if not hundreds of them, um, before focusing on the you know, two or three that you actually see. So getting good at market sizing is important. Um, the other thing that is uh, important, especially for anybody who's in like a PhD uh, you know, program or a grad program of some kind, is if you have two concepts that are equivalently scientifically interesting, don't wait six years before doing your first market sizing calculation. A lot of PhD students do this and they think, okay, it's important in academia, therefore it must be important in the real world. That's, that's only very weakly correlated, if at all. 
Um, this diagram sort of explains it. You know, if you work in, say, C. elegans genome sequencing versus human genome sequencing, these are roughly equivalent scientific novelty. You can get science papers or nature papers on both of them, um, but human genome sequencing is a much larger market size. Now, it is true that you can have things like Facebook, which go from a small market to a very large market, but even those, uh, you know, they were ultimately targeted at humans at first. You could imagine under some scenario that these became large. Um, you know, the scenario in which C. elegans becomes large is something usually where it's intermediate, where there's some human stage, some human experiment. You know, if you've thought that through and you think that, yes, it could become a large market, more power to you, go for it, then it doesn't belong down here. But um, in general, if you're going to spend six years on something, it is useful to distinguish between those kinds of things which are academically prestigious versus those kinds of things which uh, are useful to the world and that someone will actually pay money for. They are surprisingly less correlated than one might think, and you only really realize that uh, at the end of one's PhD program. Um, so that would be the advice I'd give if uh, one was uh, a grad student or just starting a graduate program. So uh, regarding market research, uh, we've talked about in the abstract of you know, why it's important to go after large markets uh, and you know, the economy of scale and so on and so forth. Um, now let's get to the concrete and actually say how one would go about empirically sizing up a market. Uh, you know, the, you know, there's a number of tools that we have enumerated here for doing this. Um, you know, one of the things that you want to do right off the bat is whatever industry you're interested in, uh, go to Google Books, read SEC filings. You know, there's a link over here to the Edgar system. You can start looking for companies that you know and read their 10Ks and their S1s and, and so on and so forth. We'll do more of this later, but just, you know, start to experiment with Googling around and looking at that site. And, uh, you know, you want to, you know, do a back envelope estimate of market size. So here's our working example. Let's say that people, you know, would want to move their bank accounts from USD to RMB. So back envelope estimate is how many people would want to do that and how much would they want to convert. Uh, and you can look for, for example, the number of people who are traveling to China, the number of people who are opening businesses in China, uh, the size of, you know, how much people will uh, do as a conversion when they immigrate versus when they just go for tourism, so on and so forth. This would be something where you just get a quick back of the envelope. And then you can solidify that by using the keyword planner and Facebook's advertiser tools. So look at figure seven to eight on this. Basically, you know, you can you should click these URLs and actually go there. If you go to facebook.com front slash advertising, there's a real-time census which you can, you know, put things in over here, you know, the location and the age, gender, interest. So we're looking at everybody who's interested in Kickstarter. So there's like a million people roughly who live in the United States who like Kickstarter on Facebook. That's pretty interesting, right? And Facebook will charge you roughly this amount to, you know, reach those, uh, those people. Google has a somewhat different tool. And uh, with this tool, basically the keyword planner, this will give you statistics not by user, uh, but by search query. And that's, you know, better in some ways, worse in other ways. So it's better in some ways because you're targeting people who actually have intent, uh, but it won't necessarily give you a census of the, you know, potential demand if you were to increase demand, you know, with advertising or something. But these together can give you a really good set of numbers on the number of people who are interested in some area or some topic and so on. And, and each of them checks the other. So that's how you can get some you know, concrete numbers that are a little better than back the envelopes. And then from that point, you can go towards setting up like a landing page. Uh, you can use Launch Rock and photos from iStock Photo, icons from this icon finder service. Um, and you know we're gonna mostly focus on the crowdfunder concept for the purposes of this class. Um, but Launch Rock can be a complement uh, to that approach, uh, basically putting up a landing page and seeing whether people click. Finally, you can use an AdWords or Facebook ads budget to see whether or not people land on your Launch Rock page and where they'll actually buy what it is that you're selling. And so this is really, you know, from the Lean Startup School, the so-called minimal viable product. And what you're really doing is advertising it even before it's built, uh, just to see whether people will actually buy it at that price. And so this is kind of, you know, a flow for how one would actually do market research concretely. So let's say that you have, you know, you've got a startup, uh, startup concept, you have done some market research, you figure it's a big market, uh, you've used the keyword tools and so on and so forth to um, confirm your intuition. Now, when you actually start thinking about your product, you're going to need to assemble some product tiers. Uh, and uh, these are basically, you know, the uh, features uh, and the roadmap for which features you're going to include at what time, um, especially with a crowdfunder or a Kickstarter, this is actually quite important. 
uh, you know, what you should do is, you know, the the heuristic price points in this post over there, the blog dot bound for anything. Click that, take a look, you know, look at these links, Kickstarter product tiers and trends. Um, and that's all great. Uh, we want to supplement that with a little bit of theory. And, you know, I think the combination could be quite helpful. Um, basically, if we look at this graphic over here, uh, you can imagine that the ultimate market research is a survey of every single person on earth, all 7 billion people. And you get some metadata on them, like their job, employer, age, gender, other kinds of variables. And then you ask them how much they would pay maximum for each version of your product, right? So example, you know, over here, this mechanic will pay, you know, zero dollars for version one and two for, you know, ten dollars for version two and ten dollars for version three. Whereas this CEO over here wants your product so much, they'd pay up to a thousand dollars for version one and fifteen hundred for version two and, and you know, two thousand for version three. And in general, what you're going to find is the vast majority of people will never buy your product at all. It's just going to be zero, 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 zero. They have no need for it. They'll, they won't buy it at any price, uh, no matter how low you make it. Um, and you might even go one step further than that. They won't even use it if you make it free, if you have a freemium product. So those people, you know, really don't, don't want it um, or don't want the version with the current features. So then here's the versions. And then each version has, you know, corresponding features. So for example, in this case, we've got feature one and feature two are in version one. And, you know, feature one, two, and three are in version two. And then finally, we've got a table here that shows how much cost and time is required to build each feature. So the, the thing that's interesting about this is we can take all the values in the version one column and we can actually make a histogram of them and conceptually aggregated over all 7 billion people, we can have this sort of conceptual diagram which says how much would people pay for it uh, if you know, the, we could figure out the maximum amount they could pay. And uh, from that, from this histogram over here, we can also compute roughly, you know, how much we would get with so-called perfect segmentation. That is to say, you know, these people, there's 100,000 people, it's a log scale over here, there's 100,000 people who will pay 1,000, and there's 10,000 people who will pay 1,100, and 10,000 people will pay 1,200, and then 1,000 people will pay 1,300, and so on. If we were able to charge the absolute maximum price that each person could pay, that is to say perfect segmentation, um, this is how much revenue we'd make. If we only charge $1,000, then in that case, the amount that you'd get would be 128 million in this case, because you're now charging, even though there's 1,000 people that would pay up to $2,000, you're rounding it off to just 1,000 for version one. And in general, you're gonna want to have to do this for all kinds of reasons, one of which is you're probably not gonna be able to get the reserve price all that granularly. However, conceptually, this is very useful, and you might immediately retort, um, oh, and one last point is, Okay, so maybe maximum you'll make $128 million. Is this greater than the cost of V1's features? So V1, as we recall, had feature one and feature two, and they cost a million dollars and $50,000 and took, you know, 50 to 100 days to build, or 50 days and 100 days, respectively. So it's going to cost you $100, 100 days, and like about a million, you know, uh, uh, and $50,000 to actually build out V1. And hopefully you'll get 2%, 3% of the market, uh, and you'll make that money back. Um, and so that is, this is, you know, the conceptual thing that you should keep running through. Now, of course, there's immediate limitations. You're not going to be able to pull all 7 billion people. True. But what you can do is you can survey a subset of them. Uh, and even doing something very, very rudimentary, like, you know, going and getting a poll of your 20 closest friends and asking them about different versions, you're going to find that you're going to learn things about your product, uh, that people are going to value certain things that you thought were unimportant and conversely not value things that you thought were important uh, that you wouldn't be able to figure out just in an armchair. So this is kind of a conceptual framework for setting product tiers. Once you kind of think of there being a market, then exactly, you know, how do you attack it and what features do you build in which order? Importantly, if you, you know, find that say version two or version three are actually really compelling, you might decide to push some of these features up earlier. Um, so for example, if people would actually buy version two, that there is a steep jump over here, maybe you decide to push feature three into version one instead, right? And maybe delay some other feature and push it back. So it's also a conceptual framework for thinking about feature prioritization. And this is the kind of thing that a product manager will want to do and have be second nature. So the last thing we want to talk about is give a brief overview of wireframing, copywriting, and basic design. Um, the you know concept of wireframing is really uh, you know making uh, mockups uh, on the computer of what your eventual product will look like. You know importantly, you know if you look at the qualification over here, we presume that 
every product in the class is going to have a web component uh, and that the product itself is going to be initially marketed through your crowdfunding website but will ultimately have its own dedicated website and indeed that crowdfunding website will ultimately you know potentially morph into the product website over time um, but uh, the idea here is you know there's many different kinds of wireframing tools I like these four they all have you know relative strengths and weaknesses Lucidchart is easiest to collaborate on OmniGraph has good offline support Jetstrap exports to Bootstrap Pop App is very easy to use uh, in terms of pen and paper so pick one of those that works for you um, in terms of copywriting you know read through these things uh, I do think that um, it's worth uh, you know trying to find maybe one message that is really short that you optimize very heavily uh, and you know repeat that above the fold um, and in general if it's not a home page message it's not a message so you want to really try to um, get a very compact description of what the value of your product is and here's you know a few more details on that you can you know kind of take a look at Amazon's press releases Oracle's marketing uh, and uh, you know the concept of a feature matrix and, and use that to assist with your copywriting um, finally in terms of design uh, this is something that's relatively difficult to teach uh, I can only give some pointers really it's a whole class or set of classes in its own right so you know at the very highest level one of the very first things to know about is the distinction between vector and raster graphics um, that's something that surprisingly a lot of people don't know and they're sort of mystified as to why their PowerPoint presentations pixelate in general if you can get a vector copy of some asset you should uh, in terms of principles for design the non-designers design book is actually probably your single best reference those principles are illustrated here I actually like the alignment example and maybe the repetition example a little better than the others I'm not so sure that it's actually being beautified by the end of the last one but at least with the alignment one it's uh, it's definitely uh, pretty good so you can click these links and take a look at them um, what I'd suggest here is understand these four concepts try to internalize them do your design without thinking too much uh, and then try and reapply them at the end uh, in terms of fonts and icons, uh, a useful trick is to actually do a font-heavy design. That is to say, um, relatively minimal graphics and try and use your font uh, to you know perk up the site. And uh, the reason for that is then you can do something that looks pretty decent uh, and you know without drawing ability necessarily. Um, you can use icons as well, and icons are good because uh, you know, especially if they're part of a fonts library like Font Awesome, um, they're actually vector graphics. And if you limit yourself to just fonts, um, you you actually can get pretty far in terms of illustrating your website. Uh, and then you can get a real designer to help you down the line once you've got some revenue or traction. Um, and this will won't get you to a ten on design; it'll get you to like a seven, um, just something that looks reasonable. Stock photos, video animations. Take a look at the tips over here. Uh, the main thing that you want to do is, uh, you know, I would actually suggest going relatively light on the stock photos, uh, especially of stock photos where people are, you know, looking directly at the camera. Um, that's really what makes a stock photo kind of look, uh, you know, generic or cheap. Um, you can crop stock photos, change the coloring, and so on, and then people won't even know their stock photos, especially if they're looking away from the camera. And finally, you know, like you don't need to spend that much money on design. Usually, once you're passable at a seven or an eight level, um, you'll you'll be fine. And if you use Bootstrap, uh, you'll actually get pretty good, you know, right off the bat. Theme Forest 99 Designs Dribble, you know, for increasing amounts of money, um, you know, Theme Forest you can get some templates. 99 Designs you can hire some freelancers, and then Dribble you can get some full-time designers. For increasing amounts of money, you can take that stock Bootstrap theme uh, and then do something better with it. So that kind of summarizes wireframe, copywriting, and design. Um, again, each of these are things in their own right, but really click on the tools, mess around with them, and that should get you started. Welcome to lecture six of Startup Engineering. Uh, today we're going to talk about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, and also sort of the basics of a web page's structure, uh, the rendering pipeline, uh, and also some developer tools. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, you know, so basically uh, you won't go wrong by thinking of a web page as a program uh, you know just like you take C or C++ code and you compile that into an executable in the same way what a browser does is it takes raw HTML CSS and JavaScript and does something that is analogous to compilation called rendering and to visualize this if you look at uh, for example this link over here um, you see some you know sort of HTML code over here and then the output and if we update this, uh, you know, and just add some, you know, uh, snippets of text, and then we submit that, now we can see that it renders and updates in real time. 
So that's sort of the concept of the uh, rendering pipeline. We're going from you know raw source code over here and rendering it over there. And when you start thinking about this, you realize how complicated the browser is. It is essentially executing an arbitrary piece of code every time you click on a link. And so the security issues are obviously non-trivial. You need to sandbox the code. And it truly can be said that the browser is probably the most sophisticated piece of code on a computer nowadays, other than the operating system itself. And even those distinctions are starting to melt away now that uh, you know Chrome, for example, is the foundation of Chrome OS. So that's kind of the concept of the web page as a program and the browser is sort of the operating system uh, and rendering as similar to compilation. So let's talk about the concept of the rendering uh, pipeline and basically how you go from an HTTP request to an actual rendered page in a little more detail. Um, there's a great uh, blog post by Emil Stenstrom, which we sort of adapted and add a lot of links to. Uh, I'm gonna just summarize it at the high level and you can click on the links to get more details. But at the beginning, you know, you type in your URL. Uh, steps one through seven are, you know, essentially how a network connection is actually established uh, to that remote host uh, given that URL. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you know, once that connection is established, you send a specific HTTP request uh, to the remote web server and then it interprets that request. And then there's an important branch point in step eight. Basically, the web server, uh, you know, if it's serving up static content, that content is not a function of the specific uh, request uh, parameters other than the actual resource location. That is to say, it's only a function of really the URL. It's not a function of the time of day. It's not a function of your current login name and so on and so forth. It's a file that exists on the remote server and no computation is necessary. So static file serving is very easy. It just returns the original file that's there. Uh, and that was kind of the way the web was initially designed to operate. Uh, dynamic, uh, you know, serving is uh, less uh, um, less trivial. Uh, and uh, you know, for a dynamic page, um, your username, your um, your location, the time of day, and and many other parameters can influence what page is returned. For example, you know, 50 different people go to Facebook.com uh, when they're logged in, and they're going to see 50 different things. That's a great example of a dynamic page versus 50 people who go to an academic site and download a PDF are all going to get the same response back. That's a great example of a static site. So that's a distinction between static versus dynamic. As you can imagine, uh, dynamic content is going to be much more complicated on the back end, and you can kind of click through these links to at least get a high level overview. We'll do all of this you know, over the course of the class, but this gives you an overview at the beginning. Once a browser receives the response, whether it's uh, static content or dynamic content, um, let's assume that right now it's not sending back a PDF, but it's sending back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Then the browser will parse that HTML. They will build something called a document object model, which is like a hierarchical representation of the page. Um, and uh, then what they will do is, uh, what browsers will do is they will, um, you know, do more requests if you've got external CSS and JavaScript content. The CSS and JavaScript will be parsed and executed. Uh, and then you've got a page on screen where you've got a DOM and you've got your CSS styles applied and the nodes have been moved around or styled again by JavaScript. Uh, and then every time you click a, a link, this entire process repeats again because an HTTP request is formulated and sent and so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of a web page, um, specifically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You won't go wrong by thinking of HTML as sort of the skeleton of the page, CSS as the clothing and skin, and JavaScript as the you know language and script to make that skeleton dance. And uh, you know there's there's a lot of good references on the web about these topics. Um, in addition to the links over here, it's worth also going to the Mozilla Developer Network site or the MDN site. That's got uh, fairly polished content in addition to the webplatform.org uh, content. And you know, let's start with HTML here. So basically, you can think of HTML as a, as a finite set of you know elements uh, that specify the structure of a page, and each of these elements is attributes. So um, you know, these links work. Um, I'll show another link over here. Um, basically, if you, this is the MDN website. It's developer.mozilla.org. You can also just Google MDN and then your tag, and you'll find stuff. And they've you know significantly improved this and and uh, you know maintained this. Uh, you know, since uh, you know a while back when there weren't other you know good sites uh, on the web for for this kind of content. In particular, they've got a good HTML element reference over here, and you can see all of the you know kinds of things: a from an anchor tag, abbreviation, address, and so on and so forth. 
And the ones that have a five next to them are relatively new elements that were introduced in the HTML5 revision of HTML. Um, when you click on each of these, let's say image, uh, you will see uh, you know, various attributes that uh, this element can be invoked with. So the most important being source, uh, and then there's others as well. And you know, this is the syntax. Here's the element name, here is the attribute and the value of that attribute, and here's another attribute, another value, and then here's the closing of that element. And uh, so you know, really, if you think about HTML as a library of these 112 odd elements, uh, along with associated sort of keyword arguments, like, aka attributes uh, for each of these, uh, you won't be far off. And really understanding HTML just means making web pages that include these uh, elements. Uh, and uh, that's a you know a good way to think about HTML. It's just the skeletal uh, components, the shin bones and knee bones and so on that you can use to put together a page. So continuing our introduction to basic front-end web technologies, uh, after HTML, the next step is CSS. So um, you know, while HTML is the skeleton, CSS is the basic look and appearance. Uh, this is you know, a little example of how one can actually uh, just take a normal web page and apply some styles to it. Uh, we also discuss resets and CSS frameworks and so on. Um, in addition to this, if you go to the Mozilla uh, Developer Network page, um, this you know, main page on CSS, and you don't have to remember this whole URL, you can just Google MDN CSS, uh, has a lot of great stuff. In particular, the tutorial and the CSS reference are quite good. Um, here's the tutorial. We go through this in one of the homeworks, uh, but basically um, this is something where you, know, you can kind of go through from the very beginning and you'll get reasonably expert by the end of it. Uh, as a reference, just like the list of all HTML uh, tags and all of their attributes, you can see every single CSS property and then things called pseudo classes and pseudo elements and so on and so forth. Um, so if you ever forget what the margin is, for example, you can click this and you can see you know, exactly how to specify it and, and so on and so forth, as well as the kinds of values it accepts and examples, right? So this is really quite useful. Um, you should know about this page and that kind of complements this sort of empirical uh, styling over here. So just concluding our you know, sort of summary of HTML, CSS, JS, um, we'll go into a lot more depth, but what is JS? If HTML is a skeleton and CSS is the appearance, JavaScript is the behavior. And uh, the idea is that once you've got a pretty HTML page and it's all styled with CSS, you can make it dance. Um, in the early days of the web, JavaScript was just for alert boxes, but nowadays it's used for things like client-side validation, i.e. confirming that an email is valid, creating input widgets, pulling content from remote servers to create news feeds, playing games, or embedding API functionality. Essentially, you know, if you can imagine it on the front end, JavaScript can handle it. Uh, in addition to you know the server side stuff that we've been doing, um, you know just to reference MDN one more time, the MDN JavaScript page is another great page for jumping off, uh, you know going through all these links and yes you'll become pretty expert. In particular, one thing I want to call out is this reintroduction to JavaScript. This is a great you know sort of tutorial slash summary that goes through you know basic JavaScript types and you know functions and control structures things of this nature. And if you know JS go through this anyway, it'll you know kind of refresh your memory. If you don't know JS, this is, but you do know how to program other languages, this is probably like one of the single best pages. Um, so that's kind of the concept of JS, uh, very, very basic, uh, you know, we'll do a lot more, but it's the dynamics of a page. So we're gonna briefly introduce the uh, Chrome developer tools, we'll do a lot more with these, uh, but they might be the single most useful way to understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, if you click this link over here, uh, you will, you know, kind of go to a uh, website that has um, movies and stuff on the Chrome DevTools. You should go and look at that. Uh, what we're going to do is open up a sample web page and kind of go through these concepts, editing styles and nodes, clicking an element on a page, watching a network connection, and executing some JavaScript all through the page. So let's go and do that. So here we have just a sample web page. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to View developer and click JavaScript console like this, okay? You can also, in the future, just hit the command shortcut and that will also work. And when we do this, we now have a uh, developer toolbar. And you know, if you click elements uh, like so, and then click this down there, 
you now have a JavaScript console over here, something that's showing the CSS styles over there, and something that's showing the HTML over here. Okay, and let's uh, you know show a, a few different kinds of things that one can do. Um, so, for example, what we can do is we can edit styles. Uh, if we uh, click, um, let's say, the padding over here uh, on the body, and we click this, you know, we just turned off that style, and we can turn it back on, right? Uh, we can change this uh, line height, uh, and we can bring it back. We can also click into this, and maybe we want to increase that to 80 pics, and you can see it happen in real time, 60 pics, and so on. So you can change CSS styles in real time. Another thing you can do is you can click through this and you can uh, you know, use the arrow keys to you know, scroll on this. Um, and what you can do is you know, notice how the elements light up uh, and here is that button so you can see which element on the page does what. Uh, and in particular, this is one where we're starting with the so-called you know, the, the DOM tree over here uh, or the source code over here and we're looking at the, uh, the page but you can also do it in reverse um, if you click the magnifying glass and uh, then say select this it will take you back to the element okay so it's very useful we can select an element in the page and find it in the code or we can select an element in the code and find it in the page vice versa so another, another thing that we can do is, um, given that there is some JavaScript already in the page, in particular something called jQuery, we actually loaded it, uh, and the way you can see that is if you go to the head, uh, you will uh, actually see that we uh, requested jQuery right there, right? Now, you'll understand what jQuery does later, but the primary thing from our purposes is we can use it and we can show that you can affect elements in the page within the developer uh, console. So if we do this, we toggle it on. When we do this, we toggle it off. What we do is we select the H1, toggle it on and off. And the main point here is not so much to fully understand what went on there, but to understand that we have a JavaScript console over here, which basically gives us all the code and all the variables that are live in the page and allows us to do you know, real-time manipulations thereof. And that's quite useful. Um, as a final feature, just to give a sense of this, there's the network tab over here. It says no requests captured. If we reload the page, we see all of these requests that are occurring you know, to different sites. To you know, These are basically pulling the CSS files. This is the main domain page. Here you know, we're doing requests to the placeholder site and, and so on and so forth. And so this is quite useful for sort of debugging a page and taking a look at you know, what content is actually being pulled in. And uh, this starts to scratch the surface of what you can do with the Chrome developer tools, but that should be a, a very powerful resource for you going forward in the class. Welcome to lecture seven of Startup Engineering. Today we're gonna to talk about the deployment process, and in particular the dev staging and production flow, uh, which is useful in any application that you're deploying outside of a toy context. Uh, so let's begin. Um, Basically, the motivation behind the so-called dev staging production flow is that it moves beyond the simplest way of editing a website. The simplest way of editing a website is simply to SSH directly into the server, load up Emacs or Vim, edit the HTML, CSS, and, and JS, and then just save the file and reload the page. And you know, this is something, you know, this is the way that grad students or people who uh, you know, or just getting started, practice web development, it's how you do it on your local machine maybe. Um, it does have the advantage of extreme simplicity. But uh, one of the issues with it is that, uh, or there's many issues with it, um, among other things, it's fragile, uh, you can lose the code, uh, you can't easily roll back features, you can't test features before end users see them, you definitely can't easily incorporate contributions from multiple engineers, and so on and so forth. And this, uh, these failings uh, introduce the concepts of sort of the dev staging and production flow, uh, which has become much, much easier with the introduction of the git uh, command line utility. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about in, in this lecture is basically the uh, dev staging and production flow. And then also towards the very end, we'll talk about, you know, setting up custom domains and, and things of that nature. So let's get started. So this is a good diagram that sort of schematically illustrates what the dev staging production flow is about. Um, the concept is that you as the engineer will SSH into, in our case, a T1 micro instance on Amazon. 
Uh, and what you'll do is you will edit this code uh, periodically. You will git push and then git pull uh, the code. And at the very beginning, you'll git pull setup.git and .files.git and set up the, the server itself. Um, and as you edit, you will preview and browse via HTTP at an Amazon AWS.com URL. And this is sort of your development environment. Once you are ready to deploy, uh, the first thing you'll do is you'll push the staging environment um, on Heroku, and then you'll preview that, or your tester will preview that uh, over here, and this is the kind of URL that you'll browse. Almost certainly you'll find something wrong, and then you're gonna go to GitHub, you're gonna file some bugs, and you're gonna edit some more and preview it. When you're finally ready, what you're gonna do is you're gonna push it uh, to production, and this is also on Heroku, but it's a different URL, and now this is where uh, users are browsing. And this dashed line over here indicates that on this side, it's internal customers or internal viewers. And on this side, it's actually out in production, it's out in the wild. And just seeing how that looks uh, in an actual set of screenshots, um, as you browse or as you SSH in over here, you're gonna see a command line like this. When you browse a URL via HTTP, you're gonna see uh, you know, just a standard web browser, but importantly, it's EC2 something something Amazon AWS.com uh, and in our case, you know, port 8080. Uh, and this is sort of you know, the two screens that you'll be looking at in your development environment. When you push to staging, it looks very much the same, except now you've got a you know, staging URL. And then finally, when you push to production, it's going to be a production URL or you know, production, uh, production Heroku URL or an actual custom domain. So let's briefly talk about how uh, you know, the class might differ from real life. So in real life, you might not use EC2. You might use a local laptop for development. Um, obviously, you might use something else other than Heroku. Uh, but let's just talk about the EC2 versus local laptop distinction. Um, the reason that we use EC2 is it gives us a standardized environment. It gives us shareable development URLs. You can easily have someone else look at what you're working on. It gives a scriptable infrastructure and a portable and general environment. So you can set up the machine with your setup.sh and you can also you know, have an environment that'll work on any Linux box. Um, finally, if you're working with large data sets or data sets that have privacy constraints, like in the US, you've got HIPAA regulations for medical data. Um, often you won't be able to uh, you know, download a local version, either a small version if it's a big data set or an anonymized version if it's a private data set. And if that's the case, you will have to SSH into a remote Linux box. It'll be very similar to working on an EC2 uh, instance. That said, uh, it is possible to you know, set up a local laptop and replace certain components of the stack. If you wanna do this kind of thing, go ahead, no problem. Uh, it's just something which we won't be able to you know, support in the class. Um, we, we can only support one flow just given the size, um, but go ahead and certainly you know, mess around with tools. Uh, and uh, you know, if, if you wanna use your own things, no problem. Just uh, remember we won't be able to support it. So we're gonna do a worked example of the dev staging production flow. Uh, but the very first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is set up uh, an SSH, HTTP, and HTTPS accessible EC2 instance. This is actually very easy to do. You just need to click around on your security groups and so on. Uh, we won't recapitulate everything, but you can go through the screenshots. Essentially, all you have to do is go to AWS, create a security group as shown. Um, you can name it what you like. Let's call it this, you create it. Uh, then down over here, you click the inbound tab. Once you click the inbound tab, you successfully add HTTP and SSH and HTTPS. And then you also add a custom rule, which will open up port 8080. Uh, and uh, then, you know, once you've got your four ports open, you apply the rule change, you launch an instance. Um, and then that instance, we've done this before, you go to the security group, and then you basically put SSH, HTTP, HTTPS, uh, and now you can launch it. And when you launch it, um, you can take that same you know, web.js file from our previous homework, um, basically the bit starter web.js, and you just change this port to 8080, you run node web.js, and now you should be able to go in the browser and you should be able to see colon 8080. Uh, and this is how you set up a dev machine or a dev instance, which you can preview from the browser. In addition to setting up your site for desktop browser previews, we also want to set it up to allow mobile previews. So here is previewing your site at 8080. It's basically your you know, kind of dev preview. We also want to be able to preview it on a mobile browser like this. Uh, and um, the way we do that is 
uh, we use the user agent switcher and the resolution test. So over here, we actually did it on a real life, you know, physical iPhone, but we don't want to do that all the time. We want to also see it just on a, on a local computer. The way we do that is install the user agent switcher and the resolution test tools. Basically, you know, these will be in the Chrome web store and here's what the, you know, resolution test tool is. We have already added it. You will want to add it. And then once you've done that, then you will have these two little icons appear next to your URL bar. You're going to want to switch whenever you want to see what the mobile site looks like. Click iOS and then click iPhone. And similarly, what you can do with the resolution test is over here, you can add these resolutions for the iPhone 4, iPhone, and iPhone 5 by basically going to options. And so in this fashion, what you can do is when you, when you click this, uh, when you click iOS and iPhone um, and you use resolution test in combination with this user agent switcher, you can preview what the mobile site will look like right here in your Chrome you know, browser on your laptop. So that's very helpful. So now that we've set up a uh, server uh, and a dev instance where we can preview a site both in a desktop browser as well as a equivalent of a mobile browser, let's talk about Git branching. So um, the basic motivation behind Git branching is that you want to have multiple versions of your code base coexist at the same time. Maybe you want to do A-B testing. Maybe you want to have multiple engineers working on the site at the same time. Maybe you want to experiment with a feature without making everybody block on the fact the feature isn't done yet. So branching is very easy within Git. It's much, much harder with uh, previous uh, version control models like uh, uh, SVN's model. Uh, and uh, so you're going to want to learn about Git branching. Um, we won't go through all of it here. We're just going to be very functional about it. But if you want to get more depth, go through this reference and you know these four you know things as supplements. Um, the main reference is the actual Git SCM book. SCM stands for Source Code Management, and this kind of goes through the concept of branching and merging with some diagrams. So walk through this. It's not that long. It'll it'll give you some overview, and then you can also kind of go through the Git Ref or the Atlassian, uh, you know, documentation on Git branch, and that'll give you a little more context if if you want. Um, in terms of you know our purposes, we won't have to get really deep on Git branching. The concept though is very simple. Uh, the idea is that we start with you know a master repository, and we create two branches: the staging and the develop branch. We do all our edits and commits and so on in the develop branch. And when we're ready to go to staging, um, we you know check out the staging branch. We merge the develop commits into it, and then we push that to uh, production, uh, or not to production rather to staging. Uh, and we confirm functionality over here. Now, importantly, each of these individual develop uh, commits, we could preview it right there on the local server without doing any Git pushing. Many times you're going to find some bug on staging, and then what you do is you don't edit it in the staging branch. In general, what you want to do is propagate that back. That's why we use a dashed line. You find the bugs in the staging branch, you fix them in the develop branch. So we make a commit over here that's a bug fix, and we repeat. We check out staging, and we git merge develop. And now the thing is fixed. Uh, you probably want to push it to staging one more time to confirm functionality. And now you do one more, git checkout master, git merge staging, and now you push production when it's confirmed. And now the site is actually live. And so the concept here is that edits only flow from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. We've got these three branches, develop staging in production or develop staging in master that coexist. Uh, and we use Git to sort of do change set management so that the things that make it from develop to master have to go through some sort of you know, quality uh, assurance step over here in the middle. Um, some people actually add yet a fourth branch, QA. That's not necessary when you're a small company. Your QA is basically your staging step. But in a larger company, you could add one more branch in the middle over here. Uh, that said, this gives you the concept of why we have Git branches. Uh, we basically use them to sort of isolate changes over here so that you're not just randomly committing an edit uh, to the master site and taking it down by accident. Instead, it goes through a process before you actually get an edit to the uh, master site. Um, and so that's how we're using Git branching for, for the purpose of the dev staging production flow. So now we kind of understand a little bit about what DNS is. We are going to uh, find a domain name with domize.com and then we're going to register it. Uh, you can use any registrar. I'm just going to use dnsimple.com because it'll make other steps easier as well, especially the integration with Heroku. Uh, without further ado, 
uh, what is demise.com? It's basically a you know simple search engine for domains. Um, you can use these sorts of tips over here when choosing a domain. Um, you know, we'll see what the demise site looks like. Here it is. Uh, if I type in say you know startups, uh, I get uh, you know all of these kinds of URLs: com, co, net, org. Now notice that I've got TM and IT and IO. That's because I set those options over here. I added them. If I want to add, let's say, IN, I can do that and I close it. And now suddenly I can see that startu.in is available. So this will really speed up your you know, process of trying to find new domain names. You can also do you know, special things like you know, consonant or a vowel or both like this. And now you hit enter and it'll just check out all these different kinds of variations. So it's a very powerful tool for finding available domains and different kinds of suffixes and prefixes and things of that nature. And then once you've found them, uh, you can then register them. Uh, and the it, while it's kind of expensive, I do suggest using DN Simple when you're just registering one domain because it'll make it very easy to deploy to it. And to register something on DN Simple after you sign up, it's completely you know it's completely simple. Just go to this URL uh, and you know you pick out the domain that you want. Um, you basically click Domains and Add Domain, Register Domain, um, and uh, this will charge you though. So be clear about that. Once you've done this, though, we can go to the next step and we can actually deploy at that custom domain. So let's say that you've registered a single domain with DN Simple. Again, it's a little more expensive. Uh, we just use it for convenience purposes. All the instructions here will work with GoDaddy or something else. They'll be like five bucks, 10 bucks cheaper. Um, but okay, so let's say that you've gone and registered a domain name. Uh, now what do you do? How do you set that up with Heroku? Uh, essentially what you need to do is configure some things both on the DN Simple side and the Heroku side. So first on the DN Simple side, let's say we registered bitstarter.co. We click add some services now. Uh, and then you go down to Heroku and you add over here and we're going to add, um, you know, it's actually got a nice web interface for this. Say, you know, this is our production URL, uh, complete the Heroku setup. And now we have added two things, an alias and a CNAME to the DNS um, uh, records for bitstarter.co. Uh, and this is kind of something where if you want to get into the guts of it and really understand this, go ahead. It's not that complicated, but DN Simple will make it easy. You'll kind of have a web UI for this. The last step that we need to do is on the Heroku end of things, we need to actually add those two um, aliases. We need to add bitstarter, www.bitstarter.co and bitstarter.co as aliases uh, or, or domains that will actually work to redirect to um, these URLs. And then if you've done all of this, basically, basically both the DN Simple and Heroku steps, now if you type in bitstarter.co, it will actually redirect and so will www.bitstarter.co. So this is how you can actually get a custom domain working uh, when you've got an app that was deployed to Heroku with a dev staging production flow. So once you've set up a custom domain, there's two more steps that you can take. Uh, I do recommend taking these steps if you actually you know, intend to do something real uh, with the domain, um, but they'll take us a little bit too far afield for right now. So I just enumerate them for convenience and give you the link so you can pursue them. Um, the, the first of these two optional steps, again, optional, because they're gonna cost you money, uh, is to get an SSL certificate so that you can actually have HTTPS uh, working at your new custom domain. Uh, to this, you can buy that certificate through DN Simple. Just click over here. Um, it'll be around $100 for like a wildcard certificate, uh, which will work on all subdomains. So you won't have to get a new one for maps.example.com and mail.example.com and so on. It'll just work for all of them. So that's worth doing, I think, uh, but only if you're actually going to use it. I mean, obviously you don't want to spend 100 bucks on every, uh, every domain. So that's how you get an SSL certificate and you can support, you know, HTTPS and, and things of that nature properly. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, that you might want to do is set up Google Apps for your domain. And this will let you do um, contact at example.com and so on and so forth. You can set up custom emails and lots of other stuff. And uh, Google Apps costs $50 per user per year. Like an SSL certificate, it, it will cost you some money. It's not that expensive, but again, it does cost money. Um, so you can set that up and also set things up within DN Simple, just like you did with Heroku, you can set up some of the DNS configuration to support Google Apps. It'll take a little while to do the DNS propagation, um, and then, you know, it, it should just work. You should be able to go to uh, 
uh, mail dot, you know, example dot com and so on and so forth, and then see your Gmail at that domain. So if you do both these steps, you should then be able to support HTTPS connections and be able to set up arbitrary email addresses at your new customer domain. These are both quite worthwhile things. So uh, that's optional, but uh, you know, you may want to do that. Hi, I'm Alex Blackstock. And I'm Spike Brem. We're engineers at Airbnb. Airbnb is a marketplace that connects people who have space to spare with people who need a place to stay. We provide unique travel experiences by connecting people around the world face to face. In this guest lecture, we'll tell a little bit about the story behind Airbnb, the challenges we're facing at scale, uh, and how we're using innovation. Before jumping into any of the technical details, I thought I'd give a little bit of context by explaining the foundation of Airbnb. This is my profile. I'm Alex. And this is what the homepage looks like. Uh, from beginning to end, the Airbnb online experience is meant to be a reflection of the product philosophy. So our assets, which are our listings around the world, feature prominently throughout. This is what a listing page looks like. You can see both the host and the listing that they're offering on Airbnb, as well as a lot of other information that you can use to help make a travel decision. So this is sort of a, a general overview of uh, how we'll present things today. Uh, I want to start a little bit with the foundational story, talk a bit about the three founders, uh, jump into the technology stack itself, uh, and then I'll turn it over to my coworker Spike, who will talk about uh, some specific technologies we're applying right now to move the product forward, and sort of what we're thinking about uh, for the future of a lot of our tools and services. Uh, and then at the very end, since it is uh, the Hack Week video, we'll leave you with a few little nuggets of wisdom. So first, the foundational story. The three founders, Joe, Nate, and Brian, uh, are pictured here in their dashing suit attire. The very beginning of Airbnb starts at an apartment on Rouse Street in San Francisco. This is back in 2007. Brian moves in with Joe, and rent increases dramatically. Uh, so dramatically, in fact, that they can't afford it. So. At the same time, there is a design conference happening in San Francisco, and the attendees of this conference have a problem as well, which is that there's absolutely no vacancy in the entire city. So it's interesting, we now have our two of our three founders, Brian and Joe, and they have a problem, which is that they can't pay their rent, and the attendees of this design conference have a problem, which is that they can't find a place to stay. So the two of them decide to solve both problems at once by blowing up an old air mattress Brushing up on their breakfast cooking skills, and a little bit of hacking later, airbedandbreakfast.com is born. Skipping uh, a lot of the various starts and stops, the difficult periods getting the initial site off the ground, uh, suffice to say the idea behind airbedandbreakfast.com grew very rapidly. So I'll skip now to a few images that we've produced in, in the past year or so that shows really how fast this idea took hold. Uh, this picture here is the city of San Francisco divided by block, and the red color of the blocks demonstrates the density of Airbnb listings. So in a span of four years, uh, this idea became extraordinarily popular. And on an international scale, the story is much the same. From 2008 through 2012, the growth has been really unprecedented. Pretty much every graph that the company has produced in recent times kind of has this sort of a shape. Over 10 million nights booked at this point. It's a form of growth that the founders and people that have been working for any amount of time at Airbnb have had a really hard time getting to terms with. Uh, operating at web scale just implies a different form of growth. So this growth is amazing for business. It's, there's nothing bad about it. These are, these are really good things to see. But with this extreme growth comes extreme problems. Things that are very hard to anticipate when you're planning on having a decade-long trajectory and you meet that goal years and years in advance. So with this growth, we have all kinds of problems in all kinds of areas. To highlight a few, in fraud, uh, payments made with stolen credit cards, for instance, are an enormous problem and cost the company money uh, when these fraudulent credit card transactions have to be paid back. Uh, it's, of course, also extremely insecure. 
search is a very interesting problem for uh, a company operating internationally that has properties spread all over the place. You have to incorporate many search vectors such as geolocation and calendar-based searches all in the same signal. As far as payments go, Airbnb transacts in 192 different countries, even in third world countries where access to electronic banking infrastructure is extremely difficult or in some cases unobtainable, but we have to support these people anyway. Trust and safety is definitely the foundation of the company and, and this is a problem that increases with the scale of the company just like anything else. Uh, the sorts of combative measures that we've taken in the past include the development of a reputation system and various forms of identity verification, which, as you could imagine, are very difficult to standardize and to moderate on a global scale. Internationalization is another very key element. With 30 plus languages, it's extremely difficult to keep various aspects of the product feeling like a local experience. So localization, which is the process of bringing features in the site to feel much more natural as though you were opening a page that was made by your neighbor, no matter where you are in the world. This process is really painstaking, requires a lot of research. You also end up with design challenges such as right to left languages and issues with static content such as images that contain words. Uh, all of these things need to scale with the 30 plus languages in the 192 countries. So obviously, the founders need to move to a bigger office. So we got a new space, and we started deploying some technology to solve this problem in a more effective way. So I'll just jump right into the core stack, uh, the technology that powers Airbnb.com in the present day. By and large, Airbnb runs on what you might consider a pretty typical technology stack for a web startup, especially one that's experiencing uh, a large amount of growth. It's a Ruby on Rails shop renowned for the speed of development and the ease of iteration. Hadoop, I do want to highlight a little bit later on. The context in which we're using Hadoop for its MapReduce capabilities uh, are for primarily analytics, and we use technologies like Pig and Hive uh, to inform business decisions. Uh, I'll mention that our use of Redis is very specialized. We actually use Redis not as a general key value data store, uh, but for specialized queuing operations, such as our fraud queue and our photo uploading and processing. Uh, I'll skip for now and return later to the front end technologies, CoffeeScript, Backbone, and the server side component, Node. Uh, I'll let Spike speak a little bit more about that later. We're big fans of Amazon Web Services at Airbnb. Uh, our web servers are running on EC2, uh, the database by RDS. These, these things have a pretty stock standard application, so I'll mention a few specialized use cases that, that we employ here. EMR stands for Elastic MapReduce, and these are the machines that run our MapReduce jobs. Uh, having a managed service uh, that's backed by Amazon's Web Services SLA is really an incredible advantage over deploying a MapReduce cluster and maintaining it on your own. DynamoDB is a newer technology offered by Amazon, and it sort of is a replacement in some sense for a traditional single machine key value store. It guarantees you infinite expandability and great failover. So we've incorporated Dynamo into a few house built tools. Uh, to form a more flexible key value store that has uh, great failover and the ability to be distributed. We also employ a few exotic technologies and there are some special use cases that these things help us to solve and some general use cases uh, that help us manage our ever-growing cluster and herd of machines. Uh, Zookeeper is a innovation that we have been making great use of um, one major decision that we made uh, once our core application grew very large was to break it apart into multiple services that handle specialized parts of the booking and navigation process. Uh, Zookeeper is a service that helps us coordinate these machines and helps them discover each other without the overhead of explicit management. Uh, another point very much worth mentioning is that Chef, our deployment system, is really an ecosystem 
all to itself that helps us move as fast as we do. Deployment, especially for a very complicated and multifaceted web application, can mean the difference between fixing a bug on time or not. It can mean the difference between extended downtime and not. So having a robust, easy to use, fail safe deployment system has been really key for us to be able to move confidently and quickly in our product development. We have several different variations of search at Airbnb, some internal and some external. Uh, our sort of core search engine uh, Lucene is what's actually returning listings when you search uh, on the main site for somewhere to be. Uh, besides that, Sphinx is a really great open source project. It's a full text search engine that we use internally to index a lot of different documents and database records in a very specific way that doesn't require so much of a modular and general purpose search engine. I'd like to turn it over for a little while to Spike, uh, who's going to talk sp more specifically about some projects that we're developing on our own to bring about the next generation of scalability in our web applications. All right, thanks Alex for that introduction. So I'm Spike, this is my Airbnb profile. I'm a front end engineer here at Airbnb. I joined about two years ago. And what I want to talk about today is web apps. So here's airbedandbreakfast.com circa 2008. Um, it looks great, right? Beautiful design. Uh, this, is our, this is our original Rails app. And so if we take a look at airbedandbreakfast.com, uh, so like I said, it was started in 2008. It was a Ruby on Rails app. I believe it was, it started off Rails 2. For, for a long time, it was a Rails 2.3 app. We recently had a very painful upgrade to a 3.0. And um, that's, that's a whole story for itself, but it's no easy task. And but but we're still stuck in this like traditional page-based paradigm because that's what Rails is all about, right? Rails is an MVC framework that's fashioned around the controller and the action. So the whole idea is that you you've got your web app, you you click a link, and then it brings you to a new page. You click a link, it brings you to a new page. And so you know Rails is is really popular and it's really well developed and it's a great open source project. But it, I think it's been around for what maybe seven eight years now and it's it's really good at solving the problems of the web five years ago, but it uh, it's not entirely solving the problems of the web today and tomorrow. And so I want to frame this in terms of the website versus the web app. And so here's a little diagram of what I'm talking about. So in my estimation, a website is like the classic idea of like the 1995 web right so the client is very thin to infinitesimal the client would be like the, the part of the application that runs in the client so the JavaScript and then the server would be very large the, the bulk of it and so your application almost entirely runs on the server side whether it's Rails or Python or Perl or PHP or Java um, your application runs on the server and it serves up static HTML to the client and then maybe there's some jQuery sprinkled on for animations or whatnot, but um, but it's not very interactive. That's that's what I call a website. And then a web app is the idea, or what I'd like a web app to be these days, is that the client is very fat and the server is very thin. And so more and more of, of your application logic is moving to the client and it's becoming, uh, you know, for, for a variety of reasons which I'll get into, but uh, the client is becoming more robust and thick, and then the server can be just even a stateless uh, set of APIs even. And I also see this as the battle between the past and the future, where back in the day, the web was all based around request and response, static HTML, but more and more we're moving towards this like more native feeling application so there's a couple different names for the style of app that I'm envisioning for the future. Um, you'll hear some people call it a rich client app. 
or a fat client app or a single page app. That's kind of my preferred terminology for uh, for like a, a rich JavaScript application. And so what is a single page app? The classic example would be Gmail and maybe and probably the, the, the first big example. I think it's really amazing what Google was able to accomplish all the way back in 2004 on like Internet Explorer 7 and 8. I don't know if 8 was even out yet, but um, I do remember that they were very controversial for not supporting Internet Explorer 6. <laughs> Good for them. Uh, but this is the classic example, right? You, you load the app, you navigate around, you never get a full refresh, a, a full page refresh. It's always redrawing content and then fetching data without a full re-render. And I think a lot of us are still aspiring to build a Gmail style app. They've really killed it. So, like I said, you in a single page app, you navigate around the app without a full page refresh. There's a ton of application logic in the client rather than on the server. There could still be some in the server and APIs and things, but there's tons of logic in the client. And then the application can fetch data on demand. As you navigate around the app, you fetch more data to um, to render new templates and new views. So you may be asking, how do you build a single page app? What you know? What is it? What is it comprised of? And the answer these days is JavaScript, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Um, this is the semi-official semi JavaScript logo. Um, JavaScript is funny because it's it was created really quickly um, by Brendan Eich from Mozilla, and um, it's it's maybe not a very fully featured language or a very pretty language, but it's kind of ironic that today it's become the lingua franca of the web. So more and more JavaScript is the primary language. I mean, it runs on every platform, and even JSON, JavaScript uh, object notation, started off as just a subset of JavaScript, and now it's like the main data format superseding XML. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so why now? I mean, why, why is JavaScript big now? Why can we build these single page apps? So I think the, the number one reason that we're able to do this is because faster JavaScript runtimes. Uh, Google has really led the charge, but really there's been a, a war, a browser war, in the last five years or so. And you know who's won? That's been the consumer. Um, so Google has V8, which is their JavaScript engine, which they've built into Chrome. It's probably the fastest or one of the faster JavaScript engines out there. It uh, not only can it compute really fast, but it can handle a large amount, tens of thousands of line, lines of JavaScript code at a time, which hadn't been possible in the early web. Also, besides the language itself, there's all these new browser features. Things like push state, local storage, session storage, WebGL, um, you name it, WebRTC, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, these are all under the umbrella term HTML5. HTML5 itself isn't really a thing, but um, all of these new features are being created so that we can build web apps that f function and act more like native applications. And then finally, heightened user expectations. So, you know, once, once your user has started to use Gmail for a little bit, or Google Docs, or any of these, and then they come to your site and it's just a website instead of a web app, they're, they're not going to return. And this could mean the difference, especially if you're starting a new app, a new company, this could mean the difference between um, success or failure. Because if you don't have a really snappy, engaging user experience, then someone else will, and then they'll beat you. So here's how we did it or how we do it today. So we've been fairly successful with Backbone, Backbone.js. And of course we've, we've got a, a number of Rails apps that form the backbone of our website. 
Um, and Backbone and Rails play together pretty nicely. So if you haven't had the chance to check out Backbone, I highly suggest it. It's becoming kind of a standard library for the web, similar to how jQuery is now a standard library. And a lot of, a lot of newcomers, some, some people that we interview, they don't know the difference between JavaScript and jQuery because it's, it's uh, such a given these days. And I think Backbone's trending towards that as well. So basically what Backbone is, is it, it's a library that provides structure to your JavaScript. Um, to your UI JavaScript mostly, and it's a it's an MV star library. Um, what is MV star? So it's kind of funny. A couple of us went over to Backbone Conf in Boston uh, last May, and there was this. It's when I first heard this term MV star, because some people call it an MVC framework or MVP, where P is presenter, or MVVM, which is model view view model. There's all these different names for it, um, but basically everyone just settled on called MV Star, and let's get on with this. And the the classes that it provides are Backbone View, Backbone Model, Backbone Collection, and Backbone Router, and these are all basic building blocks that you can use in your application to uh, to give it some some more structure because. You know, one of the realities with JavaScript is there hadn't been a whole lot of great libraries, especially for the client side, um, until recently. And so people had these giant spaghetti code jQuery monstrosities, which were a nightmare to maintain. And there's been a number of different frameworks throughout the years, you know, Dojo and Moo Tools and these things. But Backbone has really caught on because it's it's easy to understand. So, like, the, you can read the you can read the whole page of documentation in like an hour or less. And I think it's it's now like fourteen hundred lines of code, which with tons of comments. So it's uh, it's very easy to grok. And the whole idea with with writing your apps with Backbone or something like it is to think about building an application rather than manipulating HTML. So back in the day, a few years ago, you would you could create these dynamic apps, but you'd really be thinking about okay. Let's put an event handler on this element, and when the user clicks this button, we'll go fetch an AJAX request and stick the HTML that we get back in this other div. And you know that works, but it's not very maintainable, and uh, it's your code is like way too tightly coupled. And so with Backbone and similar libraries, you can build the right abstractions so you can uh, build more maintainable applications. So I'll walk you through a few of the backbone apps that we've built in the past year or so. Uh, this is our biggest one so far. This is called Wishlists. You can go to airbnb.com slash wishlists. Um, but it doesn't look very exciting here because it's a static image, but it's uh, it's a full push state app. I, I forgot to mention what push state is. So push state is the idea that when you, like you can pr programmatically with JavaScript change the URL in the browser without triggering a full refresh. And so what that means is as you navigate around the app, you can rewrite the, the URL without a hash bang or anything in it. And then when the user refreshes, they're on that new URL. And then you know you can also share that URL and things. And so Wishlist was a big one. Uh, it's very dynamic. As you navigate around, it'll load new data, and it's very snappy. Here's another one. This is our search page. We've redone it using Backbone. Before it was this, it was a mess of spaghetti code, and it's it's much easier now. This this is a really good use case for the backbone collection, this list here. And then another big one is our mobile website, and so this is a single page kind of native style app, um, and it's it provides a really good user experience in my opinion. Okay, so now I want to talk about the easy way versus the hard way. So this is a terminology I've come up with um, and it describes different ways to build single page apps. So the easy way, this is the way we've done it. This is the backbone plus Rails approach. Uh, and so what this diagram is trying to say is if we've got the client and the server and so most of the application runs in the client, the bulk of it. So there's routing, view rendering, your model layer, um, 
internationalization, currency formatting, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the server is, for the most part, just kind of stateless and dumb. So it serves static assets. I mean, that could even just be S3 if you wanted it to be. It serves some static assets, maybe just some logging. And then the client would communicate with an API. Now, I'm, I'm treating the API separate from the server for our purposes, but the API is, of course, a server somewhere. So the idea is that the client, the application running the client would communicate with the, with the API for all persistence and things. And so that's the easy way. Now, to reiterate, so the, it's a JavaScript app that runs entirely in the client. It's server technology agnostic because there's no real hard coupling between the client and the server. So, you know, you know it could be Perl, it could be Pascal on the server, it doesn't really matter. But because all of your HTML is rendered in the client side with JavaScript, there's poor SEO and it's not crawlable by search engines. So, you know, the way the web was supposed to work and, I th and for the most part the way that Google still treats, um, still treats SEO is when it asks for an HTML page from a server, it expects a full page of HTML. So it judges all, all of the SEO based on this, the HTML returned from the server. And that doesn't fit well with these more modern uh, client-side apps that render everything in the client. And then finally, there's a performance hit with this approach, an initial performance hit, because before the browser can render a single bit of the UI, it has to download a big JavaScript file, I don't know, maybe several hundred kilobytes, and then it needs to evaluate it, and then sometimes it even needs to make an API call, and then it can start to render. So you're serving up a basic like blank skeleton of an HTML page, and then you download all this JavaScript and start to render. And that can have a, a real non-trivial effect on, uh, on performance. And Twitter actually wrote a blog post about this maybe six months ago. And they used a really interesting metric, which is time to tweet. And so they measured how long it takes from hitting the page to being able to actually interact with it and tweet something out. And you may remember that. Um, a couple of years ago, they they went to this really newfangled approach with the the hash bang in the URL. You remember that, like twitter.com slash, um, you know, hash exclamation point someone's Twitter handle, and that was really cool because it was all rendered in the client. But what they realized was there was such a big uh, performance hit, and so they migrated everything back to the server. To render on the server, and then they found a five-time uh, decrease in the time to tweet, and that's that's dollar bills, y'all. Like that's money in the bank, and you know, it, <laughs> performance is often overlooked, especially in, in a in a quick-moving startup. But that's the difference between being being your competitors and not. Um, so let me describe the hard way. So the hard way is something I call the holy grail because it's something I had dreamt about for uh, years and had never seen until just recently. And I'll get to that, but let me describe the hard way. So <clears throat> the idea is that the bulk of your application can run on the client or on the server. It can be agnostic to if it's on the client or the server. And then you know, there's some things that of course are different on the client or server, but the idea is your model layer, or your view layer, or your templates, or your you know date formatting, and all that stuff can happen on either side, and then they both communicate with the API in the same way. And so your you know routing, rendering, business logic runs on both sides. And what this allows you to do is you can re-render in the client. You can have these really fast um, re-renders re within the application using push state. So you click around, it'll change the URL, but then instead of going all the way to the server, it'll just re-render the client. But then, if you were to hit refresh with that new URL, the server would return you that exact same page of HTML that was rendered in the client. Now that's, that's really interesting, right? I mean, that's the way the web should work. The, the web should work 
when you when you ask for an HTML page, it should give you the full HTML, in my opinion. And then it's the special sauce that allows it to re-render in the client after that. And now this provides good SEO on top of the good user experience. Because when Google or Bing or what have you crawls your site, they'll get the real HTML back. And SEO is also something that's very important for us and for a lot of your your own startups. You can imagine we've got all this really interesting content on the site and it needs to be it needs to have great SEO. And finally, the initial page load is very uh, is very much quicker. And there's it's it's interesting. There's like perceived performance and real performance. And it is faster in real performance terms, but it's even faster than that in perceived performance terms. Now, what do I mean? So, when you request a page of HTML, the the first thing that you receive back is like the raw HTML, right? And then the browser will go through line by line and parse it, and then fetch additional resources. So, what we do is we'll stick the script tag that links to the JavaScript file at the bottom of the page. So the first thing that happens is it downloads your whole HTML page and renders that for the user. So the user sees a page right away. Now the browser may still be waiting for that JavaScript file to load, but the user can see it, they can they get acclimated, they can navigate around, and they can even click on links. Now because we're using real URLs. If they were to click before the JavaScript app got initialized, or in other words, before the JavaScript was downloaded, then because you're using real links, that that request falls through to the server, and then they'll they'll get another page back. So we don't lose anything. But even when the rest of the the app is still initializing, they can see it and interact. And then the JavaScript gets initialized, and it's a single page app, and it re-renders in the client, and it's very snappy. This is the holy grail, which I've been just dying to see for the longest time. And so today, enter render. So render is Airbnb's solution to this. Uh, it's it's something we've used to build a few apps, and it's something that we'll be open sourcing parts of in the in the coming weeks and months. So stay tuned for that. But so here's here's what it looks like. We had Backbone JS plus Rails, right? That's that we had built things in the past. Now we're going to replace Rails with Node, Node.js. You've probably heard of Node.js. You might, you may, may not know what it is, but basically, it's a little wrapper around Google's V8 JavaScript engine, which runs in Chrome, and it allows you to run JavaScript on the server, and it's very fast, and uh, it. Provides bindings for the for other to, to the operating system for things like I/O and networking and stuff. And so the general idea of render is we're going to take Backbone and we're going to pull it back to the server. We already know Backbone. We already have Backbone apps. We understand how to, how to write a Backbone app and those conventions. What if we could take those Backbone models, Backbone views, Backbone collections, and use the same code on the server. So the whole idea is that you can write your application once and then it can run on either side of the wire and maybe you could even optimize it such that certain parts run on one side, certain parts run on the other side or, or, or whatever. It just gives you such flexibility if you're just writing your application in one language in one way. And so then your app can run in the browser or in Node.js agnostic to which environment it's in. This is the idea. So this might look familiar. Uh, I showed this to you just a few minutes ago. This is our, our mobile website, m.airbnb.com. So this was a Backbone Plus Rails app when we first built it. But now it's actually running render in production, and it has been for a couple months now. This is, this is the app that we used to prototype render. And, um, and it's interesting because we had this Backbone app, and we just converted it over. We had to modify it in a few different ways, but for the most part, it's the same app, but it can run on both sides. Check it out today. You'll notice that if you if you hit m.airbnb.com, it renders the whole page first, and then you can you can click around. You should try it out on your phone. It's really fun. And then 
here's the next one, which I'm just in the middle of building and will be releasing soon. This is our new help center. <clears throat> and this is uh, also a render app. So I think you guys should check out the blog post. Here's the link at the bottom here. It, our blog is nerds.airbnb.com. Uh, it has a detailed explanation of render and some code samples and, uh, and some things. Check it out. Coming soon. Now, there are some other projects. You'll probably be asking me, well, what about, um, what about these other JavaScript projects? There's Ember is a popular one. Derby also promises to have rendering on the client and on the server. And Meteor. Meteor <clears throat> is interesting because it's one of the only open source projects I've ever heard of that has raised like $11 million in venture funding from Andreessen Horowitz. Interesting. The, the Meteor guys are a real, real talented bunch. A lot of them came from Asana, actually. So I want to break down some of the differences between uh, Render and these other projects. So Ember, so far, Ember.js, that came out of Sprout Core. That, <clears throat> that's a really robust client-side framework. So I would call Backbone a library, just a set of tools which you can include into your application and build on top of. Whereas Ember is a fully fledged application framework. It's more like 20,000 lines of code. But it's very powerful. You're kind of all in with Ember, where Backbone you can sprinkle things on top of. But I, I'm really interested in just to see where Ember goes. And I think it's a great choice for really immersive uh, single page apps that don't have to have any rendering on the server. Although, at one time at an Airbnb happy hour, I was talking to Yehuda Katz, who is one of the main contributors of Ember and also used to be on the Rails and jQuery core teams. He was saying that they're toying around with a way to render the views on the server too. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these efforts uh, coincide. And there's Derby. Derby, you might have seen in Hacker News or, or whatever. So Derby and Meteor are kind of analogous frameworks. So they're both, they're both Node.js application frameworks that are very centered around real time. And that, that really influences their design. And so at Airbnb, we're not that concerned with building a real-time app yet. We might build certain parts of it. But um, through and through, Meteor and Derby are real-time. And you're very much tied to writing your data model in, uh, in, their, in their way and having it live in Mongo. Now, we already have a, you know, a bunch of data, a bunch of other APIs, and we're, we're not interested in converting that all over to live in Mongo, but if you've got a Greenfield app, if you're starting fresh, it's an interesting way to go. I initially thought that we were going to use Derby, actually. You can go find a, a tech talk in September, <coughs> excuse me, at uh, airbnb.com slash tech talks. We've got videos of all our talks, but I talked in September about this problem and the easy way versus the hard way. And I was thinking that um, at the end, of, uh, my conclusion was, well, let's use Derby. But then I started to look into it, and it's not quite ready for production use. And then uh, Meteor is, is kind of analogous also to Ember in the sense that it's, it's very much an application framework. And I was fascinated by taking Backbone and taking the Backbone approach, which is um, like a, a small library which you can build on top of. And so I hope you guys are excited to see where that, where that goes. And... Um, Check out our blog for, for more updates on that. And uh, I'll hand it back to Alex. But first, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I'm really interested in web apps. And I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in web apps today and tomorrow. But where it's, it's so relevant for you guys because if you're building a, a startup today, it either is a web app or it has to have a web app component. I mean, there's no two ways around it. A lot of startups are analogous with web apps or mobile apps, um, and so it's it's really important to have to, to be able to build a really beautiful, snappy, fast, scalable web app. And uh, it's just so exciting because there's so much innovation happening today. With a little bit of backstory about the past, and now a quick glimpse into the future of technology at Airbnb, I thought I'd close with a core principle that's really driven us forward through projects thick and thin and really helped our engineering efforts be quite manifest and quite team oriented throughout the years. Of course, being Hack Week, we have to tell you to never stop hacking. 
What does it mean to never stop hacking? At Airbnb, hacking and the hackathon, the format, is very important to our culture. I thought I'd just break it down into a few bullet points that I think really exemplify the kinds of work and collaboration that our team experiences when working together. Uh, all of these things sort of wrapped up and encompassed by the idea of hacking together. Technological vigilantism, what is this? To me, this is the idea that there really, really is no reason not to try something that you think is going to be excellent. And if you can do it in an environment where you both have the desire and the license to do so, why not? Why not spin up the new database technology? Why not try a new approach at API design or a really crazy browser hack? You just never know until you spin it up and give it a try. Cross-functional collaboration. The hackathon is a great format for getting to know the workflow, the methodologies, the thought process of people in disparate fields. At Airbnb, our hackathons consist of teams with engineers, designers, producers, just about any role that goes into the building of a product is a, a welcome and expected addition in many cases on a team that's going to put together a small hack, a medium hack, or even something that may turn into part of the product itself. Creating and learning together. I, I really want to emphasize the together part of creating and learning together. It's an all too common phenomenon that engineering becomes a siloed effort. Even within pure engineering organizations, small feature teams and people who are maintaining a very small amount of code can often become sequestered. And it's not that one can't work well alone or efficiently, but the breadth, the range of ideas, the kinds of innovative solutions that you stumble across working with other people who are breaking down the problem in a different way is quite amazing. The fact that you're with anyone else at all means that your product at the end of your hack is sure to be more than the sum of its mental parts. Uh, we wanted to leave you with a short video from our very first hack arathon. So picture this. On Friday night, we have a meetup with the community. We launch a voting tool where they can submit ideas on how to make the site better. Tonight, you can submit your ideas and vote for them. In fact, we have an event tomorrow night where we might build one of the top ideas. And Saturday, we have the hackathon. waltzing in at 7 p.m. and there being two sushi boats and a gigantic countdown timer on the table. You could sort of have this nice little foreshadow of your next few hours. You know, it's going to consist of uh, good food and, and some, uh, some intense clock counting. together, so if you don't have a partner yet, you should try to match up with someone so we can all collaborate on awesome stuff, especially designers, engineers, working together because that's really what distinguishes the way Airbnb does hackathons versus other tech companies. The deal is we have 12 hours, so by 8 a.m. we're all coming back from here to the first Hack Air home. People have so many ideas here about ways to improve the product and the service or it's kind of zany, whimsical ideas, and the hackathon was our time to build those. So it was me and Spike working together. Um, we work together on a couple of other projects now. Um, we've got a pretty good rapport. Why we're going to be so good tonight? You know, we've got a splitter. And we're rocking out to the same team. So we kind of knew how to hit the ground running. Everyone kind of has their pet project that they are really excited about. And I feel like it's really rare that you both have the license and the desire to go do something crazy. And everyone uh, everyone was on board with that. And it, it makes you feel really unbridled. We have about 11 hours to go. People are cranking away. We got people working on search stuff. We got people working on community stuff. We got people working on internal tools for the team. It's going to be awesome. When our chef's away, Mike's come out to play. And so we ate a lot of junk food all night.
It was a mariachi band at midnight. You know, how many hackathons have that? You're amazed at what you can get done when you have a deadline and you're sort of forced to show something. It's still pretty rough. You gotta see what else breaks first. It forces you to be creative in the last moment. That's a little sneak preview. Once we solve this problem, it'll be awesome. I was exhausted. I just wanted to sleep. Seven a.m. at the end of the hackathon, we're all exhausted. We're bleary-eyed, but everyone is super excited about what they had been uh, working on all night. And I was absolutely blown away by some of the stuff our team had produced. It was great, kind of the reveal at the end when you got to see what everyone had been working on. I was very proud of what our team had done. Um, I mean, that was the first hackathon. It certainly isn't the last. I'm really excited about the next one, and maybe it'll be opened to the community. Uh, the hackathon has actually become quite institutionalized at Airbnb. We really enjoy it and try to do these about once a quarter. Thanks for listening. We hope you gained some valuable insights into the challenges you'll encounter when your startup scales. And that you're as excited as we are to start building the next generation of web applications. Hi, I'm Adam Hahn, co-founder and CTO of Judicata. We're mapping the legal genome to help you better understand the law. Let's get started. I'm Adam Hahn, and this is Judicata's Startup Engineering MOOC Lecture. Now, before I begin, I want to give a little disclaimer. Judicata is definitely the earliest of all of the startups that you're hearing in your lectures. We're about 14 months old, and we're in the legal technology space. We're seven people, five engineers, and we're still learning, just like every other company. But just a little disclaimer, we haven't figured everything out, and that's okay. We're telling you what we know. We still think it's going to be useful for us to talk because in the event you do start your own company, we should be the company that you are able to relate to the most because we're the earliest. And with that, we'll begin. So, Judicon, what are we doing? Our tagline is mapping the legal genome. That means turning unstructured court opinions into structured data. We do this using highly specialized case law parsing code combined with algorithmically assisted human review. Now, the end result of all of this is a product that is used by lawyers. Usually, you know, a segment that people love to hate. Well, for us, they're our core customers. Um, we're not a consumer company. We're not even, we can't even really be called an enterprise company because we only sell to one specific type of enterprise, and that's going to be lawyers. But what we do do is help lawyers make sense of all of this dis normally disaggregated information. Uh, right now, we're parsing millions and millions of sentences, 21 million, and 77 million component attributes. So a little bit about me. I graduated from Stanford in CS in uh, 2008. I'm not a lawyer. I considered going to law school, but I uh, met my co-founder and now our CTO, or sorry, CEO, Itai, and uh, he wisely told me not to go. Um, and it's great because I've been able to apply my CS background as, and as well as my interest in, very strong interest in law, and uh, you know, they mesh perfectly. So I'm the co-founder and CTO. I've been involved in uh, pretty much every decision having to do on, with the technical side of stuff. So uh, the initial decisions to be pre-commit code review and continuously deploying stuff from the beginning, as well as all the decisions about how to represent our legal genome, this data. Now, before I get into you know what our engineering stack is and everything like that, I want to make sure that we 
all have a kind of a common vocabulary and kind of explain what are the problems that we're solving. Because it's not intuitive like, you know, some of these other companies that you might have heard. In 1969, there was a case called Schimmel. So what happened in Schimmel was this guy Schimmel gets arrested. And he gets arrested in his own house. The police come, they have a warrant for his arrest, and they take him in. But they say, uh, because of officer safety, because it's it's necessary for police officers to be safe, we 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 searched his house. We we had to, you know uh, we had to do it. In the in the process of searching his house, they find stuff that they use to convict him. And Schimmel says, hey, you you can't do that. You actually uh, need a warrant to search for stuff normally. Now they had a warrant for his arrest, but not to search his house. So uh, the Supreme Court actually said, look, you can't say you can search the entire house as part of officer safety, uh, but we will let you search um, on their person and kind of Im immediately around them for, for officer safety. So the search was invalid because they didn't have a warrant and Shimmel got to go free. Then about 12 years later, New York v. Belton comes down. Now in this case, it was slightly different. So in Belton, this guy is driving in New York. He gets pulled over. Officer smells some marijuana, looks and sees something that looks like marijuana, and they arrest him for it. Now, because of search incident to arrest, like the, the principle that, that was uh, talked about in Schimmel, um, he, the police officer searches the car for um, officer safety and, and finds some cocaine. Now, uh, Belton says, hey, you, you can't do that. Um, and it goes up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, look, we know this is really hard for police officers to, to operate with a shimmel standard in, in, in cars. Like, what does it mean for cars? So we're new rule. We're revising it. Uh, in cars, if you arrest someone, you get to search the entire interior cabin of the car. So it's not just kind of the, the immediate area around them, it's the whole interior cabin. From then on, that was the law of the land. The day after that opinion, it changed the law. All right, so now Belton is the law of the land. And... Uh, it takes a long time, but the, all these lower courts are disagreeing about how Belton works. Um, and finally, the Supreme Court takes up a case in 2009 um, called Arizona v. Gantt. So in Gantt, uh, basically this guy Rodney Gantt was suspected of doing some drug stuff. So they had some police officers staked out. Um, and when he gets out of his car... They arrest him for driving with a suspended license. Now, they arrest him, they put him, handcuff him, and put him in the back of the squad car. Then, because Belton made such a clear rule, it said, they said, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna search the car. Belton said, if we arrest someone, we can search them, we can search their car. Um, and they find some cocaine, and uh, the one good thing to learn is that all these uh, search cases, all the good ones have to do with drugs. Uh, they find some, they find some drugs, um, charge them with, with, with that stuff. And Gantt says, no, you can't do that. I, you, this is all about officer safety. And yet I'm detained in the back of a squad car and handcuffed. There's no way I could have like lunged for a weapon or anything in that car. Um, and the court agreed. Uh, the court said that, uh, the, the laws changed. Belton is no longer a bright line rule. You say you can only search if, uh, you know, you if they're still in the car and you think they might be able to get to a weapon or destroy some piece of evidence, or um, you think that you're going to find some evidence that has something to do with the reason you arrested them. Um, so this was a huge change in uh, in the law. And again, in 2009, you probably didn't know it, but your rights changed overnight, um, and and you know. Law enforcement has to react to this immediately, but more important than, well, not more important than us, but uh, equally important are uh, the lawyers who argue things in front of this court. They have to keep up with these rules too. 
And it's not just you know fun constitutional stuff, if you consider this fun, I do. Uh, fun constitutional stuff like, like this, but any, uh, there, the Supreme Court hears you know a bunch of cases every year, and it's not just the Supreme Court that's setting precedent, it's all the court of appeals, it's all the state Supreme Courts, it's all of, you know, the, the state intermediate appellate courts, they all set uh, precedent as well. So it's critically important for a lawyer when you're arguing in front of a judge to know what the rules are. Legal writing is very formulaic, and whenever you say, uh, we think this should happen, you give a citation to a case explaining why you think the court should rule that way. So let's take a look at Arizona v. Gantt. Uh, we, we find that, uh, this is a, a page from, from the opinion, we find that uh, it's, it's even more beyond these three cases. It's, you know, Marin v. United States, and then uh, it's changed in Gobart v. United States, and then a year later changed again. You know, it's this stream of changes. And what uh, could be frustrating to you is that these, these changes in this law, what governs us, is not written out like a computer program. It's not, you know, bullet points. It's prose, like this. Um, and it's, it, you have to figure out what's going on. So what we do is, this is a, this is a California case, um, no longer Supreme Court stuff. Um, but this is a case, and if we take a look at it, we have, we have the same, it's the same type of language across the court. You know, you, you say, you know, this is what happened, we were discussing some cases, and then I'm gonna give a citation to something else. Um, so our you know, highly specialized case law parsing code can take this, and um, this is a visualization that we have in, internally uh, to see what's going on in here. And you can tell based on this, you know, the brown things are references, the red things are you know, things where we, we know, like affirmed is a, a verb that we wanna pay attention to, um, and you know the yellow C down there at the bottom, that's uh, a signal word, which has a very specific legal meaning. So this is kind of the output. And if we blur our eyes a little bit, um, then we're left with just data. Data that we can reason about because we know what's going on at every level. So that's a little bit of common law. Uh, this is uh, you know a news article announcing our funding. Peter Thiel is one of our investors, um, along with a handful of other uh, angels. Um, my co-founder Blake um, it has reached a little bit of internet fame by taking the CS one eighty three notes, um, and uh, he is a co-founder. He graduated from Stanford Law School um, last year. So let's dive into engineering culture at Judica a little bit. Um, our dev tools are pretty similar to what you would find at you know, most other startups. Uh, everyone can get a Mac, really anything you know, Unix-y, but uh, you know, we, we, we like the Macs. Uh, uh, I assume you're familiar with Brew stuff. Um, this is just a shout out to some of my favorite tools. Um, I like iTerm a lot. Tmux is a little bit more pure, but iTerm, I like the splitting in it. Um, we don't really have uh, specific editors that we mandate. However, I am very partial to Vim. In terms of uh, front-end debugging and stuff, um, I love Chrome. Command Option J is crucial. The dev tools, please um, learn about them to l just learn what is possible. It's amazing how much it has advanced from you know the days of uh, just Firebug. Um, they have some great videos on uh, YouTube, the Google developers, as well as good documentation on their website. And uh, like most other startups, we use New Relic. Um, it's uh, a really valuable tool for figuring out just what's going on, basically effortless uh, debugging of some stuff. So this is a view uh, inside the office. You see we have some uh, standing desks, also uh, not shown in this, there's some sitting desks. Um, and uh, one thing that we like is this is the, the, the coolest Reddit that you've never heard of because it's private, uh, our Judicata. Um, we use it for, you know, because we're in this kind of domain specific space, we trade links about, you know, legal stuff um, or, you know, technology stuff and things like that. But it's a place for us to just, you know, have private conversations and uh, 
we uh, really like it a lot. Nice place to go um, have asynchronous conversations when you know uh, something you have is indexing or compiling or what have you. Um, this is a little inside baseball, but you know we get our lunch catered to us. We really like caviar. Uh, try caviar.com um, for delivering all of our stuff to us. Oh yeah, and this is from our um, holiday party. <laughs> our uh, CEO Itai uh, is into home brewing stuff, so uh, one of our engineers made him brew judicata. I want to transition now to talking about frameworks. So if you can't tell, the most important thing is to be skeptical of a new framework. When someone on your team approaches you and says, hey, I got this cool new framework I want to integrate into our project, your reaction shouldn't be, oh, cool, a new framework, yeah. It should be, a new framework? Why? A new dependency? Do we need that? And that's exactly the, 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 first, the first question I ask myself whenever I am considering adding an external dependency. Do we really need this in our code? How many lines of code is it going to save us? Is it just 10 lines of code and I'm feeling a little lazy? Maybe I should just buck up and implement it. Now, uh, most of the time there is a legitimate reason to use it, but sometimes there isn't. So if there is, the next heuristic I use is to read the documentation. Now you can learn a lot about a project by reading its documentation. Um, a well-documented project is going to help you reason about how this new dependency is going to interact with you. Uh, one great example of this is Redis. If you go to redis.io slash commands, um, they actually go a step further and tell you about the big O runtime of every command. That's really great in terms of figuring out if I put this H keys call here, how is that going to affect the runtime of this outer function? Another well-documented project is uh, Django. Um, I, I feel like they do a good job of telling you in good detail what every method's going to do and the potential pitfalls. Now, if you're still on the fence, the next thing to do is to read the source code. Now, I don't mean digest all of it, but these are open source projects most of the time. Um, we can just open it up and take a look. If, if there were a problem with this, would you be able to, uh, would you be comfortable looking at a stack trace inside this project? It's a good question to ask yourself. And finally, taking a look at the community. Maybe everything looks good, but then you realize there's only five questions on Stack Overflow about this project ever. Perhaps it's not the right idea to put into your production environment. Just saying. So now that we've talked about how frameworks are evil, let me tell you about all the frameworks that we use. Um, so it kind of goes without saying we're on AWS. And on the back end, we are um, a Django shop. We use South for migrations. Um, Tasty Pie uh, is Django Tasty Pie is great for um, really quickly making an API for you. And what's nice about that is that it's not tightly coupled to the ORM. That means if something needs to change, or if you change the name of a model, you don't necessarily have to change the name of the API endpoint for backward compatibility reasons. It's also cool in that it only exposes primitive values over the API and makes you deal with foreign key relationships, which I think is a good thing for an API because everything in your database is going to be related to each other in some way. And if you try to have too much magic going on, you'll probably get bitten. It's also very easy to override uh, the default behavior in it. Uh, we use DSE for bulk operations and network X for some graph analysis, analysis stuff. Um, now in terms of the data representation, we start out with um, Postgres plus Redis. Uh, Postgres is really nice. If you compare the Postgres documentation versus the MySQL documentation, you'll see my uh, heuristic number two, uh, kind of figure out why we're running Postgres. Um, it's a lot more predictable in terms of its performance. Now we started with Redis as well for storing um, key value attributes of some of our uh, components that we parse out. But what's kind of interesting about us is that even though we are pre-revenue and you know we're not selling our product to everyone, the reason we aren't selling it is because the thing that we're working on right now is 
this legal genome, making all of this data. So it's kind of interesting in that we have scaling issues before we've sold to customers. So as we started parsing, um, you know, more than you know, hundreds of thousands of cases, we figured out, oh wow, Redis is not gonna work for us because it's trying to keep everything in RAM. So we ended up migrating to just Postgres. Postgres is flexible enough that we were able to just make a, a key value table inside of Postgres. And actually we look forward to using the Postgres hstore functionality, which is kind of like Redis key value like operations natively supported in Postgres. And it's just a column in your table. Postgres is pretty flexible. Um, and we use solar for searching stuff. Nothing fancy, it's not an external, a third party search provider, it's just solar. It's good enough for Instagram, it's probably good enough for us. Now on the front end, uh, we use Django for base template stuff and some complex HTML for rendering some, some uh, tree representations of cases and things like that. It's too much rendering to put on the client side. But in general, we use uh, client-side rendering to make our application feel snappier. To keep our JavaScript modular, we use Require.js, which is uh, really good at enforcing, creating somewhat reusable components at the very least. We use Backbone, and along that we use two Backbone extensions, Backbone Relational and Backbone TastyPy. TastyPy inter interfaces with the TastyPy API, like I discussed earlier, and Relational makes it so that you can access foreign keys uh, through Backbone uh, very easily without having to wire that up yourself. Finally, we use less for our CSS generation, and that's mostly because we decided to use Bootstrap, and Bootstrap uses less, Twitter Bootstrap. So now I want to talk a little bit about how work gets done at Judicata. So we have something called the clerk, and it's based on the Supreme Court clerk or basically any other clerk, court clerk. The clerk is so important that it is designated in rule 1-1 of the Supreme Court rules. It says, the clerk receives documents for filing with the court and has authority to reject any submitted filing that does not comply with those rules. That sounds a lot like continuous integration, to me at least. And later, rule 41 says, opinions of the court will be released by the clerk immediately upon their announcement from the bench. That sounds a lot like continuous deployment. So clerk was the perfect name for our little test and deploy bot. This is a screenshot of our code review system. And the first thing you'll notice is that it is not GitHub. It is in fact Garrett. Garrett is an open source project um, used most famously by Android in their code review. Um, so it's written by Googlers, it's, it's good. We actually, when we started the company, um, I started with me and my co-founder, uh, Itai. We were two engineers and we used Garrett because I wanted us to do code review from the beginning. And it just, it was, it worked well. And then we, and then we hired, um, you know, three other engineers and I said, okay, let's get serious. Let's move to GitHub. And, you know, the GitHub flow works really well for open source projects, I think, but I don't think it's ideal for organizations uh, who are developing proprietary code, or, or at least our organization didn't feel that way. So we decided to move back to Garrett, and we like it because of, uh, it has a, f for a few reasons. Well, one, on GitHub, the idea is you, um, if you wanna do pre-commit code review there, you push to your branch and then you say, hey, please review this by tagging them in it. And then they give you a plus one or something like that, or you know, they write it in a comment. It's not explicit, but they write in a comment that says, hey, looks good to me. And uh, then you're supposed to merge it in. But if it doesn't look good to them and they have requests for you to fix something, then it can get kind of hairy because then you have to push back to that branch uh, a new commit that says, you know, changes in response to code review or something, whatever. And you might have two or three of these. And then all of a sudden you have th four commits, only one of which was the actually interesting one, then three other commits that are just used to, you know, fix things. Um, and it kind of messes with your Git log. Um, it can make your Git log mean um, not every revision was deployed. And uh, it can also mean that you can't 
some of the revisions plain old might not work. Um, the way that Garrett works, whereas GitHub is very open with how you can use your 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 flow, Garrett is much more constrained and says, okay, this is how the flow is going to work, which I think is something that has to be said in, in an organization anyway. It says, this is the flow. Um, you push to this magical branch. Garrett does some magic. And then uh, you... Garrett keeps track of the differences between the patch sets. Um, so it's very easy to see, you know, okay, this was, he, he responded to my changes here and we left comments there. Um, it makes the act of code review a lot easier. So now I wanna show you how the clerk interacts with the rest of our admittedly pretty small infrastructure. Let's start with the right side of the diagram. So you'll see that Clerk has an SSH connection open with Garrett. Garrett is actually pretty cool in that respect that it has an SSH interface um, to receive events about what's going on in the repository. So when a change set is updated or added for the first time, Clerk gets that notification and then tars up the project and sends it over to a server called Lemon, uh, which is a, a test bot. Call it lemon because there's a famous there's a lemon test where uh, it it kind of outlined what is the rule for excessive government entanglement in religion, um, state sponsored religion. So it, basically, my job at the company is to come up with crazy names for services and servers, and then have all the engineers ask me why. Um, so that's how testing works. It's very simple. But what's interesting is we use a different interface for deployment, which is the left side of the diagram. You'll see multiple lines for uh, Clerk and Garrett. That mean, that's because once every minute it pulls Garrett and just says, hey, um, what's the latest revision you have? What's the latest revision you have for this project? It, Clerk keeps track of what is the latest revision deployed, and then Garrett will let it know if there's a new head. The reason we use this um, admittedly more dumb interface for deployment is because deployment is critical to us. If we can't deploy, Clerk is how we deploy everything. We can live without testing, you know, for a day or something like that. But we want to make sure that the interface for deployment is bulletproof. Uh, with SSH, something weird could break or something like that. Polling is so dumb, we can't really mess it up. We'll never say never, but um, we haven't messed it up yet. Um, so it, it pulls once a minute and see if, if there's an, a, a new uh, SHA-1 out there. And if there is, it tars it up and sends it to the, the appropriate server. Um, uh, you see we have different servers go going on. Um, our, our Django uh, web app, our parser, um, which is written in Java, and then our solar instance, um, which is... Uh, it, its own standalone server. And I highlighted the Marbury and Parser in uh, orange because those are stateless. Um, the nice thing about statelessness is that, well, right now we're just running them on standalone EC2 instances. We plan on changing them to uh, using Amazon Elastic Beanstalk so that we get scaling for free. Um, just one of the nice things you get when you design a web application correctly. So this would be the part of the talk when I mention our API and all the cool stuff you can do with it. Well, as you might expect, because we are pre-revenue and uh, haven't uh, released anything yet, we don't exactly have an external API yet. However, we do have stuff for you to play with, um, and it's actually pretty interesting. Of course, I'm biased to say that, but I still think it's pretty cool. Our data set is um, 15,000 recent California cases that are parsed with references. So these are cases from 2011 and 2010, um, both criminal and civil cases. And I'll show you what the XML looks like. There's a whole DTD in the README and the README explains more about what's going on specifically, but you see we have some metadata, when it was filed, what court it was in. Um, this court is USCA SCT, so Supreme Court. Um, all of these are gonna be California cases. But um, you see we've parsed out sentences for you, paragraphs, it's all nicely nested. As we keep going, um, you see some cool stuff here. 
um, these reference nodes. And what's interesting is that these are three references and they all have the same href, yet the text inside of them is different. Uh, this is equivalent to a hyperlink in judicial writing, um, except that uh, normally they don't declare the href as cleanly as we have. We've reconciled them for you so that you know uh, that this first reference to steal, the second and the third one are all talking about the exact same case. What's interesting is that you probably won't have this case. It says in Ray steal 2004. That's going to be before this time of this data set. Yet, you still know information about this case. What information do you know about this case? Well, you can look at the sentence that it was referenced in and the sentence prior to it. The way legal writing generally works is you say the rule is X, period, and you see C case, you know, Rho v. Doe. And Rho v. Doe is stating the proposition that the prior sentence was talking about. So what can we do with this data set? Well, one thing is you have a bunch of parsed language. You can look at, okay, what are some interesting engrams across these cases? How did the engrams change for, you know, say civil cases versus criminal cases? I'll give you a hint. You can tell a criminal case because it's always people v so-and-so. And civil cases are always, you know, party A versus party B. You know, not not the state suing you. Uh, you can also look at a citation graph. Because we have the hrefs parsed out for you, um, you can treat those as edges and nodes as cases. You can do some very interesting visualizations with this citation graph. What is cited the most and, and why? What, why? Why is this uh, case such a, a hotbed? Um, what can you tell about the cases you don't have? And finally, you know, bonus points, can you detect any judicial bias? So now I want to transition to talking about my path to Judicata. I didn't start this company when I was in college. It actually started, you know, three and a half years after college. But what I did do in college was I nurtured my interest in law. And it's this interest that I sustained that got me to where I am. Most people think what we do is incredibly unsexy. I think it's great. I'm a little bit weird, I guess, but by having this very strong interest in computer science and this very mature interest in law, put me in the perfect position to start this company. Now, I know a lot of other people want to start something immediately out of school or not even finish school or whatever, and they might be pressured into doing that simply because that's what you do. I don't think I can condone that. A startup is something that lasts five, six years. I don't think you want to bring it upon yourself to be doing something that long that you're just not interested in. Another thing that I've learned is you have to embrace your differences. We are, Judy Guy is a pretty different startup. You know, we have this backlog of cases that we have to process. We have a lot of work to do. We do something that's very un Silicon Valley. Um, but it's because we're taking a big swing at something. The incumbents in this industry were incorporated in 1870s and the 1970s. It's hard. We're taking a very big swing at something. We're not doing the low-hanging fruit. If it were easy, it would have been done already. It's important to realize that you don't have to be like every other company in Silicon Valley. So in sum, don't be afraid to be different. You don't have to be like everyone else. Don't be afraid to go deep. You should approach your frameworks and new tools skeptically. And finally, of course, the best code is less code. Code that you don't have to write, you don't have to maintain. Here's some resources that uh, I would like to share. One, if you're at all interested in law or, you know, you, even if you're not, I highly encourage you to read a jailhouse lawyer's manual or at least the very beginning of it. 
What's interesting about it is it's a publication made by Columbia Law School, and it's for people who are in jail, prisoners, who are trying to get out of jail legally. And so it begins with a layman's introduction to the U.S. legal system, and it's actually a very good description. Um, not to compare you to prisoners in terms of intellect, but I'm saying it's a good, it's a good introduction, um, as well as the f basics of legal research and kind of the, the problems of getting out of prison legally. Uh, the second link is the OEA project. That contains a corpus of Supreme Court oral arguments. Um, this really fed my interest when I was uh, trying to learn about the law, and it was a great way to really immerse myself. In terms of engineering blogs I like, there's a million, but two that particularly resonate and helped me uh, with Judica were uh, Instagram engineering blog. Um, they also take a very, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, keep it very simple approach, um, as well as the build.com, which is great more specifically for people who are doing the Django Postgres route. So uh, thank you for watching and here's my contact information. All right. Well, I hope you were able to learn something from our small companies talk. Maybe you are excited to play with this novel data set, uh, or you learn that it's not the worst thing to do something different or hard. But at the very least, I hope you took away the fact that you should keep your frameworks to a minimum and make all your external dependencies easy to reason about. All right. Thanks for watching. I'm Adam from Judicata. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Ian Wong from Square. Square is making commerce easy for everyone. We are helping businesses accept credit cards, grow sales, and offer their customers a fun and simple experience at the counter, all with a free app and cart reader. In this guest lecture, I'll cover four rules that are distilled from working with other engineers at Square. And hopefully when you apply these four rules, you will be able to create an effective startup engineering team. So let's begin. Let's first begin by getting onto the same page with the term effective. What do we mean by that? The definition we'll use is fairly straightforward. An effective startup engineering team ships useful and delightful products to the customers at a fast pace. So in this presentation, I'll cover four rules that when applied will hopefully help you build this effective startup engineering team. And where am I distilling these four rules from? Over the last two years, I've had the great pleasure of working in an effective startup called Square. So let me first take a moment now to introduce to you Square. Our mission at Square is very simple, and that is to make commerce easy for everyone. We began four years ago with a very simple premise, and that is to enable anyone to accept credit card payments anytime, anywhere. And since then, we developed the Square Card Reader and the software into a full-fledged point-of-sale system known as the Square Register. Square Register not only enables merchants to accept credit cards, but also to share location and menu information, among other things. Merchants can even log on to scrub.com to see their sell history and understand better how their business, is, their business is doing. With the Square Register, Square firmly planted itself onto the counter. But we didn't stop at the counter. We looked across the counter and we realized that, hey, we should simplify the buying experience for the merchant's customers. So as a result, we built Square Wallet. Square Wallet is a fast and easy way to pay not only at your favorite businesses, but it also allows you to discover new businesses and create loyalty programs with these merchants. And because we've been very effective at shipping products such as Square Register and Square Wallet, we've gathered quite a bit of momentum behind us. We're currently processing more than $10 billion in payments annually. And last year alone, we grew our customer base from 1 million to 3 million. There are currently more than 20, 250,000 businesses listed in the Square directory. That's a lot of businesses. And our readers are available in nearly 40,000 retail locations nationwide, from Best Buy to Apple Store. Fun fact, if you were to take our transaction volume at it all, that will make us the equivalent of the 20th largest retailer in the United States. And so hopefully I've convinced you that Square is effective as a startup and that the four rules might be applicable to you. And before I dive into these four rules, let me take a moment to first introduce myself. My name is Ian, I'm an inference scientist on the RISC team. 
inference scientist is just another word for data scientist. Um, prior to Square, I dropped out of a PhD program at Stanford. Um, I've got way too many degrees from, from Stanford. Um, day to day, I work on the machine learning systems to access and mitigate the risk of various entities and events in our network. And prior to that, I focused primarily on visualization and workflow tools for our ops team to review customer accounts. So without further ado, let's talk about the four points that Al presents. And they are in order of presentation, design for modularity, learn to test, use and contribute to open source, and foster an open, collaborative, and responsible culture. And let's begin with design for modularity. I guess to begin, what does modularity even mean? So we say that a piece of software exhibits good modularity if it's comprised of components that are well separated and where each component does one thing and one thing only very well, and where these components interact with each other via simple interfaces. Modularity really is a proxy for simplicity. When a soft piece of software exhibits high modularity, chances are that it's very simple. So why should we strive for simplicity? Well, a very smart man by the name of Rich Hickey, who's the author of Clojure, had this excellent presentation called Simple Made Easy. And in, in this presentation, he made the argument for why we should strive for simplicity. His argument goes like this. We can only hope to make reliable those things we understand, and we can only consider a few things at a time. Intertwined things must be considered together, and as a result, complexity undermines understanding. In other words, to even build things that will um, be reliable and that you want to change and add on over time, you really have to make them simple from the beginning. In other words, to put it more bluntly, you want to avoid things like this. So I did my undergrad in electrical engineering, and this is a fair typical example of the circuit board I would build. It's a mess. <laughs> and basically, it's very hard to swap pieces in and out. You're pretty much doomed to start from the beginning if you have to change a piece out. It makes for very entertaining movies, like Inception, where the plots are so intertwined and complex, but it's pretty bad software entering practice. And I bet that if I were to look at the code submissions from this class, I'll find some of this. And maybe you'll, you're, you'll find that you're you know, encountering this entangled mess in your code as we speak. And those things are usually found in something what we call as a God class. So here's a sublime text preview pane of one of the classes I had to deal with, which itself contained over a thousand lines of code, which is itself kind of a code smell. And you know that you've encountered a God class when it tries to do everything, right? When it's harder and harder to add functionality. And when things, when things feel tangled, meaning you try to add method A, but somehow that affects method B, right? And then there are lots of states and side effects in this class. It's kind of like trying to put two, pole, two magnets together with the same poles pointing at each other. It just doesn't feel right. And it just feels harder and harder to you know, just modify uh, functionality. And if you're suffering from, the from these maladies, um, here's a simple remedy that you might want to try out. Um, and this technique I refer to as extracting a service class. Um, here are two resources, one from Sleep Klatnik, the other one from Gary mm -hmm. Barnhart at Destroy All Software that describes this method. Uh, they, they call it extracting domain models, but the technique's the same. It, and the technique basically refers to stop adding functionality to your model or controller. So in Ruby on Rails, typically you find very bloated user class or various controllers that does a lot of logic. Stop adding functionality to these things. Create, extract and create a service class instead, right? And let me illustrate this with an example uh, with some code I wrote at Square. So here's a reference controller that we have at Square. Um, what this does is uh, every now and then merchants will submit a refund request. And every now and then we have to manually approve or reject these refund, uh, refund requests. So in this example, we have an approved method in the con refunds controller class that does not only verification that the locked in user is a Square employee and it may approve refund, but also the actual logic for approving that refund. And finally, when it gets the, gets the response from when or not the refund was completed, it then sends a message back to the locked in user to indicate that the refund was either completed or failed. So this class is actually trying to do a lot of different things. And I found it very difficult to modify this code. Moreover, it's very hard to re reuse the logic. So what I did was I actually extracted uh, removed a lot of the core logic around what 
under what circumstances we can approve a refund and extract it into a service class known as risk refund processor. I have a namespace under risk to indicate that, hey, it's the responsibility of, responsibility of risk to do approvals for refunds. So I think that what you'll find is as you're extracting these service classes, you're paving yourself a nice road towards a service-oriented ar ar service architecture that will enable you to scale. And why is that? Well, actually, there's very little, if any, conceptual differences between a high modular, highly modular code base and service-oriented architecture. Why? Well, if you have a highly modular code base, then that code, code base consists of loosely coupled, well-encapsulated service classes that interact with each other via simple interfaces. And to extend that in a macro scale to a service-oriented ar service oriented architecture, and SOA just consists of loosely coupled, well-encapsulated services, right, that interact with each other via simple interfaces, right? So all we did was just find and replace the word service classes with services. And conceptually, that's the main difference between um, highly modular code base and SOA, it's just the scale of which you're operating. To illustrate why Striving for modularity is so important um, at the macro scale and the SOA scale. Let me talk about life of payment at Square. So, suppose you take a payment using our uh, card reader connected to um, your iOS or Android device. That payment information goes to our payment processing services. These, this is the set of services that figures out what card this is, which payment gateway um, the payment processing should be delegated to whether or not there are funds for authorization and capture. And it basically takes and it sends a response code back to the client after it successfully completed the authorization and capture or, or actually upon the decline of such as authorization. So now that this payment processing uh, services has taken a look at the payment, that payment information is then actually sent to the systems that I work on uh, on risk assessment. Is this payment Suspicious is this payment? Does this payment give um, lead us to high exposure? And for those payments that might have risky chargebacks associated with them, we will enqueue them for manual review. But for the majority of payments, we clear them for settlement, and then we tell the settlement services, which are very, um, very, very nuanced and complex in their own ways, um, to clear to settle these payments via. Um, the ACH credit system, uh, which will then create payments to payouts to our merchant's bank accounts. And the point here is that an individual service can grow in complexity without being concerned with other services. Payment processing is a very interesting and difficult, challenging piece of software to write, primarily because of reliability concerns. Payment processing needs to be up all the time. On the other hand, settlement is very difficult because we need to calculate to the penny um, what we need to pay out or withdraw from our merchant's bank accounts. And payout schedules is more difficult than you might think. And in terms of risk, here's just some examples of the code bases that we, are, uh, we have in risk. We have uh, code bases like model kit in the bottom that is actually doing the machine learning model training to signal service that is computing the real-time risk signals. We have things like Gandalf, you know, kind of you shall not pass, right? So Gandalf is our orchestrator that, that takes in a new payment, sends it to Risk Arbor, which takes the output from Signal Service and Model Kit and tells Gandalf, hey, this payment is risky or not risky. Gandalf then takes all the risky payments and in queue pay, um, cases for manual review and regulator. And for the payments that are clear, um, that have low risk, Gandalf then clears them for settlement by communicating with our settlement services. So you can see that we are able to achieve separation of concern from within the risk assessment system um, to payment processing and settlement because we have the service-oriented architecture. And the SOA essentially enables us to scale without being too concerned with coupling in, with other services. And to complete this section, I'd like to bring, um, bring up this graphic from Simple Make Easy by Rich Hickey. And in this graphic, it depicts iteration speed or development speed over time if you choose to go with the easy route versus a simple route. So going with the easy route is something akin to just adding on to your God class, right? It's simple, um, or rather, excuse me, it's easy to keep adding on to, um, to your God class. But what you find is that over time, your de development speed 
is greatly hampered because it's very tangled and it's very, very difficult to add features. Whereas if you take the simple route, what you'll find is that yes, you do take a hit initially. You have to be very thoughtful, thoughtful about how to structure things. But over time, you actually pick up some momentum and development speed and are able to scale to, um, to solutions, much larger solutions for specific problems. Um, and that's the route that we've taken at Square and it's helped us out a lot. And to be frank, a lot of times in school, or maybe even in this course, you'll take the easy route because their time horizon is only a quarter or what have you. But really, I would encourage you to think about the lifetime value of your code base, right? You want to be able to be effective and ship high quality products to your customer at a constant high rate over time. So try to increase your time horizon from one quarter to maybe two or three and hopefully more, and try to take the simple route it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be very worthwhile. And with that, I'd like to move on to the second segment, learning to test. So testing is one of these things that they don't usually teach very well in school. In fact, I had no idea what the different types of tests were while I was in school. So why should one learn how to test? Gary Barnhart, who's the author of Destroy All Software Screencasts, had a great talk at the PyCon called Fast Test, Slow Test, in which he outlines the three goals of testing. So here are the three goals. Number one, learning tests prevent regression. Number two, they prevent fear. And number three, they prevent bad design. So let me go over each of these reasons um, in a bit more detail. So the level one awareness of why one should learn to test is that they prevent regression. What that means is you can, you're able to introduce change that will not unexpectedly break what you already have. When you have run a test and you see these beautiful green dots, in this example, I have 66 examples, and they're all passing, I know that, hey, I haven't broken anything anyone else has done before, right? You know that every single decision that has been made um, has been tested, and that you should be able to add new features without being worried about the past. Because the last thing you wanna do is that if you don't test your code, your customers will, and you don't want your customers to be your first line of test uh, of defense for your crappy code. Um, this tip is stolen straight from Pragmatic Programmer, which is a great, great read, highly recommended if you're to take software engineering seriously. So this is what I would refer to as level one awareness of why one should learn to test. Level two awareness is that testing prevents fear. Not just the fear of, hey, I'm adding something new, is it gonna break anything else? But really, as the code base becomes non-trivial, as, as you have multiple contributors to the same code base, you will find yourself constantly needing to refactor things or change things up, add functionality, modify functionality, simplify things. And without a test, you really can't refactor with confidence. And it's very important to be confident in changing functionality. For instance, in the admin controller, I knew I needed to kind of, to, um, to disentangle the mess that was the controller. I would need to disentangle the verification of the locked in user from the actual refund logic from the respond message, uh, the response message. And so I knew I, was, I, I could extract things at well because I have a test for my controller. And so as long as the controller test passes, I know that I'm in the clear. So here's what it looks like. And in fact, because I was able to extract so, so easily, um, I was able to write a unit test that covers the test, uh, the class the refund processor class much more tightly. And what's really nice about that is that this test actually serves as documentation and contract for the refund processor class. In fact, many times when I develop at Square, I don't really have to refer to documentation or the implementation of a class. I would sometimes first look at the test because the test for the class should indicate exactly what the class should do, nothing more and certainly nothing less. And so that's kind of the level two awareness of why one should learn to test. The level three awareness, kind of, you know, when Neo stopping the Sentinels, um, is that testing encourages good design. That being a class that is, a, be, that is testable is often um, loosely coupled from other classes and that has a very well-defined defined interface and that it only does one thing well. So concretely, how can you use testing to drive design? Well, here's one way that is, uh, that is espoused by Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests, which is another great, great book if you're to take software engineering seriously. It's, very high, it's highly recommended. 
So in the book, it talks about this uh, methodology of first writing a failing acceptance test. So for now, think of an acceptance test as just a big test, an end-to-end -end test. So you write this big failing test, and then you start writing a smaller failing unit test. And the unit test, just consider that for a moment as being a small test, right? So write big failing test, write smaller failing tests, make these smaller failing tests pass, refactor if necessary, and use that interlude to drive out smaller components that will eventually help you complete or make the larger acceptance test pass. And what you'll find that is that when you do this uh, inner loop and outer loop, um, you will come up with a design that's decent because testing forces you to design things well. I'll illustrate that in a moment with some live coding. And before I get there, I just like to clarify um, what I mean by acceptance tests versus unit tests versus something we call integration tests. Um, this is stolen from Misko, who's a Googler, and he's given a great series of clean code talks. I encourage you to uh, YouTube online. Um, so just to go over the different types of tests, we begin at the top of this pyramid um, with things that take a long time to run, uh, known as acceptance tests. So acceptance tests test the whole application. For instance, you have to spin up your web app and see if a certain button appears. Or if you do click on a certain button, whether or not some side effects uh, much, further, uh, much um, further down the logic chain is activated. Um, in, in this example, you mostly just want to test whether or not the happy paths to your code, ba code base is activated and is correct. You don't have, because the, because the runtime is so slow, you can't really run all the possible variations of the logic in your code base. On the other extreme are unit tests. A, a unit test focuses on a very particular piece of application logic. It gives you very quick feedback. It usually runs very quickly. And that's where you want to spend the majority of your time, um, or at least crank out the majority of your tests. All right, so the, this pyramid actually indicates the number of tests that should exist in your code base, at least for web apps. And finally, in the middle, we have integration tests, which is somewhere in between acceptance and unit. Oftentimes, as much as we'd like to write only unit tests, um, sometimes it's actually very hard to um, simulate the external dependencies, uh, or rather to mock up the external dependencies for a given class. So in those cases, you actually have to simulate these external dependencies. And the integration tests test not just the class, one specific class, but also the collection of class that this, this, this class under tests might collaborate with. So let me um, stop talking for now and actually um, show you how this is done. So what we'll do is we'll test drive um, Gandalf. And just to remind ourselves, Gandalf is this code um, code base we have in RISC that orchestrates um, the receiving review, reviewing of payments and a queuing of manual review cases. So the responsibility of Gandalf is to take uh, payments, um, ask for arbiter if they of the payments of high risk, and for those payments with high risk, Gandalf will then enqueue them for manual review in Regulator. So let's get straight to it. Let's test drive Gandalf. So I have a directory called Gandalf TDD, short for Test Driven Development. That's very bare bones right now. It doesn't really have much. I will be coding in Ruby, and I'll be using Vim as my text editor. So let's begin by actually writing the spec or the test for Gandalf. And I'm actually going to start by describing what Gandalf should do. Gandalf should create a um, case for manual review in Regulator for merchants with high risk payments. So this is the responsibility of Gandalf. Um, it's very important as you are doing um, test driven development to be able to run a test quickly. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna map my leader R and Vim to run the test. So when I run it, it's gonna complain that it doesn't know about uh, Gandalf, what is this constant Gandalf that you're talking about? Well, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm just going to write the um, implementation in the same file as this spec. Great, so now I have a pending test. Let's start following this test in. One tip is, when you, as you do more and more testing, is actually to write the assertions first. In this case, I know that I need a hook into regulator, and so I will need 
some concept of a regulator client, and that it should receive create um, should receive some method probably called create case, uh, crease case, um, and it should receive it with say the merchant ID corresponding to say a bad merchants bad payment sorry. this up a little bit. Great. So this is the assertion. At the end of the day, regulatory client should receive create case with the merchant ID corresponding to a bad payment. So with that, let's actually create a bad payment. Um, let's just say it's one that has ID 1, so merchant ID, and it's not reviewed yet. Similarly, a good payment. Um, we'll just have ID 2 and some separate merchant ID. And let's run Gandalf. And probably the signature on the method I care about, let's just call it review payments. And here, let's give it good payments and bad payments. Because that's what Gandalf does, it reviews payments. And here, what I've done is that I know that I will need some regular, I'll need to eventually um, create case on regular client with something, with the method that will, uh, with the data merchant ID corresponding to the merchant ID of the bad payment. Um, I don't actually care for the pur purpose of the test how regular clients instantiate it. So generally, um, for for kind of things in your tests um, that are substitutions for production code, uh, we can use the concept of a test double. Now there are many different types of test doubles, um, and this one is actually kind of uh, this one is definitely a, a mock where we're asserting that the test double should receive um, a method call with certain parameters. Um, but generally, there are other types of test doubles like stubs, like um, spies. Um, but I, I don't have time to cover all of those, but I encourage you to look it up. So I don't, like I mentioned, I don't really, I'm not really interested in how regular clients instantiate it. All I care about is that it's something that receives this call. So how is Gandalf going to be aware of regular client? One common technique that I, I, that, um, I find very clear is to inject the dependency through the constructor. So um, now we, this is very explicit that, hey, Gandalf, an instance of Gandalf depends on an instance of a regular client. And that's how the two classes will interact with each other. So now when I run the tests, um, it's going to complain that, hey, the constructor doesn't know about this regular client business. So let's, um, Put that in the constructor. Great. So now I have injected this in the constructor. And when I run the test again, notice how I'm constantly going from the test to the implementation. That's kind of the cycle that you should, um, hopefully you'll find yourself uh, doing. Now it doesn't know about this method called uh, unreview uh, review payments. So let's add that in. And what this method does is that it loops through each payment and it will um, create a case in regulator. Great, so now when I run the test again, um, it's going to complain correctly since I have a bug that it got the merchant ID corresponding to a good payment as well. So as you see, as you can see, so far I have not um, excluded um, good payments from being enqueued. So that, that this would be a massive waste of our ops, uh, ops team's resources. We want to just enqueue the case for manual review if uh, it's potentially suspicious. So let's say that if the risk score, which enqueued only the risk score of the payment is beyond some cutoff. And for purposes of demonstration, let's just say, let's just put the off to be, say, some arbitrary numeric value to. Um, and how does it know how to score? Well, remember risk arbiter? Turns out we'll probably need, need it here. 
So again, I don't care about how Risk Arbor is um, instantiated, um, but whatever it does, it should receive the score method with a payment ID that corresponds to both the good payments. And for the purpose of the good payment, let's have it uh, return a low risk score. And we should also receive a bad payment, in which case, let's just say it receives a high risk score. And how is Ganoff going to know about risk order? Well, let's again inject it um, in the constructor. So let's do this thing again. And what I'm going to do is say scoring a payment um, is just submitting it to Risk Arbor ID. So now I want to run the tests. The test passes. And so I think what you'll find is that this uh, way of writing a test uh, first and it having it guide the design of your classes will actually help you inter, uh, discover the proper interfaces, right? So I figured out, hey, we should probably call that review payments on the method on Gandalf. And then the method on the risk arbiter client should probably be called score. And the regulated client, we know it's kind of obvious that the method there should be called create case. But because I'm writing the use case first through this test, it actually forces me to think about um, my coll collaborative class and the interfaces on them. And it forces me to be very explicit about my dependencies in Gandalf. And with that, I want to stop this uh, live coding segment and move back to the presentation. Returning to the presentation, let's now talk about the third point, which is to use and contribute to open source. Another way to put this is to develop an open source philosophy. At Square, we rely and we are built upon open source, um, anywhere from Postgres and MySQL on the database side, to Guava and Juice on Java, to Ruby and Rails, the, the framework, we rely on very well-built software uh, built by experts. And in fact, many of our developers are active contributors to open source software. And I hope that many in the audience um, are or will become open source developers, or at least contributors. And the thing with the, start, the, the value add for the startup isn't necessarily to build open source software, it's to leverage as much as you can and build exactly just what you need to deliver value. But sometimes you will find that you will need to invent. And when you do need to invent, you should try um, to the best, to the extent possible, open source that work. Now, no one's asking you to open source your secret sauce. In fact, for us, you know, in risk, we'll never open source our risk features and our risk algorithms. But we'll probably, uh, when, when it's more mature, open source the way we built models, the model building pipeline, because we think that's lacking in the ecosystem. And the process, hopefully, will build our brand around um, machine learning development. Similarly, as you open source different parts of your stack, you're really, trying, uh, you're really making a statement about your engineering team and your engineering brand. So at Square, we have um, many open source projects. Here are just five from github.com slash square. So the first one, as I mentioned, um, we test heavily at Square. And that extends not only uh, that goes not only from the server side but all the way to um, the client side. So we have Kif, uh, keep it functional, as an as an Objective C and as an iOS functional testing framework. We also have Kane and Ruby that does co quality threshold checking. We have Dagger in Java for dependency injection, which is a term I used earlier in the TDD segment. We have Kubism, which I'll go over in more detail in a second, and we have Squash, which is a cross platform library for exception tracking and bug reporting. So I want to spend a quick moment to talk a bit more about Cubism. So Cubism allows you to do time series visualization through horizon charts. So let's actually jump to an example here. So here's an example of the relative performance of stock price um, as compared to December 2008. So here you'll find that Apple, for instance, has been on a great climb from September to April, right, where the stock price increased um, almost uh, by 100% um, sometime in April. And what's interesting about horizon charts is that it, it uses both position and color to compress the y-axis. So here, the green, which indicates positive change, relative change, actually loops around above the top x-axis back to the lower x-axis. 
And now we have, we can show relative change on the order of plus 200%, right? And it gets even darker when a third time it loops over, and even darker the, the fourth time it loops over. Conversely, you can also see negative changes. For instance, here you can see both um, Microsoft and Adobe um, having um, some difficulties with their stock price, and they were able to rebound afterwards. Well, you'll see that here there's a blue segment that indicates negative change. And again, here you'll see that um, there's a large negative change, which is indicated by a darker blue, because that blue is kind of looped over the bottom x-axis and started from the top. And Balaji kind of asked me how, you know, how would you actually get started with Cubism or, or D3 visualization in general? One of the greatest tools you can have is actually to reach into your um, developer console in, in Chrome or your browser of choice and literally just open up the script tag and there you have it. Here's the actual code, right? So it's actually very easy to copy and paste, split up a simple HTTP server in Python and you're ready to um, play with um, D3 and Cubism. And in this example, all you need to do is just lay out a bunch of empty divs put this code into a script tag, and you should be able to reproduce this um, visualization easily. Returning to the presenta presentation, um, why, why do, do I want to kind of bring up Cubism? Well, here's an example of how we use Cubism at Square. Uh, we use it a lot to do survey monitoring and service monitoring. In this example, we are displaying the horizon charts for some of our API servers, and um, in particular, the, the load averages of our API servers. As well, I'm also showing um, our monitoring on um, service latency for a particular service. You notice that these plots are very boring, and that's actually a good thing for us. Um, we generally like load to be very low and consistent, and service latency to be also very low and consistent. But when things do happen, Cubism is a great, great tool because it allows us to see so many things uh, together. We get to, get to see coinc coincidental anomaly. Um, we get to see the unexpected. By placing all these uh, horizon charts together, we can see, for instance, hey, maybe the DB is the database is a problem, which is why we have the sudden spike in service latency. And these are things that might be otherwise kind of hard to put together. And with that, I want to conclude this segment and talk about um, my last point, which is to foster an open and collaborative, responsible culture. The fourth rule in creating an effective startup engineering team is to foster an open, collaborative, and responsible culture. One of the basic ingredients of creating an effective team is not only to have talented engineers, but also to have motivated and engaged engineers. So how do you encourage that? Well, one way is to begin with an open culture. At SCORE, we try to foster an open culture by first creating transparency. So here is a picture of our office. Um, you'd first notice that it's very, very open. And the second thing that you notice, you might notice, are these um, monitors that are mounted from the ceiling. We call them information radiators because they're constantly inf radiating information that are very relevant that, that should be shared across the entire company. Information such as the gross payment volume for a given day or the active merchants uh, that we have on our system. It's very important for us, for everyone to be aware of these metrics so that we are on the same page with respect to where we're at and where we, where we need to head to. We also have the practice of compiling meeting notes and setting it to notes at. Notes at is an email alias that all employees are subscribed to from day one, which, which is to say from day one, you have access to all the meetings that have happened in the past and will continue to have access to meeting notes in the future. And something really interesting happens when you have this level of radical transparency, and that is that it leads to engagement. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't really explain this very well, but when I'm aware of a piece of news, um, a decision that was made in a meeting or a new project that's spinning up, I'm naturally very engaged. I'm very curious to see to its success, which actually leads to a sense of responsibility. I want, since we're all on the same team, I want that project to succeed. I want to be held accountable for its success and I want to enjoy the success with you, my teammates. So um, transparency leads to engagement which leads to responsibility. So if you want to have responsible engineers, one way is to foster an open culture. And fun fact, uh, most of the conference rooms at Square has a glass uh, wall like this one. So if you take a stroll around our office, you're actually able to see 
uh, most of the meetings that were going on, which is actually, uh, which speaks to the transparency that we have in the office. A very effective way of creating a collaborative engineering culture is to pair program. Now, I'm not going to explain how to do it effectively. Um, for that, I'll defer you to excellent answers on Quora, because this, is, this could be a talk in and of itself. But just to enumerate some of the benefits of pair programming, let's start with instant code and design feedback. In pair programming, typically you have a driver and an observer. And the observer's role is to give feedback to the driver. Hey, you're writing this test really well. Hey, did you consider this design? Um, maybe we should write this extra test. So the idea is that there's a constant feedback loop even within the same terminal, which is, which is great. Another benefit of pair programming is that it allows you to learn from one another very, very quickly. I've learned so much from my, you know, my partners in pair programming, anything um, from tips of, in using Bash to editor tricks, all the way to testing philosophy and design choices that we make in, in various production code. The third benefit of pair programming is that it's the fastest way to onboard new hires. One way of onboarding new hires is to just stick them into a room and ask them to write documentation. But I think what you would find that is that you know, when you have a new feature, why don't you actually invite um, this new hire to pair program with you? It might be a bit painful as an experienced person for a little while, but you'll soon realize that um, you're actually giving them, the new hire, a lot of big benefit and giving yourself a big benefit by helping them become as productive as possible in a short amount of time. And when I do pair programming well, um, usually I'm exhausted by 5 p.m. Um, that's because I had no excuse to check Twitter. I'm constantly engaged in coding. I'm constantly um, talking about design with my uh, partner in pair programming. And perhaps the most important point is that pairing on a problem becomes part of the common parlance. I think because Square espoused pair programming early in its life, pairing on problem really it's it's a great um, great thing to have as part of your culture. Whenever I'm stuck or one of my fellow engineers is stuck, we always kind of just approach each other and say, "Hey, do you want to pair on that?" And that's a very very powerful concept um, to to have in your company. Finally, how do you foster a responsible culture? One way uh, is to instill to to entrench these in, in engineering processes. At Square, we have a lot of engineering processes that help us do that. And these processes are discussed in much greater detail by one of my colleagues, Erica, at her talk called Failing Fast, Stuff We Should Have Done Better at Square. And I'll just summarize some of these processes here, beginning with code reviews. So at Square, we move people's money in that serious business. And so we treat our code with great rigor. And we also view ourselves as craftsmen of code so because of this, um, every single piece of code that's checked into master, that's merged to master, must have at least two pairs of eyes who've seen it before. Another process um, is on the on-call rotation. Every single service at Square has someone who's on-call, someone who is, um, who is available to react to any sudden exceptions or service unavailability. We also schedule postmortems for when things do happen, when the unexpected or the unfortunate happens. Um, we need to make sure that when failures do happen, we recognize the failure and we learn from the failure so we don't repeat them again. Finally, we have retrospectives every two weeks. So every two weeks, sub-teams within SCORE will gather and it's kind of an interesting process. Um, we all meet, go into a room and we will, on the whiteboard, Ha draw a happy face, a meh face, and a sad face, along with action items. And then we'll proceed to enumerate all the things that have gone well in the last two weeks, so-so, not so well. And from that list, we distill action items, and we're very good about following up with our action items. And the idea behind all this is to make sure that we're constantly performing efficiently as a team, and as such that we are responsible for the efficiency and maintaining that efficiency going forward. And so this concludes um, the last point on fostering um, open, collaborative, and responsible culture. And just to recap, here are the four points that I mentioned in my talk. And I know that a lecture, a lecture is cheap, you know, like you might not learn anything from, uh, from this lecture. And I know that when I was a student, <laughs> a lot of times words come in through one ear and out goes the other. So I'd encourage you to all 
just do something very simple later today. If you can take nothing else from this lecture, just do these three things uh, for me. The first thing you should do is extract a service class. Look at the part of your code base that you're feeling the most pain in terms of adding functionality. Chances are things are very tangled. Do yourself a favor and extract the service class. Second, write a test next time before you implement. Start writing the implementation right away. Make sure you have a test uh, and that, that verifies at the very least that, that your implementation will work. And you have no tests in your code base so far. Well, now's a great time to start writing the first test. And finally, pair programming with your teammate. Um, I think you'll find this process to be very rewarding uh, over time. So I've covered quite a bit of material in this guest lecture. And don't worry if you didn't catch everything, because Square is hiring. Um, and the fourth thing that you should do today is to check out jobs.square.com. If you enjoy startup engineering and you've enjoyed my talk, please, um, please visit this website. And this concludes my talk. So I hope you enjoyed the guest lecture. And I really hope that you will do the three things I asked of you at the very end, which is number one, extract a service class. Number two, write a test before you implement. And number three, pair program with your teammates. And hopefully by following those four rules, you will be able to create an effective startup engineering team. And with that, good luck with your course, good luck with your projects, and thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Joel Francis from Twilio. What is Twilio? Twilio makes it easy for you, the web developer, to make and receive phone calls and send and receive SMS messages, all through a simple RESTful API. We have over 80 carrier partners around the world, provide you service to over 180 countries, and allow you to instantly provision phone numbers in over 44 countries. We've raised $33 million from a range of investors, which includes 500 startups, Bessemer, and Union Square Ventures. In this guest lecture, I'll be talking about how Twilio works, our engineering culture, developer evangelism, and I'll be showing you how Twilio allows you to easily add voice and SMS capabilities to your application. Here's a little bit about me. At Twilio, I work as a developer evangelist. Um, I also help organize a hacker party called Super Happy Dev House. And before joining Twilio, I worked as a developer evangelist at Microsoft. And a fun fact about me is that I once helped set up a squid proxy for a small African country. So before we get started, I wanted to give you a, a picture here, which is a good mental model for how Twilio works. It's going to help explain uh, what it is that, that Twilio does. The basics are is that over here on the right, you've got your code running on a web server, which is communicating via HTTP with Twilio. And then Twilio will then take the uh, responses from your uh, application or the request that you send to it and then act on those and allow your application to, to communicate over the telephone network to things like cell phones or uh, landlines, or allow you to communicate to people using um, mobile, mobile devices like iOS or Android or to web applications. A little bit of history on Twilio. We were founded in 2007 by Jeff Lawson, Evan Cook, and John Will Tice. Evan and John have extensive experience uh, with writing distributed systems, and Jeff is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, before becoming Twilio's uh, CEO, he was uh, at AWS and was also the CTO at StubHub. We raised $33 million from a, a wide range of investors, including the ones that you see here. We have over 130 employees. And the thing that really excites me the most about Twilio is our history. Uh, we, so we were founded in 2007. 2008, we launched with Twilio Voice. Now this is the, uh, the uh, part of Twilio that al allows you to communicate with the voice networks via a simple API. And then two years later, we added Twilio SMS, which is uh, an extension to our API that allowed people to easily send and receive SMS messages. And then here's where things really started to pick up. So in 2011, we added a, a product called Twilio Client. And Twilio Client is what allows you to communicate with uh, mobile devices uh, like iOS and Android or with web browsers. We also added the ability for people to send SMS messages uh, to and from SMS uh, short codes. These are the five and six digit codes that you'll see sometimes on um, advertisements. 
and things like that. Then last year, we added a whole bunch of features. Uh, the ones that I list here are just a, a, a fraction of them, but uh, they included global SMS, which meant that uh, we took care of all of the complexities of reliably delivering SMS messages to over 180 countries. Part of that was uh, enabling people to send Unicode characters to all of the countries that we support. And that was a really a cool problem for us to fix because different carriers and uh, different providers will use different encodings for how characters are encoded and sent via SMS messages. And so what we did is we went and found all the combinations of those different encodings and figured out how to translate reliably from one encoding to another. And now allows you to uh, easily send things with uh, characters in, in, uh, in different um, alphabets as well as send fun things like um, emoji. Last year, we also added WebRTC support to Twilio Client, which means that on uh, browsers like Firefox and Chrome, you don't have to use Flash to uh, make voice calls through a, a, a web browser. Now, uh, before we get into the details of Twilio, I think that the really the best way to show you what Twilio does is to not just step through some slides, but actually open up a terminal and write some code in it. So that's what I'm going to do now. So here we are inside of my Twilio account. This is uh, pretty much what your account will look like when you log into it. What you're going to want to keep in mind is the location of your account SID and your auth token. The auth token here has this little lock on it to uh, let you know that this is very much like a password and you don't want people to be able to see it um, because with that they can um, make, uh, make phone calls with your account and uh, send SMS messages with your account and you really don't want people to be able to do that without your permission. So to get started here, the first thing that we're going to do is buy a number. Uh, when you have any application, the way that people are going to be talking to that application is through a phone number. So the first thing you do is buy the number. And since I live in San Francisco, I'm going to look for a number in the 415 area code. And now for the purposes of this demo, I um, can take any old number here. Let's, uh, let's pick this one. So I'm going to buy this number and go ahead here and set it up. So what you'll see here are these two request URLs. Now, if you remember the uh, picture I showed you, the kind of mental model for how Twilio works, you remember that uh, Twilio will be communicating with your application through HTTP. This is how we do it. Uh, this is one of the ways that we do it. So here you'll see a request URL called voice request URL. This is the URL that Twilio will make a request to when you have an incoming call. And over here is the uh, uh, URL that Twilio will make a request to when you have an incoming SMS. Now, in both of those use cases, whatever that URL re responds with is uh, actions that truly will, will, will take um, with that voice call or that SMS. So in this demo, let's uh, set up a handler for this SMS um, here. So let's go over to our terminal. Uh, I'm going to SSH to my demo machine, city into the Twilio directory, uh, run Emacs. Emacs uh, on MOOC demo.xml. Now, the first thing you're going to do when you respond is tell Twilio, hey, I've got a response. And then in here is where you give uh, Twilio the things that you want it to do with that incoming call or SMS. So, in this case, I'm getting an SMS, so I want to respond with another SMS. And I'm going to say, thanks for watching my MOOC demo. Close off the SMS tag. Close off the response tag, save the file, and now if I go over into Firefox, I can open up a tab here and go to twilio.joel.francis.com slash mocdemo.xml. And there you can see, thanks for watching my MOOC demo. So I can take this URL here, put it in here, hit save changes. And so now, if you want to follow along while you're watching this, uh, pull out your phone and send a text message to the number that I just set up here. Even though I'm recording it, um, now I'm going to leave this number up so that you can see what I just did. So pull out your phone, open up your text messaging application, and send a text message to area code 415-749-9000. Nine three two two. Again, that's four one five seven four nine nine three two two. And I'm gonna send a message to it saying test. So there we go. 
Now I'm going to copy this, this phone number here, so I'm going to use that later. And so what you should have just gotten now is a response saying, thanks for watching my MOOC demo. So there you go. It's a, an example of uh, setting up an SMS response. Let's do something a little bit more fancy than that. Um, let's show you how we can do um, outbound requests. So for that, let's go to my local machine. And uh, we're going to use the REST API here. So we have a bunch of libraries in different languages like C Sharp, Java, PHP, Ruby, but I use Python. So let's, let's start that up. So now the first thing you're going to do whenever you're using a client library, no matter what language you do, is uh, import the library. So here I'm going to say from twilio.rest, import twilio, twilio rest client. I'm going to instantiate a client, saying client equals twilio rest client. And then um, let's find out what I texted in. Um, normally, if you were watching this live, I'd be able to see all your responses, but we haven't yet added the ability to receive text messages from the future. So for now, we'll have to just deal with text messages from the past. List. And so here's a list of SMS messages. That's a whole bunch of them. And the reason I got that long list is because um, I didn't filter anything. So let's filter it here and say I only want messages that were sent to that number. And there's just one response there. That's what I sent. But uh, let's do something with this. So we'll say for each message in the list of messages that I got. Well, first I got to say assign the response to messages and then say for each message in messages print message.body so there we go I sent in test and there it is well I've shown you how to do SMS stuff but uh, I haven't shown you any voice things so let's do that now let's say client.calls.create and who should I call well let's call me back so I'm gonna say message.from who this was from and this is going to say create a call to message from from the phone number that I set up and the URL is going to be a URL that I've set up before called HTTP so I'm going to play some music uh, this is music from a, one of my favorite soundtracks um, movie soundtracks so let's do that here so I'm going to turn up the ringer on my phone, and the call should be coming in just any minute now. So there's the call coming in. Let's answer it and put it on speakerphone. So there you go. Uh, it's a track from uh, the remix of the Tron soundtrack, one of my favorite movie soundtracks. Now, for those of you following along at home, um, if you want to call into that number, I'm going to set it up right now so that you can do that and take this music XML here and go back in here, paste that in there, replace everything else, go in here and click Save. And so if you want to see what that's like, uh, just to make sure that you uh, convince yourself that that really works, you can take this number here and give it a call. This is the number to call. You can hit pause now and dial that and check that out. Otherwise, uh, that's it. So thanks, everyone. And we're back to the presentation now. Man, I love giving that, that demo, especially in a, in a live audience. Um, I believe that uh, we got some video of the people in the live classroom where I did that live, seeing what that looks like. Uh, and so you can kind of get a feeling for uh, what that might be like in a live audience. Well, uh, one of the reasons why I like doing that as a live demo is I, I kind of feel like a magician. And maybe not quite like uh, Penn and Teller, maybe a little bit more like uh, Joe Bluth. And it reminds me of this quote, uh, not from Joe, but from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, so Arthur C. Clarke was a, uh, a well-known science fiction author, and he has this quote that I think about a lot when I'm doing this demo. The quote is, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
Uh, and I think that we see that a lot. Uh, you'll notice a lot of times when you're interacting with technology and you show it to someone who maybe hasn't seen it before, they're like, wow, how does that work? And the cool thing about being a programmer is that you actually, there's no stigma on telling people how it works. And that's what I'm going to be doing now. Uh, I'm going to be telling you how uh, we, we allow you to easily use uh, telephony. So let's get started. Uh, before I get into the how, the how Twilio works, I'm going to talk about sort of the history of where things used to be and uh, why you haven't been able to do this until, uh, uh, you know, about five years ago. And the reason for that is that this is what uh, telephony equipment used to look like. It's this big piece of hardware that you'd have to buy. And if you wanted to add phone systems to your company, you'd have to buy a piece of equipment like this. This is called a PBX. Find a place to put it, usually in a closet somewhere and then plug a bunch of wires into it and configure it and um, anytime you wanted to add any capabilities to it you'd actually have to plug hardware into another piece of hardware so you see these like cards here that are plugged into it on the, the left there we've got some things that if you zoom in you can see like uh, there's a, a, a tone detector and then the cards that are on the right are like analog cards so that's the way things were for quite a, quite a long time more recently, uh, people have basically taken that hardware and turned that into software and uh, made systems that were software PBXs. And uh, there's two open source projects that do that. There's FreeSwitch and there's Asterisk. And uh, Asterisk is kind of what I'm showing you here. This is, uh, this is what it would take or, uh, to set up a Asterisk PBX. Uh, this thing here that you see on the left there, this is uh, what 26 feet of documentation looks like, shrunk down to fit on a slide. And then over here you'll see uh, this is a sample from that, and this is just a bunch of settings that you've got to put in. It's a lot of like things that are opaque or acronyms you don't really understand, and you kind of follow along and it works, but you don't really know how it works or what you did. And if all you really wanted to do was send out an SMS message or make a phone call, um, it's not sometimes not worth it to spend several hours to get this thing set up if all you really want to do is just make a call and I think a lot of people were just like ah, eh, forget it well now you can do something just like this with these lines of code that you see here in the bowl that's all it takes uh, to make a call like you see over here or send an SMS message uh, this is really all you would need uh, you'd have to make sure that you were using the right uh, account SID and auth token from your dashboard like I showed you earlier this is all it takes so how does this work? Let's dive in a little bit deeper. So you remember that mental model I showed you, or that picture, the simplified diagram. This is a little bit more in depth, kind of what's going on. So at the top here, we've got your applications, the developer applications, the stuff, that code that you write that's communicating with Twilio through HTTP. And then what Twilio does is, uh, based on what thing that you want to do, we'll take care of the nitty gritty details of it. So let's say you want to send an SMS, we'll send it out via SMPP, take care of those character encodings for you, deal with all the uh, complexities of that. You want to make a voice call, we will find the, the right place to route it out, de deal with all the, the different codecs and, uh, and types of you know, audio uh, encoding schemes. Uh, and you don't have to know that we're using SIP, but that's what's going on. And then for things like buying a number, you can instantly buy a, a number through us. Um, through a, We have a large a pool of numbers and allow you to instantly provision one of those numbers. And that, uh, that makes it easier than the way it used to be where you'd have to buy a, buy a block of numbers ahead of time or send an email to somebody or call someone up on the phone. All of that is abstracted away through a simple to use API. So now let's dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, talk a little bit more about what's kind of going on underneath the hood. And for this example, I'm going to talk about how the voice part of Twilio works. So you remember that we have like two types of ways to interact with Twilio. One of them is sort of an incoming, an incoming basis when someone makes a call in and then your app gets a request. And then there's the outbound stuff where you tell Twilio to act on, on your behalf to make a call from one of your numbers to someone else. So let's uh, take a look at what it'd be like in the first scenario. So let's say someone was to call your Twilio number. They'd come in here from the left-hand side, hit our call routing uh, stack. Uh, we are, are, that call would usually come into Twilio via a protocol called SIP. We'd take care of demodulating that audio. And then when that call came through, we'd go in through our cache. If, uh, if that number had already uh, had instructions on how to act and had been told, hey, you know, 
uh, do the same thing for the next hour whenever someone calls that, that number, then we would just act on that immediately. Otherwise, we'd go out to your application and say, hey, hey sh how should we handle this call? So let's say that your application then responded with, uh, uh, hey, that incoming call, I want you to read it out something. So the request would go back. We would process that TWML, the XML language that you'd send back to us. That'd go out to our text-to-speech service, which would then take that text, turn it into audio, and then feed it out back through the SIP connection to the user and then hang up. Now let's take the other scenario, like the one in my demo where I uh, showed you how to make an outbound call to uh, everyone who texted in and played all them all music. Uh, for that scenario, started out here sort of on the internet in this uh, ever-present uh, cloud that people use to represent the internet. The call uh, comes in through the REST API, goes into our call origination service, which will then make the outbound call. Once that call connects, it goes in through the same type of uh, flow as the incoming call where uh, we gave it a URL, say follow this URL when they, that person calls in. In the case of the demo I used, I used a, a, a play command which then um, caused this to go out and fetch the URL that I told it to play, give it to a service to turn that uh, file into audio, play that audio, and then um, hang up when it's, once it's done. So that's how that works. It's about as, uh, as deep into the stack as, uh, as I think it's practical. The, 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 any more detail than that, and uh, I start getting uh, frustrated at, at uh, how the phone system's implemented or confused at all the different acronyms. So let's talk about engineering culture. Talk about what makes it possible for, for us to, to uh, deliver services that make it really easy to use something like the phone system. And, there's a lot of different ways to talk about culture, but the way that I really like talking about uh, Twilio's engineering culture is through the lens of our nine values. And so these values are like the public manifestation of uh, the, 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 the ways that we've all agreed to interact with each other and with, uh, with the outside world. Uh, my favorite one is no shenanigans, so this idea of um, don't ever do something that you would describe as uh, shenanigans. And so this comes up when we're talking about like, hey, how can we don't do something in this particular way? The response will invari in invariably come back in one of these, in the form of one of these values, but I love it when someone says, well, to do it that way would be shenanigans. And, and usually when I hear that, I'm like, yep, that's right, actually, good call. But in the case of engineering, I'm gonna focus on these two values here. So think at scale and draw the owl. So Starting with draw the owl, uh, if you were uh, paying attention to memes a couple years ago, this probably sounds familiar. If you don't know this, uh, then you can find these slides and click on the link and see what that's all about. But the real core thing here, uh, thing to remember is ship it. That's really what, uh, what if there was one, way, one small way of describing what the culture is um, in our, our Twilio engineering group, it's ship it. And here's why. As we've grown, we've really needed to uh, start thinking at scale. We're at the point now where we've got data centers uh, all, all over the world, have thousands of servers, over a, a half a petabyte of data. Not only that, we deploy to, uh, to production. We deploy code to production several times a day, and we do that with zero maintenance window, meaning we don't ever drop any, uh, any request. So unlike uh, some, some, some web properties where it's not a big deal if you know, a small percentage of the requests that come in get dropped because the web browser will just retry, um, we can't afford to, to lose somebody's uh, 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 SMS or, or phone call. And not only that, also unlike a lot of the typical web stacks that you'll see that have something like a, uh, a, uh, a, a proxy service at, at the, the front, which will uh, hand off requests to an application server, which talks to maybe a database server and a caching server. We've got hundreds of backend services that all need to get orchestrated to uh, do something like make a call or send an SMS. And so the way that we do that, um, some of the ways that we do that, uh, I'm going to give a couple examples. Uh, the first of which is uh, in dealing with these, these thousands of servers, we have a uh, product that we call box config this is an internal tool that we've written about that we've written um, you can read about it online if you look up uh, 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 slides from uh, Twilio on slideshare you can see there's uh, some talks from Evan Cook our CTO on uh, how, how we've got uh, box uh, what box config does but the the basics 
for you is that a box config will automatically configure those uh, servers and services for us. So it allows us at the very core to instantly turn on a whole Twilio instance in a new data center. Um, but not only that, it will uh, set up individual machines with individual services. Um, monitor the uh, health of those services and if it sees something getting overloaded it will scale up more services so that the load can get spread out. If it sees that something's underutilized it might scale it back down to, to, uh, so that we can uh, save resources and money. Um, and if it sees that something's failing it'll, it'll let us know or, or take a preventative action automatically. Another thing that we do is uh, we have a continuous integration system set up so that all of our code is tested. Whenever somebody checks code into our repository, it gets uh, run through a barrage of tests to make sure that there aren't any regressions, meaning that we only make a mistake once. And after that mistake gets made, it gets turned into a test, and we know that that uh, particular case will never come up again. Uh, and then uh, lastly, the, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk about was a concept that I feel is pretty important no matter uh, what type of service you're building, and it's this idea of um, using a, uh, account flags. Account flags or feature flags, as they're called. So if you've ever used, uh, if, if you're a person who's using uh, tw uh, Twitter or Facebook, you'll probably have noticed that your friends might have access to a new feature or uh, capability that you don't quite have access to yet, and then eventually you also get that as well. And uh, what, you, what that is is a, a feature flag. What, what's happening is that uh, Facebook or Twitter are deploying this new feature slowly on a user-by-user -user basis. Um, and the really cool thing about that is that that allows you to make sure that that new code that you've written it actually works in the first place um, in, a, in a live production system. And then secondly, that uh, that it actually works as intended, that it makes sense to people when they're, they're, they're using it, um, that it's doing what you intended it to do. And then um, lastly, uh, it allows you to uh, slowly increase the amount of uh, people that are using it to make sure that you don't have any um, scalability issues or, or uh, performance issues. Because what works on a couple of servers might not work across your whole database or your, across your, your whole set of servers. Um, and uh, a, a kind of a, a case of, of that, uh, a, a, another product that we've written is a thing called Shadow. So when we're releasing new code, you want to you, you make sure that it works. And uh, something that we've written is a, a product that allows us to make sure that when we're transitioning, not just adding new features like we do with the count flags, but when we're entirely um, replacing a certain code base with some different code, we want to make sure that that um, works in the exact same way. So uh, the way that Shadow works is that a request will come in to, a, uh, to our server, to, to Shadow. Shadow will then take that request and give it to an existing um, service. So in our case, we transitioned a PHP code base to a Python code base. So the request would come into Shadow, hit our PHP code base, and then a copy of that request would get sent to the Python instance of that code. Then both of those instances would respond. The PHP response would get sent back to the, uh, to the customer. And then a comparison between the response from the PHP server and the Python server, they'd be uh, diffed against each other to see if there was any difference. The cool thing about this is that uh, we were able to find things that we would have never imagined would have ever been an issue. Uh, my favorite example of this is uh, when we were in the middle of this transition, uh, we would have a single byte that would be off, you know, maybe 300 bytes in the response and one would be off. And uh, actually with ASCII, it was probably even just one bit that was off. And that was a lowercase t, ended up being a uppercase t. And what, was, what, we, what happened is um, that in PHP, a true value is lowercase t rue, and in Python, it's an uppercase t lowercase rue. And uh, to find that out by hand, looking at two diffs side by side, if you were doing this uh, as a human, everything else would have looked exactly right. All the brackets would have been in the right places, the quotes, but that one little T could have messed up um, certain client implementations, or maybe somebody had a code written with a hard-coded string that was all lowercase characters. And that's just something that we don't want to do. The other case where this came in extremely useful was when we uh, transitioned our billing system to a new billing system. We uh, wanted to make sure that the new billing system charged the exact same uh, prices and behaving the exact same way. 
And Shadow allowed us to uh, make that, that transition um, with zero downtime and uh, be very confident that everything was being billed the exact same rate. And so we didn't actually transition the billing system over until we had spent several weeks without having uh, any errors at all. The other cool thing about Shadow is that it's open sourced. So this is part of a suite of software that we have online. If you go to twilio.com slash open dash source, you can see a whole list of all this with links to the GitHub uh, repos where you can see this. So we talked about Shadow. Uh, a couple of other things here that I think would be useful to anybody watching this video is uh, Flask RESTful. So if you also use Python for programming um, and you use the Python framework, uh, Flask RESTful is an extension to the, to the Flask framework that allows you to easily turn your Python code into a uh, well-behaving uh, REST, uh, 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 REST API. And so this was the result of a bunch of learning that we had internally around uh, how to best make the REST API. And this is a library that allowed us to make an API very easily without having to add in a whole bunch of boilerplate. Next, we've got Stashboard, which is a service dashboard, uh, similar to what you might see when you're looking at the status of something like Salesforce or AWS, where it's usually just a bunch of green dots. And then when uh, a service is having issues, it might turn yellow or red. Um, if you're building a service where you need to communicate uh, parts of the, the health of your service to your users, this is something that uh, you can get from us for free and don't have to do any of that coding yourself. In addition, uh, Stashboard also allows your users to sign up to be alerted via SMS or email whenever one of your services is having an issue. And lastly, for everybody watching this, the next time you, that you, you go to use a REST API, perhaps the Twilio REST API, um, open up your browser and type in hurl.it. Uh, this is a service not unlike curl that allows you to make a HTTP request and see what the response is all through a, a web interface. So you know perhaps you've seen curl before and um, been a little bit turned off by the command line interface. Hurl is uh, definitely something that you want to use or say you don't have access to a terminal somewhere or you want to show a friend uh, how HTTP works. Hurl is a great way to, to do that. Now, in addition to our engineering culture, another aspect of the culture at Twilio that's really important is this idea of developer evangelist. So now I'm on a team of people who do this full time, but it's a, it's a core part of the DNA at Twilio. So it's not just the developer evangelist who focus on um, making a service that is buying for developers. We even have a full team of developers um, that uh, a, a team, the, this team is called uh, Developer Experience, and their whole job is to, is to also think about this in, in a more inward type of way, uh, where the developer experience focuses on you know, stuff internally. Uh, the, the evangelist people like me do things like record this video and go out to hackathons. It's also a core part of our DNA because our first hire was also our first uh, evangelist. Uh, Danielle was the first person, uh, the, the first non-founder non employee at, at Twilio. And she's the one who built our um, evangelist program. Now, uh, if you're wondering, hey, what's this? You know, what's the whole deal? Uh, give me a summary. Well, here's the summary of uh, kind of what you can think about uh, developer evangelism. When you're making something for developers, exposing it through an API, you can think about it as self-service biz dev. This is a really easy way of, uh, of thinking about, like, what's the point of an API? The, the cool thing about an API is you don't need to have people to talk to other people to do an integration between two services. All you need is to publish an API, and uh, people can do that integration on their, their own. Uh, I, love, I see this all the time. I, I love going to an event, seeing someone send out an SMS, and be like, wow, I never thought of you know, this particular use case for using SMS or how you could use a phone in this way and i uh, never heard of them before because I didn't have to. I didn't need to know that there was somebody out there doing this. All they had to do was use our API. Um, but when you're dealing with APIs, that's not the only thing that you got to keep in mind, uh, that you just throw something out there and uh, people will use it. These are some other things that you should focus on if you're building an API or really any type of thing for a developer to use. So the first thing to keep in mind is that you want to have a clear value proposition. It's got to be extremely easy for someone to understand what it is that you do. And uh, sounds obvious, but that's not always the case. So with Twilio, uh, Twilio makes it really easy to send and receive uh, text messages, make and receive phone calls. Uh, and, and if you're doing something for a developer, make sure that you have a value proposition that's equally as clear. Got to make sure that it's easy to sign up, that it's really fast. Uh, developers tend to be impatient, and uh, whichever uh, 
solution they can sign up for first will often be the one that people will, will pick. Um, in addition to that, you want to have a simple API, meaning it's got to be uh, consistent uh, with itself, uh, be kind of obvious what, it, what you need to do. Um, if you already know how to use one part, it should be pretty obvious on how to, use, uh, how to do something different. Um, and then you want to have efficient quick starts. So what this means is uh, for any type of service or you know, API or product that you're giving to a developer, there will be common use cases, things that everyone's going to want to do with your service. For that, you want to have a, a, a documentation on uh, just the bare minimum that you need to do to make a phone call, for example, or send an SMS and give people code they can just copy and paste and do that um, without having to really dig into the intricacies of your API. And for those who have a use case that maybe doesn't fall into a quick start, you want to make sure that when they go into your documentation, it's uh, very easy to find, that it uh, makes a lot of sense, and uh, that it's, you know, it just gives them the, the bare minimum that they need to know to figure out you know, what, what, what something does, what it doesn't do, and how to interact with it. Uh, the next piece here might be a little bit controversial, but Twilio, we believe that uh, the uh, HTTP basic auth is a, a better way of having an API versus using OAuth, this, because this allows someone to to easily uh, hit the ground running with your API with just the you know account sit in auth token, you can make a request via curl, you can use any programming language which can make an HTTP request, and you don't have to worry about dancing back and forth with HTTP requests and doing OAuth. And then lastly, it needs to be very easy for people to debug um, your API. So a thing we see often is somebody will miss a character when they're typing in their re uh, request URL, and they call the number and it doesn't work. And they're wondering why. Well, if you just go into your, uh, your account and you click on logs and then errors, you'll see that uh, there, maybe your server gave a 404 because it didn't know how to fetch that URL. And that, so now that's an easy way of figuring out what was wrong with your app. You didn't have to figure out where your web server stored its logs or if it was logging at all or what's going on. The high level summary of this, no matter uh, what you're doing, um, keep in mind this uh, the, the, this one one key thing. It should take no more than five minutes for your uh, for a developer to perform a useful task using your API for the first time. I would even say that uh, even if you're not developing an API for someone to use, you as a developer should should expect this of people and services you know of other services that you're using and um, uh, software that that you're using especially when you're working for a startup. Um, in the early days of a startup, your time is an extremely, extremely valuable resource and, and you should not be spending time doing something that isn't core to your business um, and should expect that uh, people uh, not waste your, your, your time expecting you to jump through uh, unnecessary hoops. Hero making is another way that we think about what we do at Twilio. At Twilio, we allow people to easily add in the voice and SMS capabilities, and often the people using us, that isn't a, a thing that's core to their business. It's something that they're adding on. They really don't want to be uh, spending all their time thinking about telephony. They want to be time, you know, spending time thinking about making their, their service even better and better. Um, and when somebody is able to easily add these capabilities, um, uh, in many cases, they are heroes at their company. There was uh, one company that wanted to add two-factor authentication to their service. They spec it out, guessing that it would take about a month of development time to do. One of the engineers went home, looked at the Twilio documentation over the weekend, implemented it, and came back in and told everyone, hey, uh, it didn't take a month. It took me a, 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 a weekend to, to get this thing basically working. Uh, so if you're a company that's uh, selling a product to developers, you're making an API, uh, another way to think about an, uh, an evangelist is someone who's an ambassador between your company and your company's developers. These are people that will interact with the outside world, come back to the developers inside the company and say, here, here's what people are asking for, this is what I'm seeing, here's where people are stumbling. Um, they will represent the community to the company and represent the company to the, to the general uh, rest of the, the community. These are also people who do storytelling. So when you're interacting with uh, a developer, you want someone who can tell a story of your company, not only in speaking, as I'm doing now, or writing, as you're seeing here on the screen, but also through code. Code is what uh, developers write day in and day out. It's how they think. It's how, how they work. It's a very important part of, uh, of interacting with, with a, a developer. So for the people that are in this type of role, for uh, anyone at your company who's working with the outside uh, world, 
the, the thing that, that an evangelist type of person, an ambassador, needs to really focus on is these parts of these things that you need uh, on, as part of your, your API or your uh, product for, for developers. The clear value proposition, working on the, the efficient quick starts and concise and accessible documentation. These are areas that as an evangelist I make the most contributions to, to, to Twilio. So I talked about speaking and writing and how it was really important to do code. Let's jump back into, in, into some code here. So if uh, Twilio is something that uh, is, is interesting to you, something that you could use, um, let me give you a, a, a little overview of uh, what you would need to do to um, integrate Twilio, integrate with Twilio. So here's Twimmel. Uh, Twimmel is the XML dialect that you use to send responses to Twilio. Here's two example responses. We've got this first one up here. This response will say the, the words hello world to the person on the other end of the phone line. Uh, that's using our text-to-speech engine, so it ends up sounding more like hello world or uh, something in a more robotic voice like that. The other response here is uh, what you would do um, to connect a bunch of people into a conference line or a party line. Uh, and for every call that you'd make, you'd give Twilio this, uh, this Twimmel saying, um, the way that you're going to deal with this call is connect that person into a conference. Here are all of the different uh, XML tags, the, the Twimmel verbs as we call them, that you will use to respond to Twilio and tell Twilio how to act. Uh, we've covered the say verb, that's having us use our text-to-speech engine to say something to the user. Play is what plays audio files. Gather is what gathers uh, uh, button presses from uh, telephones that have touch-tone dialing. Record is uh, pretty self-evident. It's what will, will record audio, um, enabling you to do things like make a, a voicemail system. SMS is what I used um, in my demo to respond to an SMS with another SMS, but you can even do things like after someone hangs up, um, having Twilio send, send them a, a follow-up SMS saying, you know, fill out the survey about your customer support experience, or here are some links that you might find useful. And then dial is something that uh, is pretty key to what Twilio does. This is what you, the verb you would use to um, connect different phones to each other or connect phones to web, page, uh, to, to web browsers or to mobile clients. Uh, and the dial verb has these other tags that nest inside of it that we call nouns. So the number noun is what allows you to dial to another telephone number. Client is what lets you to dial out to a web browser or a iOS or Android app. Conference is what allows you to dial somebody into a conference line, and queue allows you to connect them into a, uh, a call queue. And then on the right here, we've got these uh, secondary verbs that uh, will often take action or modify a primary verb, take action on or modify a primary verb. Uh, the in queue uh, verb here will add somebody into a queue, leave will disconnect them from it. Hang up is uh, will hang up on the person. It's what it just what it says. Uh, redirect will uh, tell Twilio, hey, um, get more uh, get more responses from me at this URL. So let's say you had somebody uh, you dial them to another number. The other end hung up, and then you could have it say, now after that agent hung up, uh, give them a survey at the end of that, or uh, put them back into the 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 top of the phone tree. Reject will. Um, Reject a call, play them a disconnected tone, and uh, will prevent you from getting billed from, for calls that um, you don't want to be billed for. And pause will put a short delay in the text-to-speech um, engine on the saver. So that's how to deal with incoming requests. Uh, the REST API is what you'll use for um, outbound requests, for telling Twilio to take action on your behalf. Again, this is a RESTful API that's uh, pure HTTP. And we've got libraries written in all the languages that you see up here. Because my programming language of choice is Python, I'm going to be showing you um, all of my demos in that language. If you're using a different language, make sure that you go to twilio.com slash docs, D-O-C-S, and uh, look for these examples in the programming language of your choice. Now, the one thing to uh, keep in mind here, the, the important part of this slide, is the account SID that you see here and the auth token. These are the credentials that you passed to Twilio to authorize yourself with Twilio. Um, and if you're wondering why I didn't need this in my live demo, it's because in the Python library, it'll look for the environment variables, account, SID, and auth token, and we'll use those if those exist. 
this is something that's really useful if you're deploying your code to something like Heroku using Git, um, because you really shouldn't be uh, che checking your uh, credentials into a source code repository like Git. You want to make sure that those don't accidentally end up on GitHub. Here's how to make a phone call using the Python library. The important thing here is the call URL, which you see here at the top. This is how uh, you concatenate three strings together in Python. This is a URL to a service that uh, Twilio hosts called Twimlets. And Twimlets are little basic programs that allow you to generate uh, XML uh, for simple types of things. Um, as you can see here, and you've probably already guessed, this will play hold music uh, in the type of ambient um, for the, the uh, call that you have this run on. So here's how you set up a call. Say, create a call to this number from this number. And when this number here answers, take actions from this URL and respond of accordingly. Here's how you send an SMS, pretty straightforward. Uh, the contents of the SMS are what's here in body. Here's how you list the received SMS messages. This is what I did in that live coding demo. Uh, the important part here to focus on is the messages variable. What that is is an array of responses uh, that each contain uh, the contents of, of each message that matches that to filter. And then in the for loop there you'll see that it'll take each message in that array and print the uh, body attribute of each message response. And here's how you purchase a number. In the live demo, I showed you how to do that through the web interface, but you can also do that through our REST API. The example here is showing you how you would search for a, uh, an American telephone number in the 530 area code. Um, the next uh, statement there is an if statement saying if there was any response, if there were any contents in that response, uh, purchase the first number. Otherwise, print that there aren't any numbers available. And that's just a sampling of what you can do via the, the REST API. Some of the other things that you can do are uh, manipulate conferences and participants, move people around between conference rooms, um, add people to conferences, remove them from them. Uh, you can do things with your accounts and sub-accounts. Uh, uh, sub-accounts are a cool feature that we have to allow you to separate out billing between your different users. So say that you're doing some consulting for someone and uh, don't want to track each and every call that they do and bill them on that basis. Uh, if you put them into a sub-account, make a sub-account for them, all of that uh, billing information is still under your main account, but it allows you to see all the activity bucketed by a sub-account. Uh, we have an API request to deal with our recordings that uh, allows you to see all of the uh, audio files that uh, have been re recorded on your behalf that we stored for you. Um, and uh, list them and delete them and get the URLs for them. Uh, queues and members of queues can be also manipulated similar to conferences. You can move people around in queues, take them from a queue and put them directly to somebody else or send them to a voicemail um, or even ask them to give you input uh, via their touch tone pad or even give them messages telling them how long their wait in the queue is now. And lastly, uh, all of our client libraries give you the ability to generate XML um, using a more uh, a, a paradigm that's closer to what is appropriate in your language. So, you know, creating an object and then handing it to a tumult creator because XML is often uh, can be error prone or it's just not fun. Um, we allow you to use whatever paradigm makes sense in your language to build an object, hand it to our tumult library to then uh, turn that into well formed XML. So in summary, here's what we talked about today. Here's the, the high-level overview. Twilio is a service that allows you, the web developer, to easily make and receive phone calls, send and receive SMS messages, all using a simple RESTful API and uh, allowing you to, to connect to phones, web browsers, and mobile apps on platforms like iOS and Android. Here are the, the most important things I think that uh, you should uh, take from this, this talk. No matter what you're doing, focus on continually improving your service. Ship it. Focus on shipping it. Uh, the metrics you should be having in mind when you're uh, building a service is how much time does it take for you to get a bug fix from the developer's machine to the live production website. Um, 
as a developer or someone making a tool for a developer, remember the five minute rule that it should take no more than five minutes for a developer to do something useful with your service or your application. And as a developer, you should hold other services to that standard as well. And finally, when you're building a service uh, that uh, is something for uh, developers to use or a product that uh, developers use, Remember to think about that service as empowering others. How can uh, you allow people to do amazing things with your technology? And remember that is a really uh, fulfilling thing to do and a, a powerful way to interact with your customers. And with that, if you have any questions, you have questions about Twilio or any questions about this presentation, uh, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter. I'm JF on Twitter. Or send me an email. I'm J-O-E-L at Twilio.com. Thanks everyone for watching and I look forward to hearing all the cool things that you're going to do with Twilio. Thanks.